The Senate will convene as a court of impeachment, and the chaplain, Dr. Barry Black, will lead the Senate in prayer. Let us pray. All-powerful God, sovereign of this beloved land, you are our fortress, and you desire justice to be done. As our Senate jurors remember their accountability to you, use them to cause justice to roll down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. Lord, during this impeachment trial, give our lawmakers the gift of discernment so that they will know truth from falsehood. Inspire them to commit their thoughts and decisions to you. Let your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is done in heaven. We pray in your mighty name. Amen. Please join me in reciting the Pledge of Allegiance. And uh, senators, will you please be seated? And if there's no objection, I hear none. The journal proceedings of the trial are approved to date. The sergeant arms will make the proclamation. Hear ye, hear ye, hear ye. All persons are commanded to keep silence on pain of imprisonment while the Senate of the United States is sitting for the trial of the article of impeachment against Donald John Trump, former president, of the United States. Mr. President. The majority leader is recognized. Thank you, Mr. President. Now, for the information of all senators, no motions were filed this morning, so we'll proceed to the House manager's presentation. We anticipate two 10-minute breaks and a 45-minute dinner break around 6 p.m. In pursuant to the provisions of Senate Resolution 47. The managers for the House of Representatives have 16 hours to make the presentation of the case. The Senate will now hear you and recognize Mr. Manager Raskin to begin the presentation of the case for the House of Representatives. Mr. Raskin. Thank you very much, Mr. President, members of the Senate. Good morning. Good day. Um, now, some people think this trial is a contest of lawyers, or even worse, a competition between political parties. It's neither. It's a moment of truth for America. My late father, Marcus Raskin, once wrote, democracy needs a ground to stand upon, and that ground is the truth. America needs the truth about ex-President Trump's role in inciting the insurrection on January 6th because it threatened our government and it disrupted, it easily could have destroyed the peaceful transfer of power in the United States for the first time in 233 years. It was suggested yesterday by President Trump's counsel that this is really like a, a very bad accident or a natural disaster, where lots of people get injured or killed and society is just out looking for someone to blame. And uh, that's a natural and normal human reaction according to President's counsel, but he says it's totally unfair in this case. President Trump, according to Mr. Castor, is essentially an innocent bystander who got swept up in this catastrophe but did nothing wrong. In this assertion, Mr. Castor unerringly echoes his client, ex-President Trump, who declared after the insurrection that his conduct in the affair was totally appropriate. And therefore, we can only assume he could do and would do 
the exact same thing again because he said his conduct was totally appropriate. So now the factual inquiry of the trial is squarely posed for us. The jurisdictional constitutional issue is gone. Whether you were persuaded by the president's constitutional analysis yesterday or not, the Senate voted to reject it. And so the Senate is now properly exercising its jurisdiction and sitting as a court of impeachment, conducting a trial on the facts. We are having a trial on the facts. The House says ex-president Donald Trump incited a violent insurrection against Congress and the Constitution and the people. The president's lawyers and the president say his conduct was totally appropriate and he's essentially an innocent victim of circumstances like the other innocent victims that we'll see getting caught up in all of the violence and chaos over the next several days. The evidence will be for you to see and hear and digest. The evidence will show you that ex-President Trump was no innocent bystander. The evidence will show that he clearly incited the January 6th insurrection. It will show that Donald Trump surrendered his role as commander-in-chief and became the inciter-in-chief of a dangerous insurrection. And this was, as one of our colleagues put it so cogently on January 6th itself, the greatest betrayal of the presidential oath in the history of the United States. The evidence will show you that he saw it coming and was not remotely surprised by the violence. And when the violence inexorably and inevitably came as predicted and overran this body in the House of Representatives with chaos, we will show you that he completely abdicated his duty as commander in chief to stop the violence and protect the government and protect our officers and protect our people. He violated his oath of office to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution, the government, and the people of the United States. The evidence will show you that he assembled, inflamed, and incited his followers to descend upon the Capitol to stop the steal, to block Vice President Pence and Congress from finalizing his opponent's election victory over him. It will show that he had been warned that these followers were prepared for a violent attack targeting us at the Capitol through media reports, law enforcement reports, and even arrests. In short, we will prove that the impeached president was no innocent bystander whose conduct was totally appropriate and should be a standard for future presidents, but that he incited this attack and he saw it coming. To us, it may have felt like chaos and madness, but there was method in the madness that day. This was an organized attack on the counting of the Electoral College votes in joint session of the United States Congress under the 12th Amendment and under the Electoral Count Act to prevent Vice President Mike Pence and to prevent us from, from counting sufficient Electoral College votes to certify Joe Biden's victory of 306 to 232 in the Electoral College, a margin that President Trump had declared a landslide uh, in 2016. When my colleague, Mr. Nagus, speaks after me, he will set forth in detail the exact roadmap of all the evidence in the case. My fellow House managers and I will then take you through that evidence step by step so everyone can see exactly how these events unfolded. But I want to tell you a few key reasons right now that we know this case is not about blaming an innocent bystander for the horrific violence and harm that took place on January 6th. This is about holding accountable the person singularly responsible for inciting the attack. Let's start with December 12th. You will see during this trial a man who praised and encouraged and cultivated violence. We have just begun to fight, he says, more than a month after the election has taken place. 
And that's before the second million mega march, a rally that ended in serious violence and even the burning of a church. And as the president forecast, it was only the beginning. On December 19th, 18 days before January 6th, he told his base about where the battle would be, that they would fight next. January 6th would be wild, he promised. Be there, we'll be wild, said the President of the United States of America. And that, too, turned out to be true. You'll see in the days that followed, Donald Trump continued to aggressively promote January 6th to his followers. The event was scheduled at the, at the precise time that Congress would be meeting in joint session to count the Electoral College votes and to finalize the 2020 presidential election. In fact, in the days leading up to the attack, you'll learn that there were countless social media posts, news stories, and most importantly, credible reports from the FBI and Capitol Police that the thousands gathering for the President's Save America March were violent, organized with weapons, and were targeting the Capitol. This mob got organized so openly because, as they would later scream in these halls, and as they posted on forums before the attack, they were sent here by the President. They were invited here by the President of the United States of America. And when they showed up, knowing of these reports that the crowd was angry and it was armed, Here's what Donald Trump told them. President Trump whipped the crowd into a frenzy, exhorting followers, if you don't fight like hell, you're not going to have a country anymore. And then he aimed straight at the Capitol, declaring, you'll never take back our country with weakness. You have to show strength, and you have to be strong. He told them, to fight like hell, and they brought us hell on that day. Incited by President Trump, his mob attacked the Capitol. This assault unfolded live on television before a horrified nation. According to those around him at the time, this is how President Trump reportedly responded to the attack that we saw him incite in public. Delight enthusiasm, confusion as to why others around him weren't as happy as he was. Trump incited the January 6th attack, and when his mob overran and occupied the Senate and attacked the House and assaulted law enforcement, he watched it on TV like a reality show. He reveled in it, and he did nothing to help us as Commander-in-Chief. Instead, he served as the inciter in chief, sending tweets that only further incited the rampaging mob. He made statements lauding and sympathizing with the insurrectionists. Over at 4.17 p.m., over three hours after the beginning of the siege, for the very first time he spoke out loud, not on Twitter, spoke out loud to the American people. Here's what he said. I know your pain. I know you're hurt. So you might be saying, all right, the president is going to console us now. He's going to reassure America. He knows our pain. He knows we're hurt. We've just seen these horrific images of officers being impaled and smashed over the head. Um, we've just been under attack for three hours. But here's what he actually goes on to say. I know your pain. I know you're hurt. We had an election that was stolen from us. It was a landslide election, and everyone knows it, especially the other side. So you think he's about to decry the mayhem and violence, the unprecedented spectacle of this mob attack on the U.S. Capitol, but he's still promoting the big lie that was responsible for inflaming and inciting the mob in the first place. If anyone ever had a doubt as to his focus that day, it was not to defend us, it was not to console us, it was to praise and sympathize and commiserate with the rampaging mob. It was to continue to act as inciter in chief, not commander in chief, by telling the mob that their election had been stolen from them. Even then, after that vicious attack, he continued to spread the big lie. And as everyone here knows, 
Joe Biden won by more than 7 million votes and 306 to 232 in the Electoral College. But Donald Trump refused to accept his loss even after this attack. And he celebrated the people who violently interfered with the peaceful transfer of power for the first time in American history and did that at his urging. And when he did, in this video, finally tell them to go home in peace, he added this message. We love you. You're very special. Distinguished members of the Senate, this is a day that will live in disgrace in American history. That is, unless you ask Donald Trump. Because this is what he tweeted before he went to bed that night at 6.01 PM. Not consoling the nation, not reassuring, every, reassuring everyone that the government was secure, not a single word that entire day condemning the violent insurrection. That's what he says. These are the things and events that happen when a sacred landslide election victory is so unceremoniously and viciously stripped away from great patriots who have been badly and unfairly treated for so long. Go home with love and in peace. Remember this day forever. These are the things and events that happen when a sacred landslide election victory is so unceremoniously and viciously stripped away from great patriots. In other words, this was all perfectly natural and foreseeable to Donald Trump. At the beginning of the day, he told you it was coming. At the end of the day, he basically says, I told you this would happen. And then he adds, remember this day forever, but not as a day of disgrace, a day of horror and trauma as the rest of us remember it, but as a day of celebration, a day of commemoration. And if we let it be, it will be a day of continuation, a call to action, and a rallying cry for the next rounds of insurrectionary justice, because all of this was totally appropriate. Senators, the stakes of this trial could not be more serious. Every American, young and old and in between, is invited to participate with us in this essential journey to find the facts and share the truth. Trials are public events in a democracy, and no trial is more public or significant than an impeachment trial. Because the insurrection brought shocking violence, bloodshed, and pain in the nation's capital, and we will be showing relevant clips of the mob's attack on police officers and other innocent people, we do urge parents and teachers to exercise close review of what young people are watching here, and please watch along with them if you're allowing them to watch. The impeachment managers will try to give warnings before the most graphic and disturbing violence that took place is shown. We believe that the manager's comprehensive and meticulous presentation will lead to one powerful and irresistible conclusion. Donald Trump committed a massive crime against our Constitution and our people, and the worst violation of the presidential oath of office in the history of the United States of America. For this, he was impeached by the House of Representatives, and he must be convicted by the United States Senate. Before I close, I want to address a constitutional issue still lingering from yesterday's argument. The president obviously is still exploring ways to change the subject and talk about anything other than his responsibility for inciting the attack. We heard a lot yesterday about his claim that this incitement of the insurrection was perfectly appropriate because it's somehow protected by the First Amendment. And this little diversion caught my eye because I've been a professor of constitutional law and the First Amendment for decades. And as we'll demonstrate over the course of the trial, the factual premise and the legal underpinnings of that claim are all wrong. They present President Trump as merely like a guy at a rally expressing a political opinion that we disagree with and now we're trying to put him in jail for it. That has nothing to do with the reality of these charges or his constitutional offense. The particular political opinions being expressed are not why we impeached the president and have nothing to do with it. It makes no difference what the ideological content of the mob was. And if we license and forgive incitement to violent insurrection by militant Trump followers this week, you can be sure there will be a whole bunch of new ideological flavors coming soon. As we'll demonstrate with overwhelming evidence, 
Portraying Trump as a guy on the street being punished for his ideas is a false description of his actions, his intent, and the role that he played on January 6th when he willfully incited an, insurrection, an insurrectionary mob to riot at the Capitol. Last week, 144 constitutional scholars, including Floyd Abrams, a ferocious defender of free speech, Charles Freed, President Reagan's Solicitor General, Stephen Calabresi, the co-founder of the Federalist Society, released a statement calling the President's First Amendment arguments legally frivolous, legally frivolous, adding, we all agree that the First Amendment does not prevent the Senate from convicting President Trump and disqualifying him from holding future office. They went on to say, no reasonable scholar or jurist could conclude that President Trump had a First Amendment right to incite a violent attack on the seat of the legislative branch or then to sit back and watch on television as Congress was terrorized and the Capitol sacked. Incitement to violence is, of course, not protected by the First Amendment. That's why most Americans have dismissed Donald Trump's First Amendment uh, rhetoric uh, simply by referring to Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes's handy phrase, you can't shout fire in a crowded theater. But even that time-honored principle doesn't begin to capture how off-base the argument is. This case is much worse than someone who falsely shouts fire in a crowded theater. It's more like a case where the town fire chief, who's paid to put out fires, sends a mob not to yell fire in a crowded theater, but to actually set the theater on fire. And who then, when the fire alarms go off, and the calls start flooding into the fire department, asking for help, does nothing but sit back, encourage the mob to continue its rampage, and watch the fire spread on TV with glee and delight. So then we say this fire chief should never be allowed to hold this public job again, and you're fired and you're permanently disqualified, and he objects. And he says, we're violating his free speech rights just because he's pro-mob or pro-fire or whatever it might be. Come on. I mean, you, you really don't need to go to law school to figure out what's wrong with that argument. Here's the key. Undoubtedly, a private person can run around on the street, on the street expressing his or her support for the enemies of the United States and advocating the overthrow of the United States government. You've got a right to do that under the First Amendment. But if the president spent all of his days doing that, uttering the exact same words, expressing support for the enemies of the United States and for overthrowing the government, is there anyone here who doubts that this would be a violation of his oath of office to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States, and that he or she could be impeached for doing that? Look, if you're president of the United States, you've chosen a side with your oath of office. And if you break it, we can impeach, convict, remove, and disqualify you permanently from holding any office of honor, trust, or profit under the United States. As Justice Scalia once said, memorably, you can't ride with the cops and root for the robbers. And if you become insider-in-chief to the insurrection, you can't expect to be on the payroll as commander-in-chief for the Union. Trump was the President of the United States, and he'd sworn to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution. He had an affirmative, binding duty, one that set him apart from everyone else in the country, to take care that the laws be faithfully executed, including all the laws against assaulting federal officers, destroying federal property, violently threatening members of Congress and the Vice President, interfering with federal elections, and dozens of other federal laws that are well known to all of you. When he incited insurrection on January 6th, he broke that oath. He violated that duty. And that's why we're here today. And that's why he has no credible constitutional defense. I'll tell you a final sad story in this kaleidoscope of sadness and terror and violence. One of our Capitol officers who defended us that day was a longtime veteran of our force, a brave and honorable public servant who spent several hours battling the mob as part of one of those blue lines defending the Capitol in our democracy. For several hours straight, 
as the marauders punched and kicked and mauled and spit upon and hit officers with baseball bats and fire extinguishers, cursed the cops and stormed our capital. He defended us and he lived every minute of his oath of office. And afterwards, overwhelmed by emotion, he broke down in the rotunda. And he cried for 15 minutes. And he shouted out, I got called an N-word 15 times today. And then he recorded, I sat down with one of my buddies, another black guy in tears just started streaming down my face and I said, what the F, man? Is this America? That's the question before all of you in this trial. Is this America? Can our country and our democracy ever be the same if we don't hold accountable the person responsible for inciting the violent attack against our country, our capital, and our democracy, and all of those who serve us so faithfully and honorably? Is this America? Mr. Nagus will now provide a roadmap, a roadmap of our evidentiary case. Mr. President, distinguished senators, counsel, like several of you, I am a child of immigrants. And as a son of immigrants, I believe firmly in my heart that the United States is the greatest republic that this world has ever known. A hallmark of our republic since the days of George Washington, has been the peaceful transfer of power. For centuries, we've accepted it as fact. Unfortunately, sadly, we know now that we can no longer take that for granted. Because as lead manager Raskin explained on January 6th, the peaceful transition of power was violently interrupted when a mob stormed this Capitol and desecrated this chamber. As you'll see during the course of this trial, that mob was summoned, assembled, and incited by the former President of the United States, Donald Trump. And he did that because he wanted to stop the transfer of power so that he could retain power, even though he had lost the election. And when the violence erupted, when they were here in our building with weapons, he did nothing to stop it. If we are to protect our republic and prevent something like this from ever happening again, he must be convicted. Now, I want to be very clear about what we will show you during the course of this trial. As my fellow managers present our case to you today, tonight, tomorrow, it'll be helpful to think about President Trump's incitement of insurrection in three distinct parts. The, attack, the provocation, the attack, and the harm. Let's start with the provocation. We will show during the course of this trial, that this attack was provoked by the president, incited by the president. And as a result, it was predictable and it was foreseeable. And of course, that makes sense. And this mob was well orchestrated. Their conduct was intentional. They did it all in plain sight, proudly, openly, and loudly. Because 
they believed, they truly believed that they were doing this for him. That this was their patriotic duty. They even predicted that he would protect them. And for the most part, they were right. In his unique role as commander-in-chief of our country, and as the one person that the mob was listening to and following orders from, he had the power to stop it. And he didn't. Now, some have said that President Trump's remarks, his speech on January 6th, was just a speech. Well, let me ask you this. When in our history has a speech led thousands of people to storm our nation's capital with weapons, to scale the walls, break windows, kill a capital police officer. This was not just a speech. It didn't just happen. And as you evaluate the facts that we present to you, it will become clear exactly where that mob came from. Because here's the thing, President Trump's words, as you'll see on January 6th, in that speech, just like the mob's actions were carefully chosen, those words had a very specific meaning to that crowd. And how do we know this? Because in the weeks prior to, during, and after the election, he used the same words over and over and over again. You will hear over and over three things. You can see them on the screens. First, what lead manager Raskin referred to as the big lie, that the election was stolen, full of fraud, rigged. You will hear over and over him using that lie to urge his supporters to never concede and stop the steal. And finally, you will hear the call to arms, that it was his supporters' patriotic duty to fight like hell. To do what? To stop the steal. To stop the election from being stolen by showing up in this very chamber. To stop you. To stop us. I'd respectfully ask that you remember those three phrases as you consider the evidence today. Election was stolen, stop the steal, and fight like hell because they did not just appear on January 6th. Let me show you what I mean. Let's start with the big lie. You will see during this trial that the president realized really by last spring that he could lose, he might lose the election. So what did he do? He started planting the seeds to get some of his supporters ready by saying that he could only lose the election if it was stolen. I mean, in other words, really what he did is create a no-lose scenario. Either he won the election or he would have some angry supporters, not all, but some, who believed that if he lost, the election had to be rigged. And they would be angry because he was telling Americans that their vote had been stolen. And in America, our vote is our voice. So his false claims about election fraud, that was the drumbeat being used to inspire, instigate, and ignite them to anger them. Watch this clip. Because we're not going to let this election be taken away from us. That's the only way they're going to win it. We're not going to let it happen. It's the only way we can be, it's the only way we can lose, in my opinion, is massive fraud. 
We all know what happened after that. He lost. He lost the election. But remember, he had that no-lose scenario that I referenced earlier. He told his base that the election was stolen, as he had forecasted. And then he told them, your election has been stolen, but you cannot concede. You must stop the steal. You can't let another person steal that election from you. All over the country, people are together in holding up signs, stop the steal. The Democrats are trying to steal the White House. You cannot let them. You just can't let them. Now, while he's inciting his supporters, he's also simultaneously doing everything he possibly can to overturn the election. First, he begins with the courts, a legitimate avenue, legitimate avenue to challenge the election. But he ignores all of their adverse rulings when all of his claims are thrown out. Then he moves on to trying to pressure state election officials to block the election results for his opponent even though he'd lost in their states. You'll hear my fellow managers discuss that in detail. Then he tries to threaten state election officials to actually change the votes, to make him the winner, even threatening criminal penalties if they refused. He had the Justice Department investigate his claims. And even they found no support for those claims. So he tried to persuade some members of his party in Congress to block the certification of his vote with attacks in public forums. When that failed, he tried to intimidate the Vice President of the United States of America to refuse to certify the vote and send it back to the states. None of it worked. So, what does he do? With his back against the wall, when all else has failed. He turns back to his supporters who he'd already spent months telling them that the election was stolen. And he amplified it further. He turned it up a notch. He told them that they had to be ready not just to stop the steal, but to fight like hell. fight for the survival of our nation and we are going to keep on fighting. We will never surrender. We will only win. Now is not the time to retreat. Now is the time to fight harder than ever before. We have to go all the way. And we're going to fight like hell, I'll tell you right now. We will not bend. We will not break. We will not yield. We will never give in. We will never give up. We will never back down. We will never, ever surrender. You will see that in the months as the president made these statements, people listened. Armed supporters surrounded election officials' homes. The Secretary of State for Georgia got death threats. Officials warned the president that his rhetoric was dangerous and it was going to result in deadly violence. And that's what makes this so different, because when he saw firsthand the violence that his conduct was creating, he didn't stop it. He didn't condemn the violence. He incited it further. And he got more specific. He didn't just tell them to fight like hell. He told them how, where, and when. He made sure they had advance notice, 18 days advance notice. He sent his save the date for January 6th. He told them to march to the Capitol and fight like hell. On January 6th, as lead manager Raskin said, the exact same day that we were certifying the election results. And what time was that rally scheduled for? The exact same time that this chamber was certifying the election results in joint session. 
When did he conclude his speech? Literally moments before Speaker Pelosi had gaveled us into session. Many of us were in the House during that joint session of Congress. I was sitting two rows behind Leader Schumer and Leader McConnell. I remember it vividly. And as we were standing there, fulfilling our solemn oath to the Constitution, the President was finishing his speech just a couple of miles away. How did he conclude that infamous speech? With a final call to action. He told them to march down Pennsylvania Avenue, to come here, that it was their patriotic duty because the election had been stolen. And when they heard his speech, they understood his words and what they meant because they had heard it before. Let's take just a minute and really look at his words on January 6th as he spoke at the Save America rally. Now remember, I told you, you'd hear three phrases. The election was stolen, stop the steal, and fight like hell. Let's start with that first phrase. All of us here today do not want to see our election victory stolen. There's never been anything like this. It's a pure theft in American history. Everybody knows it. Make no mistake, this election was stolen from you, from me, and from the country. Now, of course, each of you heard those words before. So had the crowd. The president had spent months telling his supporters that the election had been stolen, and, stolen, and he used this speech to incite them further, to inflame them, to stop the steal, to stop the certification of the election results. We will never give up. We will never concede. It doesn't happen. You don't concede when there's theft involved. And to use a favorite term that all of you people really came up with, we will stop the steal. We must stop the steal. Finally, the president used this speech as a call to arms. It was not rhetorical. Some of his supporters had been primed for this over many months. As you'll learn, days before this speech, as lead manager Raskin noted, there were vast reports across all major media outlets that thousands of people would be armed, that they'd be violent. You'll learn that Capitol Police and the FBI reported in the days leading up to the attack that thousands in the crowd would be targeting the Capitol specifically, that they had arrested people with guns the night before the attack on weapons charges. And this is what our Commander-in-Chief said to the crowd in the face of those warnings right before they came here. We will not let them silence your voices. We're not going to let it happen. Not going to let it happen. to get your people to fight because you'll never take back our country with weakness. You have to show strength and you have to be strong. And we fight. We fight like hell. And if you don't fight like hell, you're not going to have a country anymore. You have to get your people to fight. He told them. Senators, this clearly was not just one speech. It didn't just happen. It was part of a carefully planned, months-long effort with a very specific instruction. Show up on January 6th and get your people to fight the certification. He incited it. It was foreseeable. And again, 
you don't have to take my word for it. The president's former chief of staff, he's a retired Marine, four-star general, was confirmed by this body to be the Secretary of Homeland Security. Overwhelmingly, overwhelming vote. That man was John Kelly. And on the day after the insurrection, he said this. You know, the president knows who he's talking to when he tweets or when he makes statements. He knows who he's talking to. And he, knows, he knows what uh, he wants them to do. And uh, the fact that uh, he said the things he has been saying, the things he's been saying since the election, um, and encouraging people, no surprise again, uh, what happened yesterday. No surprise. Think about that. No surprise. The president had every reason to know that this would happen because he assembled the mob, he summoned the mob, and he incited the mob. He knew when he took that podium on that fateful morning that those in attendance had heeded his words and they were waiting for his orders to begin fighting. And that, of course, brings me, my fellow managers, to what happened here in this building. As lead manager Raskin stated, uh, my colleagues are going to walk through the ev events of January 6th and the evidence in very great detail. Uh, they are painful to watch and to recount, and I'm not going to repeat the evidence now. But I do want to be clear about what also happened during that terrible attack, and that is this, that President Trump once again failed us. Because when the violence erupted, when we and the law enforcement officials protecting us, protecting you, were under attack, as each of you were being evacuated from this chamber from a violent mob, as we were being evacuated from the House, he could have immediately and forcefully intervened to stop the violence. It was his duty as commander-in-chief to stop the violence. And he alone had that power. Not just because of his unique role as commander-in-chief, but because they believed that they were following his orders. They said so. following my president. I thought I was following what we were called to do. President Trump requested that we be in D.C. on the 6th. You heard it from them. They were doing what he wanted them to do. They wouldn't have listened to you, to me, to the Vice President of the United States who they were attacking. They didn't stop in the face of law enforcement, police officers fighting for their lives to stop them. They were following the President. He alone, our Commander-in-Chief, had the power to stop him. And he didn't. You will hear evidence tonight, tomorrow, throughout the trial, about his refusal as Commander-in-Chief to respond to numerous desperate pleas on the phone, across social media, begging him to stop the attack. And you will see his relentless attack on Vice President Pence, who was at that very moment hiding with his family as armed extremists were chanting, hang Mike Pence, calling him a traitor. You will see that even when he did, finally, three and a half hours into the attack, tell these people to go home in peace, he added, as lead manager Raskin said, I'll quote, you're very special. We love you. Think for a moment, just a moment, of the lives lost that day, of the more than 140 wounded police officers, and ask yourself, 
if as soon as this had started, President Trump had simply gone onto TV, just logged onto Twitter and said, stop the attack. If he had done so with even half as much force as he said, stop the steal. How many lives would we have saved? Sadly, he didn't do that. At the end of the day, the president was not successful in stopping the certification. That we know, thanks to the bravery of our law enforcement and to the bravery of the senators in this room. Each of you who still fulfilled your constitutional duty, even under the threat of mortal peril. But there can be no doubt of the grave harm that he caused to our elected leaders, to us, our families, to all who work in the Capitol, our staff, your staff, to our brave Capitol Police who defend us tirelessly with little thanks, who believed that they had a commander in chief who would defend and protect them and instead put them in harm's way, to those killed for heeding his command, to our democracy and the system which ensures that we have a president elected by the people, to our national security and our standing in the world. The harm was real. The damage was real. Five people lost their lives on that terrible, tragic day. A woman was shot dead 50 feet from where we later certified the election results. And for those who question just how bad it was, criminal complaints recently unsealed by the Department of Justice are more than revealing. You'll see one of these documents on the screen. In the charging affidavit of one of the leaders of the Proud Boys, we learned that members of this group said, I'm going to quote, they would have killed Mike Pence if given the chance. In another, we learned of a tweet in real time while they were in the building stating, we broke into the Capitol. We got inside. We did our part. We were looking for Nancy Pelosi to shoot her in the frickin' brain, but we didn't find her. And for anyone who suggests otherwise, these defendants themselves have told you exactly why they were here. You'll see this in the trial that in the halls of the Capitol, on social media, in news interviews, and in charging documents, they confirm they were following the president's orders. You can see some of the statements on that screen. One who said, Trump wants all able-bodied patriots. Another, that President Trump is calling us to fight. This isn't a joke. Another one, I thought I was following my president. I thought I was following what we were called to do. Our president wants us here. We wait and take orders from the president. He made them believe over many weeks that the election was stolen and they were following his command to take back their country. As I prepared for today, yesterday, this trial, there's one memory that I couldn't shake which was on the night of January 6th, and the feeling of walking back onto the House floor and seeing many of you there. I remember us finishing our task at 4 in the morning. And as, off, as I walked off the floor, I was so grateful, so grateful for the opportunity to thank the Vice President of the United States, Mike Pence, for his actions, for standing before us and asking us to follow our oath and our faith and our duty. We only got a couple of hours of sleep that morning, early the next day, 
I called my dad, who came to this country, as I mentioned, as an immigrant 40 years ago. And I told him that the proudest moment, by far, of serving in Congress for me was going back onto the floor with each of you to finish the work that we had started. I'm humbled to be back with you today. And just as on January 6th, when we overcame that attack on our capital, on our country, I'm hopeful that at this trial, we can use our resolve and our resilience to again uphold our democracy by faithfully applying the law, vindicating the Constitution, and holding President Trump accountable for his actions. Uh, Senators, um, Representatives uh, Joaquin Castro and Eric Swalwell will now show the evidence of President Trump's long campaign to delegit delegitimize his electoral defeat and to galvanize his supporters to help him retain his power at any cost. So we're going to go at this point step by step and explain the progression all the way up until the attack. Good afternoon, y'all. My name is Joaquin Gostro, and I represent San Antonio in the United States Congress. There's a saying that a lie can travel halfway around the world before the truth has a chance to put on its shoes. And that was before the internet. The point of that saying is that a lie can do incredible damage and destruction. And that's especially true when that lie is told by the most powerful person on earth, our Commander-in-Chief, the President of the United States. This attack did not come from one speech, and it didn't happen by accident. The evidence shows clearly that this mob was provoked over many months by Donald J. Trump. And if you look at the evidence, his purposeful conduct you'll see that the attack was foreseeable and preventable. I'll start by discussing President Trump's actions leading up to the election, when he set up his big lie. Beginning in the spring of 2020, President Trump began to fall behind in the polls. And by July, President Trump had reached a new low. He was running 15 points behind his opponent. And he was scared he began to believe that he could legitimately lose the election. And so he did something entirely unprecedented in the history of our nation. He refused to commit to a peaceful transition of power. Here's what he said. Can you give a direct answer? You will accept the election? I have to see. Look, you, I have to see. No, I'm not going to just say yes. I'm not going to say no. Do you commit to making sure that there's a peaceful transfer of power? We don't want to have, get rid of the ballots, and you'll have a very trans. We'll have a very peaceful. There won't be a transfer, frankly. There'll be a continuation. Senators, the president of the United States said, "Quote: There won't be a transition of power. There'll be a continuation." President Trump was given every opportunity to tell his supporters, "Yes, if I lose." I will peacefully transfer power to the next president. Instead, he told his supporters the only way he could lose the election is if it was stolen. In tweet after tweet, he made sweeping allegations about election fraud that couldn't possibly be true. But that was the point. He didn't care if the claims were true. He wanted to make sure that his supporters were angry 
like the election was being ripped away from them. On May 24th, six months before the election, he tweeted, it will be the greatest rigged election in history. How could he possibly know it would be the greatest rigged election in history six months before the election happened? And on June 22nd, more of the same, rigged 2020 election, it will be the scandal of our times. Again, about an election that had not even happened. On July 30th, 2020 will be the most inaccurate and fraudulent election in history. Again, just big words with nothing to prove them. But he wanted to make his supporters believe that an election victory would be stolen from him and from them. And this was to rile up his base, to make them angry. Now, these were just a few of the many times President Trump tweeted about this. And he did it in speeches, in rallies, and in television, too. This is going to be the greatest election disaster in history. Because the only way we're going to lose this election is if the election is rigged. Remember that. The only way they can take this election away from us is if this is a rigged election. We're going to win this election. It's a rigged election. It's the only way we're going to lose. But this will be one of the greatest fraudulent and most fraudulent elections ever. This is clearly a man who refuses to accept the possibility or the reality in our democracy of losing an election. And there are dozens more tweets and speeches of Donald Trump spreading his lie, but you get the point. His supporters got the point as well. They firmly believe that if he lost, it was because the election was rigged. Will you accept the result if Joe Biden wins? No. Under any circumstance? No. Why is that? Because it's lies and deceit and corruption. Do you think that if we get to election night or in the following days, if Biden winds up somehow becoming the winner, do you think it's rigged? Oh, yes. Very much so. Yes. Days after. If it shows up that Joe Biden won. Yes. In your opinion, would that be the only way that Trump could lose, that it be a rigged election? Is that the only way Joe Biden can win? Absolutely. I agree with that. Because there's no way in heck our president's going to lose. But yes, there, I, it would be a rigged election. There was there's some type of cheating went on. What have you. And I, I firmly believe that. Now, all of us in this room have run for election. And it's no fun to lose. I'm a Texas Democrat. We've lost a few elections over the years. But can you imagine telling your supporters that the only way you could possibly lose is if an American election was rigged and stolen from you? And ask yourself whether you've ever seen anyone at any level of government make the same claim about their own election. But that's exactly what President Trump did. He truly made his base believe that the only way he could lose was if the election was rigged. And senators, all of us know and all of us understand how dangerous that is for our country. Because the most combustible thing you can do in a democracy is convince people that an election doesn't count, that their voice and their vote don't count, and that it's all been stolen, especially if what you're saying are lies. Let us turn now to the election. As you know, the results were not fully reported on election night, which is not unusual in our nation's history. But by November 7th, Major news networks, including Fox News, reported that once the remaining votes were counted, Joe Biden would be the likely victor. So President Trump began urging his supporters to stop the count. I would imagine that if we went around this room, there are folks sitting here that started down on election night 
and ended up coming back up and winning their races. Perhaps that's why some of you are seated in this room today. But imagine if you were behind and the results start coming in and as you started pulling ahead, your opponent said, that's not fair, stop the count while I'm still ahead. That's what Donald Trump did. But that's not how America works. Here, every vote counts. You don't just stop counting when one person is ahead. We count every vote. And let's be clear, President Trump knew that you can't just stop counting votes, but he wanted to inflame his base. There was a purpose behind this, to truly make them believe that counting votes would result in a stolen, rigged election. He said at 12.49 a.m. on election night, quote, they're trying to steal the election. We will never let them do it. A little over an hour later, at roughly 2.30 in the morning, before all the votes were even close to being counted, he goes even further and actually declares victory. Take a look. This is a fraud on the American public. This is an embarrassment to our country. We were getting ready to win this election. Frankly, we did win this election. Frankly, we did win. Rather than calmly saying, let's count the votes. If there's legal issues, we'll go to court and we'll resolve them. Instead, he told his supporters that he actually won the election and the whole thing was a fraud. He said that on November 4th, and he has never recounted that statement since. Despite President Trump's pressure at the time, election officials around the country continued to carry out their duties. And as votes were counted and his loss became more certain, he riled up his base further. Take a look at these tweets. On November 5th, he tweeted, in all capital letters, as if shouting commands, quote, stop the count, stop the fraud. Senators, this is dangerous. I also want you to remember these tweets for another reason. Because that's what it looks like when Donald Trump wants people to stop doing something. And bear in mind, this is not the president saying to his supporters that somebody stole your cup of coffee. This is the commander in chief telling his supporters, your election is being stolen and you must stop the counting of American votes. And it worked. His words became their actions. His commands led to their actions. Take a look at this. The same day as those tweets, the same day as those tweets, around 100 Trump supporters showed up in front of the Maricopa County Election Center in Phoenix, some of them carrying rifles, literally trying to intimidate officials to stop the count, just as President Trump had commanded. Arizona Secretary of State Katie Hobbs said that protesters were, quote, causing delay and disruption and preventing those employees from doing their job. Let's call this what it was. We're facing a global pandemic. Workers were risking their health to ensure the integrity of our elections. And President Trump supporters were encircling them, trying to prevent, prevent them from doing their own jobs. This was dangerous, it was scary, and it was a blatant act of political intimidation. In Philadelphia, that same day, police investigated an alleged plot to attack the city's Pennsylvania Convention Center, where votes were being counted. Police took at least one man into custody who was carrying a weapon. And this happened all over, in Atlanta, in Detroit, and in Milwaukee. His supporters used armed force 
to try to disrupt lawful counting of votes, votes because they bought into Trump's big lie that the election was stolen from them. President Trump's months of inflaming and inciting his supporters had worked. They believed it was their duty to quite literally fight to stop the count, so they showed up at election centers across the country to do just that. This is a fraud on the American public. This is an embarrassment to our country. We were getting ready to win this election. Frankly, we did win this election. We were winning in all the key locations by a lot, actually. And then our numbers started miraculously getting whittled away in secret. They will be hiding. They will pay. They will be destroyed. Because America is rising. And there it is. They had bought into his big lie. President Trump told his supporters over and over again, nearly every day, in dozens of tweets, speeches, and rallies, that their most precious right in our democracy, their voice, their vote, was being stripped away, and they had to fight to stop that. And they believed him, and so they fought. And you may say, well, he didn't know that they'd take up arms. But when he did know, when it was all over the news, President Trump didn't stop. As Mr. Swalwell will show, after Donald Trump lost, he became even more desperate and incited his base even further. He urged them again and again with increasingly forceful language to fight to stop the steal. And even as the certification got closer, and he grew even more desperate, he gave them specific instructions on how, where, and when to fight to stop the steal. He told them to show up on January 6th and march to the U.S. Capitol to stop the certification of the election results. And he told them to come here and fight like hell. You will see clearly that this violent mob that showed up here on January 6 didn't come out of thin air. President Donald John Trump incited this violence. And that's the truth. Mr. President, distinguished senators, my name is Eric Swalwell and I represent California's 15th Congressional District. Manager Castro just told you about Donald Trump's lies and acts before the election. But, to paraphrase Winston Churchill, that wasn't the end of his efforts, that wasn't the beginning of the end, but perhaps it was the end of the beginning. Here's what I mean. You saw President Trump prime for months his supporters to believe that if the election was lost, it only could have been so because it was rigged. But that took time. Just like to build a fire, it doesn't just start with the flames. Donald Trump, for months and months, assembled the tinder, the kindling, threw on logs for fuel to have his supporters believe 
that the only way their victory would be lost was if it was stolen. So that way, President Trump was ready, if he lost the election, to light the match. And on November 7, after all the votes were counted, President Trump did lose by 7 million votes. But for Donald Trump, all was not lost. He had a backup plan. Instead of accepting the results or pursuing legitimate claims, he told his base more lies. He doused the flames with kerosene. And this wasn't just some random guy at the neighborhood bar blowing off steam. This was our commander in chief. Day after day, he told his supporters false, outlandish lies that the victory, that the election outcome was taken and it was rigged. And he had absolutely no support for his claims. But that wasn't the point. He wanted to make his base angrier and angrier. And to make them angry, he was willing to say anything. On November 15, he states, I concede nothing. We have a long way to go. Rigged election. Doesn't say why the election is rigged. November 17, in a Twitter statement, dead people voted. That's it. No evidence. Just dead people voted. November 28, Twitter statement. We have found many illegal votes. Stay tuned. This just wasn't true. He never found illegal votes. He didn't even try to pretend that he had evidence for that. And stay tuned, well, that was all about inciting his base, not about bringing legitimate claims. It was about dramatizing the election to anger his supporters. December 5, you see here, he goes after the governors of Arizona and Georgia, governors from his own party, claiming that they weren't with him. You see, Senators, he is casting this in combat terms, that either you are with him, making sure that he won the election, or you're fighting against him. These are just a few of the hundreds of Twitter statements that President Trump sent. And it wasn't just Twitter statements. As you'll see, he was dialing into meetings, holding rallies, appearing on television, continuing to spread the big lie that his election victory was stolen. People that were dead were signing up for ballots. Not only were they coming in and putting in a ballot, but dead people were requesting ballots. And they were dead for years. And they were requesting ballots. Dead people voting all over the place? The alleged Biden margin of victory in several states is entirely accounted for by extraordinarily large midnight vote dumps. You saw them with going up to the sky. Massive midnight vote dumps. Dead people voting all over the place. He said there were votes going up to the sky. This was never about pursuing legitimate claims. He was saying anything he could to trigger and anger his base so that they would fight like hell to overturn a legitimate election. And it worked. Just as Manager Castro showed you, President Trump's supporters were taking up arms to stop the count. His message to fight like, steel, fight like hell was having real consequences. In Michigan, you'll recall that President Trump was attacking that state and its officials. He continued these attacks even after Michigan certified its votes. Take a look at Michigan. Take a look at what they did with respect to counties. And then you get to Detroit, and it's like more votes than people? Dead people voting all over the place? You know, I won almost every county in Michigan, almost every district. 
We should have won that state very easily. We have a similar type of governor, I think, but I'll let you know that in about a week. He's literally telling them that there were more votes in Detroit than people. About 260,000 people voted in Detroit. There are roughly 500,000 registered voters in Detroit. There are approximately 670,000 people living in the city. So again, not true. But he needed to make these outlandish claims to truly make his supporters believe that their victory was stolen from them. And it was working. A few days after these clips, on December 5, his supporters surrounded the Michigan Secretary of State's home. Secretary of State's house and uh, the steel. Stop 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 the steel. You're a threat to democracy. You're a threat to free and honest elections. Nine o'clock at night, Secretary's family's inside. Protesters have surrounded her home, and they're chanting that she's a felon. And as we saw, when armed protesters showed up to follow President Trump's direction to stop the steal, this was not the first time that President Trump's supporters used threats and intimidation. President Trump cannot say, I didn't know what I was inciting. From what Manager Castro showed and what I just showed, there was plenty of evidence that his words had consequences. And if he wanted to stop it, he could stop it. You saw Mr. Castro read statement after statement from our Commander in Chief saying, stop the count, stop the steal. President Trump was never shy about using his platforms to try and stop something. He could have very easily told his supporters, stop threatening officials, stop going to their homes, stop it with the threats. But each time, he didn't. Instead, in the face of escalating violence, he incited them further. The next phase in the certification of results was the certification on December 14 of the Electoral College votes. The night before, President Trump personally issued 14 Twitter statements with more false claims about the election being stolen and directing his supporters to make sure that, quote, they cannot be certified. He states here, the rhinos, the rhinos that run the state voting apparatus have caused us the problem of allowing the Democrats to so blatantly cheat in their attempt to steal the election which we won overwhelmingly. We will never give up. In the face of threats to elected officials, this is his message. And he calls them rhinos, Republicans in name only, and tells them to never give up. President Trump, to him, it was his supporters against anyone who would not overturn the election results so that President Trump could win. But on December 14, despite all of President Trump's efforts to stop, the electors cast their votes according to the will of the American people, and Joe Biden was certified as having won 306 Electoral College votes. The day after this occurred, Leader McConnell recognized this, stating, many of us hoped that the presidential election would yield a different result. But our system of government has processes to determine who will be sworn in on January 20. The Electoral College has spoken. As Manager Castro said, no one here, no one among us wants to lose an election. Sometimes there's a reason to dispute an election. Sometimes the count is close. Sometimes we ask for a recount or we go to court. That's entirely appropriate. But what President Trump did was different. What President Trump did was the polar opposite of what any of us would do if we lost an election. Because once the outcome is clear and a judge rules, we concede. 
we recognize the will of the American people because we let the people decide. And that's what all of the courts, the Justice Department, and the 50 states that had counted the votes, they said it was time for a peaceful transition of power because that's what our Constitution and rule of law demands. Except President Trump. He directed all of the rage that he had incited to January 6th. That was his last chance to stop the peaceful transition of power. And that brings us to the attack. Manager Castro told you the power of the lie, especially when the lie comes from the most powerful person in the world, the commander in chief. It also helps if you spend millions of dollars to amplify that lie. You'll see here, in mid-December, President Trump announced the release of ads, including ones entitled, The Evidence is Overwhelming, Fraud, Stop the Steal. He spent $50 million from his legal defense fund on these ads to stop the steal and amplify his message. They were released nationally, played in video ads, online advertising, and targeted text messages. They used the same words and phrases that President Trump had been spreading for months, that the election was full of fraud, to stop the steal. But now they had a specific purpose. How do we know that purpose? These ads were designed to run all the way up to January 5. And then they stopped. This was purposeful and deliberate planning to target his base to rally around that day. And it wasn't just his ads. He continued to use his own platform. He told his supporters, who truly believed their victory had been stolen and who were ready to fight when, where, and how to stop what he believed was a steal. Donald Trump would issue a deliberate call to action and just like in his ads, that, was action, that action centered around January 6th. On December 19, at 1.42 in the morning, our commander in chief tweeted, big protest in DC on January 6th. Be there. Will be wild. Will be wild. We know why he picked this day. It wasn't random. It was his last chance to stop a peaceful transition of power. And he gave his supporters plenty of time to plan. This was the save the date, sent out 18 days before the event on January 6. And it wasn't a casual one-off reference or a single invitation. For the next 18 days, Donald Trump would make sure to remind them over and over and over to show up on January 6. And he would tell them exactly what he wanted them to do. On December 26, he tweets, if a Democrat presidential candidate had an election rigged and stolen with proof of such acts at a level never seen before, the Democrat senators would consider it an act of war and fight to the death. Mitch and the Republicans do nothing, just want to let it pass. No fight. He's saying that the Republicans are doing nothing and have no fight because you are doing your job, taking on the constitutional process of certifying the Electoral College results. And he also suggests, President Trump, that if this was the reverse and the Democrats had lost, it would be an act of war. An act of war. That's how Donald Trump prepared his supporters for January 6. He even stated again 14 minutes later to make sure his supporters understood, quote, the Justice Department and the FBI have done nothing about the 2020 presidential election voter fraud, the biggest scam, all caps, in our nation's history despite overwhelming evidence. They should be ashamed. And then he adds, history will remember. Never give up, 
See everyone in D.C. on January 6th. That phrase, history, history will remember, was the only time, the first time, Donald Trump had used it in his presidency. And he sent this to 70 plus million Twitter followers the day they needed to show up and be ready to fight. On December 27, he reminds them again, don't miss it, information to follow. A few days later, December 30, all caps, see you in DC. This continues all the way up to January 6. On January 1, he states, the big protest rally in Washington will take place at 11 a.m. Locational details to follow. Stop the steal. You'll see that an hour later, President Trump retweeted one of his Twitter followers. That follower was Kylie Kremer, executive director of Women for America First, the group organizing the January 6th rally and the creator of the Facebook group, Stop the Steal. Kremer tweeted, quote, the cavalry is coming, Mr. President, referring to the cavalry showing up on January 6. She also added a website for supporters to RSVP and made clear what the message was. Hashtag stop the steal. And what did President Trump say in response to hearing that the cavalry was coming? A great honor, he wrote back. This wasn't just a single tweet. He and his organizers would do this over and over repeatedly. On January 3, another supporter tweets, we have been marching all around the country for you, Mr. President. Now we will bring it to DC on January 6 and proudly stand beside you. Thank you for fighting for us. When President Trump reposted her tweet, she wrote back, best day ever. Thank you for the retweet. It has been an honor to stand up and fight for you and our nation. We will be standing strong on January 6th in DC with you. We are bringing the cavalry, Mr. President. We are bringing the cavalry. That was the consistent message. This was not just any old protest. President Trump was inciting something historic. The cavalry was coming and he was organized. In her post, Ms. Lawrence tagged Kylie Kremer, the organizer of the event, whose post we just saw President Trump retweet. Again, you see, this is all connected. I won't show you all of the Twitter statements, and there are a lot, but here's one more. President Trump retweeted another of Ms. Kremer's posts which had all the details of January 6 with the same hashtags. March for President Trump, do not certify, stop the steal. And in response, President Trump, he writes back, I will be there, historic day. Before Congress, I prosecuted violent crimes in California is an Alameda County Deputy District Attorney. And when you investigate and prosecute violent crimes, you have to distinguish. Was this a heat of passion crime? Or was it something more deliberate, planned, premeditated? The evidence here on this count is overwhelming. President Trump's conduct leading up to January 6 was deliberate, planned, and premeditated. This was not one speech, not one tweet. It was dozens in rapid succession with the specific details. He was acting as part of the host committee. In fact, when he had assembled his inflamed mob in DC, he warned us that he knew what was coming. This was President Trump's statement the night before the attack. I should say this was one of his dozens of statements on Twitter in the hours leading up to the attack. I hope the Democrats, and even more importantly, the weak and ineffective rhino section of the Republican Party are looking at the thousands of people pouring into DC 
they won't stand for a landslide victory to be stolen. At Senate Majority Leader, at John Cornyn, at Senator John Thune. Thousands of people pouring into D.C. who won't stand for the landslide election to be stolen. It's all right there. And he tags senators to pressure you to stop this. And he warns all of us that his thousands of supporters, whom you'll see that the FBI had warned were armed and targeting the Capitol, won't stand for us certifying the results of the election. This was never about one speech. He built this mob over many months with repeated messaging until they believed that they had been robbed of their vote and they would do anything to stop the certification. He made, the, he made them believe that their victory was stolen and incited them so he could use them to steal the election for himself. This election was rigged. This is tyranny against the people of the United States, and we are not standing for it anymore. If we don't root out the fraud, the tremendous and horrible fraud that's taken place in our 2020 election, we don't have a country anymore. The left lies, they cheat and they steal. They are ruthless, and they are hell-bent on getting power and control by any means necessary. Can't let it happen. Can't let it happen. The Democrats are trying to steal the White House. You cannot let them. Can't let it happen. Never concede. Fight, he told them in speech after speech. These crowds were ready to fight. This is what President Trump was inciting. He foresaw what was coming. And this is what he deliberately led to our doorstep on January 6. I want to be clear. During this trial, when we talk about the violent mob during the attack, we do not mean every American who showed up at President Trump's rally. Certain Americans came to protest peacefully, as is their right. That is what makes our country so great, to debate freely, openly, and peacefully our differences, just like all of you were attempting to do in this very room on January 6. But what President Trump did was different. He didn't tell his supporters to fight or be strong in a casual reference. He repeatedly, over months, told them to fight for a specific purpose. He told them their victory was stolen, the election was rigged, and their patriotic duty was to fight to stop the steal. And he repeated this messaging even after he saw the violence it was inciting. And when they were primed and angry and ready to fight, he escalated and channeled their rage with a call to arms. Show up on January 6, at the exact time the votes of the American people were being counted and certified, and then march to the Capitol and fight like hell. He told this to thousands of people who were armed to the teeth, targeting us and determined to stop the Electoral College count. What our Commander-in-Chief did was wildly different from what anyone here in this room did to raise election concerns. This was a deliberate, premeditated incitement to his base to attack our capital while the counting was going on. And it was foreseeable, especially to President Trump, who warned us he knew what was coming. This is what the evidence has overwhelmingly shown and will show in this trial. And it's also the truth. Mr. President. The Majority Leader. I ask you now to consent the Senate recess for a 15-minute break. Without objection, so ordered.
It is the first of what we expect will be several breaks throughout the day here on this first day of arguments, legal arguments, in the Senate impeachment trial of former President Donald Trump. It began with the lead house manager, Jamie Raskin of Maryland, laying out the, some of the constitutional arguments that they would address. Then we heard from, uh, then we heard from Joe Neguse of Colorado, who talked about the arc of the manager's legal case and what they would present ahead. After that came um, uh, Joaquin Castro of Texas, and he looked at some of the pre-election alleged provocations by then-president, former President Trump, ahead of the election while wrapping up there. Eric Swalwell of California was, um, was uh, laying out the after-election, what happened after the election, how the president uh, contested the election, and some of the events, the rallies, et cetera, leading up to the attack on the U.S. Capitol on January 6th. As you can see, as you heard from Senator Chuck Schumer, a 15-minute break in the proceedings in the Senate. 15 minutes yesterday, the 10 minutes uh, turned into 20 minutes, so it could be a little bit longer. And here's how the, the schedule looks for today. They've already begun, as we mentioned, their 16 hours of presentation here by the House managers. They'll do eight hours today, eight hours tomorrow, and then the president's team, his lawyers, will get their turn on Friday and Saturday with, again, a total of 16 hours over those two days. We expect on Sunday that the Senate will come in at um, 2 o'clock Eastern and may take up any questions, any, um, any uh, questions that senators have of the attorneys. They may also uh, choose to decide on witnesses and uh, submitting subpoenas for documents in the trial. Final arguments, uh, equal amount each side, expected early next week with a final vote on impeachment. Keeping in mind that the final vote in the Senate takes two-thirds, a two-thirds majority, in this case 67. There are 50 Republicans, there are 48 Democrats with two independents who caucus with Democrats effectively making it a 50-50 chamber with the Senate in majority and the, um, and the majority leader is uh, Chuck Schumer. A couple of comments from um, people watching the Senate impeachment trial, people participating. This is a tweet from Mark Meadows, the former president's former chief of staff. He says, there's one line from President Trump's January 6th speech that Democrats keep conveniently leaving out peacefully and patriotically, make your voices heard. From the majority leader, just before they gambled in today, he said, Donald Trump is char charged with inciting an insurrection. The United States Capitol was invaded and desecrated. The Senate impeachment trial of Donald Trump is about truth and accountability following the despicable January 6th attack. Yesterday, the vote in the Senate was 56 to 44 to move ahead to uh, decide that, yes, indeed, these proceedings were constitutional. One of the Republicans voting with the Democrats of that was uh, Bill Cassidy of Louisiana. After that vote, later, he talked about why he voted in, along with the Democrats this time, whereas the last time when Rand Paul questioned the constitutionality of going forward, he voted on the Republican side. Here's what he said. I, I got a minute more. Okay, shoot, Ms. Cochran, what's the question? So uh, the reaction uh, to the vote yesterday was very mixed. Some folks incredibly positive, some folks very negative. Those who are negative, I replied that this is a constitutional question, and clearly it had been established that it is constitutional, and the Constitution obviously becomes it is constitution and country over party. Uh, for some, they get it. And for others, they're not quite so sure. But that's to be expected. This does not predict my vote on anything else. It does predict that I will listen to these arguments as I did to the arguments yesterday with an open mind. I, I, I gotta run. That's Bill Cassidy, Senator Bill Cassidy. That's yesterday after the um, the Senate devoted 56 to 44 to move ahead with the, the trial, deciding on the constitutionality of um, attempting to impeach a former president, keeping in mind he was impeached by the U.S. House uh, in the House on January 13th, a week ahead of the inauguration of Joe Biden. Here's a tweet, though, from our own Craig Kaplan, uh, Capitol Hill producer, caught up with Indiana Senator Mike Braun this morning. And on the Cassidy vote, he talked to Mike Braun and in that, Mike Braun said Senator Cassidy voting to move ahead with impeachment trial, quote, after that, 
When you have one senator that changed a point of view, I think that says a lot. So I think pretty well fixes in place what you might see as the eventual outcome. I want to remind you, too, that we're in the middle of a, a break. Could be a 15-minute break here in the Senate, the impeachment trial. If you miss any of the um, goings-on, any of the proceedings, you can always follow what we're covering online at cspan.org slash impeachment in particular. And you also find there the briefs on each side submitted by the House managers and also by the president's attorneys. You can listen live and carry us along wherever you go at C-SPAN, at the C-SPAN radio app. And of course, our coverage here on C-SPAN 2 throughout the, the day today. Later on, we'll give you a chance to weigh in with some of your thoughts on what you're seeing today. And over the uh, next couple of days, we'll do that as well. A tweet here from the, uh, the, the Democratic side, basically the House managers, the House Judi Judiciary Committee, their overall view of this. And Jamie Raskin, a, a, Jamie Raskin uh, said some of this earlier, saying incitement of insurrection against the United States government is the most, uh, most grievous constitutional crime ever committed by a president. We'll take a look at some video from earlier today. Here's a look. So I'm going to take this off. So I'm going to be throwing out here real fast. Can I ask you about Cassidy real fast? Just a minute. I, I, I'm trying to talk to um, him. So the question was, um, regardless of what happens this week, how do I feel about 2024? Would I continue to support um, President Trump in 2024? Well, he have he. If he's not convicted and not impeached, then, of course, he'd have the opportunity to run. That, to me, raises another question, which is why are Democrats so concerned about having him on the ballot four years from now? Clearly, he surprised them once. They think that maybe, that maybe they think he could surprise them again, um, which raises the questions about their confidence at all. So back to me. Um, you know, you talk about... You talk about, in fact, I've had many Republicans that say, well, Bill Clinton was never punished for his crimes. Well, I think in politics there is this punishment. It's called losing elections, and um, or it's called you know losing your bar license or whatever it might be in the case of like a Bill Clinton. There's That's from earlier. Let's take you live now, just outside the Senate, Senator Richard Blumenthal. In fact, apparently by killing some of the people involved. Michael Bennett. Over the it was a coup attempt, an effort to overthrow the government and stop democracy from working. The founders' worst nightmare. And that's why this high crime was among the most heinous that any public official could commit. What we will see is that Donald Trump not only incited this riot and insurrection, but also then as commander in chief did nothing to save our democracy. In fact, he continued to inflame. He called them special people. And the long run lesson here is not only about January 6th or about Donald Trump. It is about domestic violence. The danger of domestic violence in this country is persistent and lethal, as the domestic terrorism bulletin has said. It is a real threat to our democracy. Thank you so much, Senator. Thank you for your time. Would you expect a Democrat to do? Senator Richard Blumenthal of Connecticut, live just outside the uh, Senate chamber. We're keeping our eye for statements like that as the Senate's in a break. The impeachment trial is in a break. The first one of the afternoon. They gaveled in today at noon Eastern. Keeping in mind that the, uh, the uh, House managers, the Democrats, will have 16 hours total of uh, presentations today and tomorrow. Likewise with the president's attorneys on Friday and on Saturday. So they should return shortly here from that uh, first uh, break of the day. The uh, Newsweek is, has a story today about some of the senators. Not only is this their second impeachment in 13 months, for a dozen of them, it's their third impeachment Twelve jurors will serve as impeachment trial jurors for a third time. They talk about, in particular, Chuck Schumer. They say Senator Schumer, who now serves as the majority leader, had the unique role of serving in the House of Representatives when Bill Clinton was impeached before joining the Senate in 1999 and serving as a juror for the trial. In the House, Schumer voted against impeachment and went on to vote against Clinton's conviction in the Senate. 
New York Democrat voted to convict Trump in the first Senate trial and has condemned the former president's actions in the wake of the January 6th riot. We mentioned the day began with the lead House manager, Jamie Raskin, laying out the constitutional case and responding to some of the attorneys uh, arguing yesterday in the opening, the constitutionality question. Here's some of what we heard from Jamie Raskin this morning. The evidence will be for you to see and hear and digest. The evidence will show you that ex-President Trump was no innocent bystander. The evidence will show that he clearly incited the January 6th insurrection. It will show that Donald Trump surrendered his role as commander-in-chief and became the inciter-in-chief of a dangerous insurrection. And this was, as one of our colleagues put it so cogently, on January 6th itself, the greatest betrayal of the presidential oath in the history of the United States. The evidence will show you that he saw it coming and was not remotely surprised by the violence. And when the violence inexorably and inevitably came as predicted and overran this body and the House of Representatives with chaos, we will show you that he completely abdicated his duty as commander in chief to stop the violence and protect the government and protect our officers and protect our people. He violated his oath of office to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution, the government, and the people of the United States. One of our Capitol officers who defended us that day was a longtime veteran of our force, a brave and honorable public servant who spent several hours battling the mob as part of one of those blue lines defending the Capitol in our democracy. For several hours straight, as the marauders punched and kicked and mauled and spit upon and hit officers with baseball bats and fire extinguishers, cursed the cops and stormed our capital, he defended us and he lived every minute of his oath of office. And afterwards, overwhelmed by emotion, he broke down in the rotunda. And he cried for 15 minutes. And he shouted out, I got called an N-word 15 times today. And then he recorded, I sat down with one of my buddies, another black guy in tears just started streaming down my face. And I said, what the F, man? Is this America? That's the question before all of you in this trial. Is this America? Can our country and our democracy ever be the same if we don't hold accountable the person responsible for inciting the violent attack against our country, our capital, and our democracy, and all of those who serve us so faithfully and honorably? Is this America? That's Jamie Raskin from earlier. Democrats are about two hours into their total of 16 hours of arguments against the president. As you can see, the Senate in a recess here, a break here in the Senate impeachment trial. We expect them uh, to return shortly. So they've so far heard from four of the nine managers, Jamie Raskin, Joaquin Castro, Eric Swalwell, and Joe Neguse. Uh, uh, Joaquin Castro of Texas was talking a bit about uh, the supporters and what they had to say. Here's a look. They had bought into his big lie. President Trump told his supporters over and over again, nearly every day, in dozens of tweets, speeches, and rallies that their most precious right in our democracy, their voice, their vote, was being stripped away and they had to fight to stop that. And they believed him. And so they fought. And you may say, well, he didn't know that they'd take up arms. But when he did know, when it was all over the news, President Trump didn't stop. As Mr. Swalwell will show, after Donald Trump lost, he became even more desperate and incited his base even further. He urged them again and again with increasingly forceful language to fight to stop the steal. And even as the certification got closer, 
and he grew even more desperate. He gave them specific instructions on how, where, and when to fight to stop the steal. He told them to show up on January 6th and march to the U.S. Capitol to stop the certification of the election results. And he told them to come here and fight like hell. You will see clearly that this violent mob that showed up here on January 6th didn't come out of thin air. President Donald John Trump incited this violence. And that's the truth. You heard it from them. They were doing what he wanted them to do. They wouldn't have listened to you, to me, to the Vice President of the United States who they were attacking. They didn't stop in the face of law enforcement, police officers fighting for their lives to stop them. They were following the President. He alone, our Commander-in-Chief, had the power to stop it. And he didn't. You will hear evidence tonight, tomorrow, throughout the trial about his refusal as Commander-in-Chief to respond to numerous desperate pleas on the phone, across social media, begging him to stop the attack. And you will see his relentless attack on Vice President Pence, who was at that very moment hiding with his family as armed extremists were chanting, hang Mike Pence, calling him a traitor. You will see that even when he did, finally, three and a half hours into the attack, tell these people to go home in peace, he added, as lead manager Raskin said, I'll quote, you're very special. We love you. Think for a moment, just a moment, of the lives lost that day, of the more than 140 wounded police officers, and ask yourself if as soon as this had started, President Trump had simply gone onto TV, just logged onto Twitter and said, stop the attack. If he had done so with even half as much force as he said, stop the steal. How many lives would we have saved? To him, it was his supporters against anyone who would not overturn the election results so that President Trump could win. But on December 14, despite all of President Trump's efforts to stop, the electors cast their votes according to the will of the American people, and Joe Biden was certified as having won 306 electoral college votes. The day after this occurred, Leader McConnell recognized this, stating, many of us hoped that the presidential election would yield a different result. But our system of government has processes to determine who will be sworn in on January 20. The Electoral College has spoken. As Manager Castro said, no one here, no one among us wants to lose an election. Sometimes there's a reason to dispute an election. Sometimes the count is close. Sometimes we ask for a recount or we go to court. That's entirely appropriate. But what President Trump did was different. What President Trump did was the polar opposite of what any of us would do if we lost an election. Because once the outcome is clear and a judge rules, we concede. We recognize the will of the American people because we let the people decide. And that's what all of the courts, the Justice Department, and the 50 states that had counted the votes, they said it was time for a peaceful transition of power because that's what our Constitution and rule of law demands. Except President Trump. He directed all of the rage that he had incited to January 6th. That was his last chance to stop the peaceful transition of power. 
And that brings us to the attack. Manager Castro told you the power of the lie, especially when the lie comes from the most powerful person in the world, the commander in chief. It also helps if you spend millions of dollars to amplify that lie. You'll see here, in mid-December, President Trump announced the release of ads, including ones entitled, The Evidence is Overwhelming, Fraud, Stop the Steal. He spent $50 million from his legal defense fund on these ads to stop the steal and amplify his message. They were released nationally, played in video ads, online advertising, and targeted text messages. They used the same words and phrases that President Trump had been spreading for months, that the election was full of fraud, to stop the steal. But now they had a specific purpose. How do we know that purpose? These ads were designed to run all the way up to January 5. And then they stopped. This was purposeful and deliberate planning to target his base to rally around that day. And it wasn't just his ads. He continued to use his own platform. He told his supporters, who truly believed their victory had been stolen and who were ready to fight when, where, and how to stop what he believed was a steal. Donald Trump would issue a deliberate call to action. And just like in his ads, that, was action, that action centered around January 6th. On December 19, at 1.42 in the morning, our Commander-in-Chief tweeted, Big protest in D.C. on January 6th. Be there. Will be wild. Will be wild. We know why he picked this day. It wasn't random. It was his last chance to stop a peaceful transition of power. And he gave his supporters plenty of time to plan. This was the save the date sent out 18 days before the event on January 6. And it wasn't a casual one-off reference or a single invitation. For the next 18 days, Donald Trump would make sure to remind them over and over and over to show up on January 6. And he would tell them exactly what he wanted them to do. On December 26, he tweets, if a Democrat presidential candidate had an election rigged and stolen with proof of such acts at a level never seen before, the Democrat senators would consider it an act of war and fight to the death. Mitch and the Republicans do nothing, just want to let it pass. No fight. He's saying that the Republicans are doing nothing and have no fight because you are doing your job taking on the constitutional process of certifying the Electoral College results. And he also suggests, President Trump, that if this was the reverse and the Democrats had lost, it would be an act of war. An act of war. That's how Donald Trump prepared his supporters for January 6. He even stated again 14 minutes later to make sure his supporters understood, quote, the Justice Department and the FBI have done nothing about the 2020 presidential election voter fraud, the biggest scam, all caps, in our nation's history despite overwhelming evidence. They should be ashamed. And then he adds, history will remember. Never give up. See everyone in D.C. on January 6th. Order. My kids, my kids, so good. Mr. Ask. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, my colleagues, Madeline Dean and Ted Lieu, will now detail uh, former President Trump's increasingly desperate attempts to stop the steal.
Mr. President. Esteemed members of the Senate, it is my solemn honor to be before you today. I am Madeline Dean, Congresswoman from the 4th Congressional District of Pennsylvania. I'm a lawyer. I'm a former professor of writing. I'm a sister. I'm a wife. I'm a mother. I'm a grandmother to three with fourth on her way. I'm a person of faith. And I'm an American. Along with Manager Liu, I will present the actions of a desperate president. And we will present evidence today of a class of public servants who, standing up to enormous pressure from the President of the United States, did the right thing and upheld their oaths. My colleagues just presented evidence of a President Trump's months-long efforts to incite his base, leading them to believe the election was stolen that they needed to fight like hell to stop the steal on January the 6th. These weren't President Trump's only efforts to overturn the results. Manager Liu and I will present evidence of President Trump's relentless escalating campaigns to fabricate an election victory by ignoring adverse court rulings, pressuring and threatening election officials, attacking senators and members of Congress, pressuring the Justice Department, and finally bullying his own vice president. President Trump and his allies filed 62 separate lawsuits in federal courts across more than half a dozen states and the District of Columbia, including Pennsylvania, my home state, as well as Arizona, Georgia, Michigan, Minnesota, Nevada, and Wisconsin. Of the 62 post-election legal challenges, he lost 61. Only one was successful, and that case involved ballot curing in Pennsylvania and had no impact on President Biden's 80,555 vote victory in our Commonwealth. To be clear, not a single court not a single judge agreed that the election results were invalid or should be invalidated. Instead, court after court reviewing these challenges said these cases were, quote, not credible, without merit, based on nothing but speculation, and flat out wrong. The judiciary resoundingly rejected Trump's fraud allegations and upheld the election results. But it was more than that. The courts said these cases were different. They were dangerous to our democracy. For an example, in an opinion by United States District Court Judge Matthew Brand from Pennsylvania, he said, and I quote, this court has been presented with strained legal arguments without merit and speculative accusations. In the United States of America, this cannot justify the disenfranchisement of a single voter, let alone all the voters of its sixth most populated state. Our people and laws and institutions demand more. Because this court has no authority to take away the right to vote of even a single person, let alone millions of citizens, it cannot grant plaintiffs requested relief. That decision by Judge Braun was affirmed on appeal by Judge Stephanos Bevis, a Trump appointee who agreed and wrote, and I quote, the campaign's claims have no merit. The number of ballots it specifically challenges is far smaller than the roughly 81,000 vote margin of victory. And it never claims fraud or that any of the votes were cast by illegal voters. Plus, tossing out millions of mail-in ballots would be drastic and unprecedented, disenfranchising a huge swath of the electorate and upsetting all down-ballot races." End quote. Similarly, as Judge Linda Parker of the Eastern District of Michigan framed it, she said, stunning in its scope and breathtaking in its reach, if granted, the relief would disenfranchise the votes of more than 5.5 million Michigan citizens who, with dignity 
and hope and a promise of a vote participated in the 2020 general election. Donald Trump told his supporters they are stealing the election. They took away your vote. It's rigged. That was not true. According to judge after judge, the truth was exactly the opposite. Trump was not suing to ensure election integrity. He was pursuing lawsuits that would, in effect, strip away American votes so that he could win. In other words, Donald Trump was asking the judiciary to take away votes from Americans so that he could steal the election for himself. Then, after losing in all the courts, Trump turned to another tactic, pressuring and threatening election officials. You saw what happened in Michigan after Trump attacked the state and its election officials. His supporters surrounded the Secretary of State's home, as you saw in the earlier slide, chanting, calling her a felon. On November 17th, the Board of Canvassers for Wayne County, Michigan, home to Detroit, unanimously certified the election results for Biden. That same night, after their vote to certify the results, Trump called the two Rep Republican members of that board, pressuring them to change their minds. The call worked. The next day, both Monica Palmer and William Hartman, the Republican board members, attempted to rescind their vote to certify Michigan's election results, but they simply couldn't. President Trump didn't stop there. He then contacted Majority Leader of the Michigan Senate, Mike Shirky, and the Speaker of the Michigan House, Lee Chatfield, to lobby them to overturn Michigan's results. Trump invited Mr. Chatfield and Mr. Shirky to Washington to meet with him at the White House, where the President lobbied them further. Let's be clear, Donald Trump was calling officials, hosting them at the White House, urging them to defy the voters in their state and instead award votes to Trump. The officials held strong, and so Trump moved on to a different state, my home state of Pennsylvania. I am certain my senators, Casey and Senator Toomey, remember what happened there. In early December, as he did in Michigan, he began calling election officials, including my former colleagues in the Pennsylvania legislature, Republicans, Majority Leader Kim Ward and Speaker of the House, Brian Cutler. Majority Leader Ward said the President called her to, quote, declare there was a fraud in the voting, end quote. Then on November 25th, President Trump phoned into a Republican state Senate policy hearing trying to convince the Republican legislators, senators, and House members there had been a fraud in the vote. He even had his lawyer hold a phone up to the microphone in that hearing room so the committee could hear him. Here is what he said. We can't let that happen. We can't let it happen for our country. And this election has to be turned around because uh, we won Pennsylvania by a lot and we won all of these swing states by a lot. This was a gathering uh, I've attended many, I have to tell you, as a former state legislator, a lot of policy hearings. I have to say with some confidence that was likely the first time a president of the United States of America called into a state legislative policy hearing. And remember, here is the president saying he won Pennsylvania. And Pennsylvania had been certified for, that Biden had won by more than 80,000 votes. Less than a week after calling into that meeting, he invited multiple Republican members of the Pennsylvania legislature to the White House, the same scheme he had used on the Michigan legislators. It didn't work with those public servants either. Think about it. The President of the United States was calling public officials, calling from the White House, inviting them into the Oval Office, telling them to disenfranchise voters of their state, telling them to overturn the will of the American people. Also, he could take the election for himself. And then in Georgia, a state Trump had counted on for victory, his conduct was perhaps the most egregious. 
On November 11th, Republican Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger confirmed that he believed ballots were ac uh, ac accurately counted for Biden. Trump went on a relentless attack. Here are just a few examples. In all, Trump tweeted at Raffensperger 17 times in the coming week. I'll show you just a few. Calling him a disaster, obstinate, not having a clue, being played for a fool, and being a so-called Republican. All because Raffensperger was doing his job, ensuring the integrity of our elections. And these attacks had consequences. Mr. Raffensperger and his family received death threats. Quote, your husband deserves to face a firing squad. You better not botch this recount. Your life depends upon it. The Raffensburgers should be put on trial for treason and face execution. Just some of the threats they received. After these death threats, on November 25th, Mr. Raffensperger wrote an op-ed where he said, my family voted for Trump, donated to him, and are now being thrown under the bus by him. But he also noted, elections are the bedrock of our democracy. They need to be run fairly and perhaps more importantly, impartially. That's not partisan, that's just American. It's important to remember that this wasn't just a random attack. Trump wasn't just criticizing a politician over policy. We're saying he didn't agree. Donald Trump was savagely attacking a Secretary of State because the official did his job and certified the state according to how the people in that state voted. Donald Trump was trying to undermine our elections by taking votes away from the American people so that he could remain president. And he was willing to blame and betray anyone anyone, even his own supporters, if they got in the way. Remember, senators, those threats were to Mr. Raffensperger's family. So some may say Trump didn't know his attacks against Mr. Raffensperger would result in death threats, except that all of this was very public. The secretary published his op-ed in USA Today, and major networks, including Fox, covered the threats against the Raffensperger. <coughs> What did Trump do? Did he stop? Did he say, no, no, supporters, that isn't what I meant? No, he doubled down. Let's see the evidence. This was a massive fraud. It should never take place in this country. We're like a third world country. Look at, look at Georgia. But I understand the Secretary of State, who is really, uh, he's an enemy of the people. The Secretary of State. And whether he's Republican or not, this man, what he's done. Like this character in Georgia, who's a disaster. Let that sink in. A Republican public servant doing his job, whose family had just received death threats, and the President of the United States labeled him an enemy of the people. And that's why this is different, because this was not just one attack or one comment. This was attack after attack in the face of clear threats of violence. And on December 1st, another official, Gabriel Sterling, a Republican who voted for Trump, made this point and appealed directly to our president to stop his dangerous conduct. Mr. President, it looks like you likely lost the state of Georgia. We're investigating. There's always a possibility. I get it. And you have the rights to go through the courts. What you don't have the ability to do, and you need to step up and say this, is stop inspiring people to commit potential acts of violence. Someone's going to get hurt. Someone's going to get shot. Someone's going to get killed. Mr. Sterling put this perfectly. In this country, we can appropriately challenge a close count or go to the courts or disagree with others or make bold statements, but what Trump was doing was different. Someone's going to get hurt. Someone's going to get shot. Someone's going to get killed. Mr. Sterling saw what Trump's conduct was fomenting. He warned him on live TV that violence was already happening and that more violence was foreseeable 
and inevitable. Sterling's pleas were played over and over on every network. Rather than heed that warning, Trump escalated again. In early December, Trump called Brian Kemp, the governor of Georgia, and pressured him to hold a special session of the state legislature to overturn the election results and to appoint electors who would vote for Trump. A few weeks later, on December 23rd, Trump called the chief investigator for the, for the Georgia Bureau of Investigations, who was conducting an audit, an audit of the signature matching procedures for absentee ballots. Trump urged him, find the fraud, and claimed the official would be a national hero if he did. Let's call this what it is. He was asking the official to say there was evidence of fraud when there wasn't any. The official refused, and the investigation was completed. And on December 29th, Raffensperger announced that the audit found, quote, no fraudulent absentee ballots with a 99% confidence level. On January 3rd, Trump tweeted about a call he had with a uh, Georgia, Georgia election official the day before. He said, and I quote, I spoke to Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger yesterday about Fulton County and voter fraud in Georgia. He was unwilling or unable to answer questions such as the ballots under the table scam, ballot destruction, out of state voters, dead voters, and more. He has no clue. On January the 5th, the Washington Post released a recording of that call, which had occurred on January 2nd. Remember, just four days before the attack on the Capitol. Here is what President Trump said. It's more illegal for you than it is for them, because you know what they did and you're not reporting it. That's a, you know, that's a criminal, that's a criminal offense. And, and you know, you can't let that happen. That's, that's a big risk to you and to Ryan, your lawyer. That's a big risk. Let's be clear. This is the President of the United States telling a Secretary of State that if he does not find votes, he will face criminal penalties. And not just any number of votes. Donald Trump was asking the Secretary of State to somehow find the exact number of votes Donald Trump lost the state by. Remember, President Biden won Georgia by 11,779 votes. In his own words, Trump said, all I want to do is this. I just want to find 11,780 votes. He wanted the Secretary of State to somehow find the precise number, plus one, so that he could win. Here's what he said. So, look, all I want to do is this. I just want to find uh, 11,780 votes, which is one more than we have. He says it right there, the President of the United States telling a public official to manufacture the exact votes needed so he can win. Senators, we must not become numb to this. Trump did this across state after state, so often, so loudly, so publicly. Public officials like you and me receive death threats and calls threatening criminal penalties all because Trump wanted to remain in power. These public officials exercised great political and personal courage in the face of unprecedented pressure from a president of the United States. Senators, ours is a dialogue with history, a conversation with the past, with a hope for the future. Senators, I thank you today to your, for your kind attention. Good afternoon. I'm Congressman Ted Lieu. My colleague, Congresswoman Dean, went through President Trump's efforts to overturn the election through the courts, and when that started failing, his deeply disturbing attacks on state and local officials. 
I'm going to walk through President Trump's extraordinary efforts remaining until January 6, when he tried again to overturn the election. I first want to highlight Representative Raskin's question to all of you today. Is this America? Like all of you, I love this country. I am an immigrant. My parents came to Ohio, and we started off living in the basement of a person's home. We were poor, and they went to flea markets to sell gifts to make ends meet. Over many years, they built a small business, opened six gift stores, and achieved the American dream. It's one reason I joined the United States Air Force on active duty. I believe America is an exceptional country. I was trained as a prosecutor at Maxwell Air Force Base in Alabama, and I remain in the reserves because we're the greatest country in the world. But how did our exceptional country get to the point where a violent mob attacked our capital, murdering a police officer, assaulting over 140 other officers? How do we get to the point where rioters desecrated, defiled, and dishonored your Senate chamber, where the very place in which you sit became a crime scene and where National Guard troops still patrol outside wearing body armor. I'll show you how we got here. President Donald J. Trump ran out of nonviolent options to maintain power. After his efforts in the courts and threatening officials failed, he turned to privately and publicly attacking members of his own party in the House and in the Senate. He would publicly bait senators, naming them in social media. For example, on December 18th, President Trump named at Senate Majority Leader and Republican senators, telling them they have to get tougher or they won't have a Republican Party anymore. We won the presidential election by a lot. Fight for it. Don't let them take it away. President Trump was suggesting to members of this Senate that if they didn't help him try to overturn the election, there would be consequences. On December 24th, President Trump wrote, I saved at least eight Republican senators, including Mitch, from losing in the last rigged for president election. Now they almost all sit back and watch me fight against a crooked and vicious foe, the radical left Democrats. I will, and in all capital letters he wrote, never forget exclamation point. President Trump was telling you that you owe him, that if you don't help him fight to overturn the results, he will never forget and that there will be consequences. These are threats just like the threats he made to state and local officials. And it continued. On December 29th, President Trump tweeted, can you imagine the Republicans stole a presidential election from the Democrats? All hell would break out. Republican leadership only wants a path of least resistance. Our leaders, not me of course, are pathetic. <laughs> they only know how to lose. P.S. I got many senators and congressmen and congresswomen elected. I do believe they forgot. President Trump targeted senators and members of Congress on social media calling them pathetic for letting the election get, quote, stolen from them. On January 4th, two days before the attack, President Trump tweeted, the surrender caucus within the Republican Party will go down in infamy as weak and ineffective guardians of our nation who are willing to accept the certification of fraudulent presidential numbers. Now he's mocking some Republican members as the surrender caucus, calling them weak and ineffective guardians of our nation because they would not pretend that he had won when in fact he had not. And then, the very day before the attack, President Trump's threats grew even more heated and specific towards Republicans that he considered to be part of that surrender caucus. Now, we've shown you this tweet before, but I want to draw your attention to how the President was not just inciting his base, but how he was also calling out specific Senate Republicans at the end of this tweet. This is a specific warning to anyone who won't help him overturn the results Anyone who was against the president became an enemy. And let me be very clear. The president wasn't just coming for one or two people or Democrats like me. He was coming for you, 
for Democratic and Republican senators. He was coming for all of us, just as the mob did at his direction. In addition to going after senators and members of Congress, President Trump also pressured our Justice Department to investigate the false claims that the election was stolen. At the President's direction, Attorney General William Barr, a loyal member of the President's Cabinet, authorized federal prosecutors to pursue substantial allegations of voting and vote tabulation irregularities. Bill Barr pursuing these allegations sparked an outcry. 16 assistant U.S. attorneys in the Trump administration urged the Attorney General to cease investigations because they had not seen evidence of any substantial anomalies. That means they did not find any evidence of real fraud. Attorney General Barr pursued the investigations anyways, and after his investigation, this is what he found, quote, we have not seen fraud on a scale that could have affected a different outcome in the election. Two weeks later, on December 14th, the electors voted to give Joe Biden 306 electoral votes and ensured his victory. The following day, Bill Barr resigned. Attorney General Barr had loyally served President Trump. He had never publicly come out against the president, but for Bill Barr making up election fraud claims and saying the election was stolen was a bridge too far. Bill Barr made clear that attempting to overturn election results crossed a line. According to a news report, Bill Barr, the highest law enforcement official in the land, told President Donald Trump to his face that his theories of election fraud were, quote, bullshit, unquote. When Bill Barr resigned, his former deputy, Jeff Rosen, took his place. President Trump initially tweeted about Mr. Rosen that he was an outstanding person when he announced that he would become acting attorney general. But when Rosen took over, President Trump put the same pressure on him that he had done with state officials, members of Congress, U.S. senators, and his former attorney general. President Trump reportedly summoned acting attorney general Rosen to the Oval Office the next day and pressured Rosen to appoint special counsels to keep investigating their election, including unfounded accusations of widespread voter fraud, and also to investigate Dominion, the voting machine's firm. According to reports, Mr. Rosen refused. He maintained that he would make decisions based on the facts and the law, and reminded President Trump what he had already been told by Attorney General Bill Barr, that the department had already investigated and, quote, found no evidence of widespread fraud. But President Trump refused to follow the facts and the law, so the president turned to someone he knew would do his bidding. He turned to Jeffrey Clark, another Justice Department lawyer, who had allegedly expressed support for using the Department of Justice to investigate the election results. Shortly after Acting Attorney General Rosen followed his duty and the law to reopen, to refuse to reopen investigations, President Trump intended to replace Mr. Rosen with Mr. Clark, who could then try to stop Congress from certifying the Electoral College results. According to reports, White House Counsel Pat Cipollone advised President Trump not to fire Acting Attorney General Rosen. Department officials had also threatened to resign in mass if he had fired Rosen. President Trump's actions time and time again made clear that he would do anything and pressure anyone if it meant overturning the election results. We watched President Trump use any means necessary to pursue this aim, feverishly grasping for straws at retaining his hold on the presidency but all his efforts prior to January 6 kept failing. And finally, in his desperation, he turned on his own vice president. He pressured Mike Pence to violate his constitutional oath and to refuse to certify the oath. President Trump had decided that Vice President Pence, who presided over the certification, could somehow stop it. As Pence would later confirm, the vice president does not have that power in the Constitution. And President Trump never tried to explain why he thought the vice president could block the certification of election results. He just began relentlessly attacking the vice president. Publicly, President Trump attacked Pence on social media and at rallies. 
getting his supporters to believe that Mike Pence could stop this certification on January 6th. Here's what President Trump said in Georgia on January 4th. And I hope Mike Pence comes through for us, I have to tell you. I hope that our great vice president, our great vice president comes through for us. He's a great guy. Of course, if he doesn't come through, I won't like him quite as much. Behind closed doors, President Trump applied significant pressure to his second in command. Multiple reports confirmed that President Trump used his personal attorneys and other officials to pressure the vice president. Trump reportedly told almost anyone who called him to also call the vice president. According to reports, when Mike Pence was in the Oval Office, President Trump would call people to try to get them to convince the vice president to help him. And President Trump kept repeating the myth that Pence could stop the certification to his base to anger them, hoping to intimidate Mike Pence. On the morning of the rally on January 6, President Trump tweeted, all Mike Pence has to do is send them back to the states, and in all caps he wrote, and we win. Do it, Mike. This is a time for extreme courage. President Trump later went on to attack Pence nearly a dozen times in his speech at the Save America March. Privately, in person, before Pence headed to oversee the joint session on January 6, President Trump again threatened Pence. You can either go down in history as a patriot, Mr. Trump told him, according to two people briefed on the conversation, or you can go down in history as a pussy. As a veteran, I find it deeply dishonorable that our former president and commander-in-chief equated patriotism with violating the Constitution and overturning the election. You will see and hear the consequences of President Trump's repeated attacks on the vice president, the chance of traitor, and the chance of hang Mike Pence. Thankfully, Vice President Pence stood his ground like our other brave officials stood their ground. He refused the president and fulfilled his duty on January 6, even after the Capitol was attacked, even after he was personally targeted, even after his family was targeted. Vice President Pence stood strong and certified the election. Vice President Pence showed us what it means to be an American, what it means to show courage. He put his country, his oath, his values, and his morals above the will of one man. The president had tried everything in his power to seize the, um, everything in his attempt to seize power from the rightful victor of the election. President Trump's extraordinary actions grew increasingly more desperate. You saw him go from pursuing claims in the courts to threatening state and local election officials to then attacking members of Congress and the Senate to compromising our Justice Department and then to attacking the Republican vice president. These brave public servants were being pressured by our commander in chief to overturn the results. Some of them and their families got death threats. Thankfully, at every turn, our democratic processes prevailed and the rule of law prevailed. It is only because all of these people stayed strong and re refused President Trump that our republic held fast and the will of the electorate was seen through. And at this point, President Donald J. Trump ran out of nonviolent options to maintain power. I began, to raise, I began today by raising the question of how we got here. What you saw was a man so desperate to cling to power that he tried everything he could to keep it. And when he ran out of nonviolent measures, he turned to the violent mob that attacked your Senate chamber on January 6th. As you cast your vote after this trial, I hope each of you will think of the bravery of all these people who said no to President Trump because they knew that this was not right, that this was not America. Next, Representative Stacey Plaskett of the Virgin Islands will show 
in quite chilling detail, I should say, how President Trump was well aware of the threat of violence on January 6, and how he welcomed and amplified his supporters' plans for insurrection against the Union. Uh, I should say, as lead manager, this is a moment of special pride for me, because Representative Plaskett is not only the first delegate ever to be uh, on a team of impeachment managers in American history, but she was also my law student at American University's Washington College of Law. And I hope I'm not violating any federal educational records laws when I say she was an A student then and she's an A-plus student now. Stacey Plaskett. Thank you so much. Height. Mr. President, distinguished senators, I'm Stacy Plaskett, and I represent the people of the Virgin Islands of the United States. Over this past weekend, my 11-year-old daughter, I overheard her telling one of my sons, mommy doesn't seem really nervous about the impeachment trial to which that son, sounding like an older brother, said, Talia, you'll learn that most of the time, mommy really seems to have it under control. Now, we know as parents, that's not always the case. But I've learned throughout my life that preparation and truth can carry you far, can allow you to speak truth to power. I've learned that as a young black girl growing up in the projects in Brooklyn, housing community on St. Croix, sent to the most unlikeliest of settings, and now as an adult woman representing an island territory speaking to the U.S. Senate. And because of truth, I am confident today speaking before you because truth and facts are overwhelming that our president, the president of the United States, incited a mob to storm the Capitol to attempt to stop the certification of a presidential election. My fellow managers have shown and will continue to show clear evidence that President Trump incited a violent mob to storm our capital when he ran out of nonviolent means to stop the election. Once assembled, that mob, at the president's direction, erupted into the bloodiest attack on this capital since 1814. Some of you have said there's no way the president could have known how violent the mob would be. That is false, because the violence, it was foreseeable. I want to show you why this violence was foreseeable and why Donald Trump was different than any other politician just telling their fighters, their supporters, to fight for something. The violence that occurred on January 6, like the attack itself, did not just appear you'll see that Donald Trump knew the people he was inciting, he saw the violence that they were capable of, and he had a pattern and practice of praising and encouraging that violence, never, ever condemning it. And you'll see that this violent attack was not planned in secret. The insurgents believed that they were doing the duty of their president. They were following his orders. And so they publicized it openly, loudly, proudly, exact blueprints of how the attack would be made. 
law enforcement saw these postings and reported that these insurgents would violently attack the Capitol itself. This was not just a, com a comment by an official to fight for a cause. This was months of cultivating a base of people who were violent, praising that violence, and then leading that violence, that rage, straight at our door. The point is this. By the time he called the cavalry of his thousands of supporters on January 6th, and an event he had invited them to, he had every reason to know that they were armed, that they were violent, and that they would actually fight. He knew who he was calling and the violence they were capable of. And he still gave that marching orders to go to the Capitol and quote, fight like hell and stop the steal. Make no mistake, the violence was not just foreseeable to President Trump, the violence was what he deliberately encouraged. As early as September, Trump set the precedent that when asked to denounce violence, he would do the opposite and encourage it. Now, if the president had only said something once about fighting to stop the steal and violence erupted, there would be no way to know he intended to incite it or saw it coming. But just as the president spent months spreading his big lie of the election, he also spent months cultivating groups of people who, following his command, repeatedly engaged in real, dangerous violence. And when they did, when the violence erupted as a response to his calls to fight against the Solon election, he did not walk it back. He did not tell them no. He did the opposite, the opposite. He praised and encouraged the violence so that it would continue. He fanned the flame of violence and it worked. You'll see this over time. These very groups and individuals whose violence the president praised helped lead the attack on January 6th. And that's how we know clearly that President Trump deliberately incited this and how we know he saw it coming. There are many examples where the president engaged in this pattern and I'm just gonna walk you through a few of them. Let's start with the President Trump's incitement of the Proud Boys. Many of you have heard of this group, which since 2018 has been classified by the FBI as an extremist organization. Since that classification, the group has repeatedly engaged in serious acts of violence, including at pro-Trump rallies. And one such act, on September 7th, the Proud Boys attacked a man with a baseball bat and then punched him while he was down on the ground. On September 29th, during a presidential debate, President Trump was asked specifically if he was willing to condemn white supremacy and militia groups if he was willing to tell them to stand down and stop the violence. Let's watch. But are you willing tonight to condemn white supremacists and militia groups sure. and to say that they need to stand down and not add to the violence in a number of these cities as we saw in Kenosha and as we've seen in Portland? Sure, are you I'm prepared to, to do specifically that, but do it? Well, I go would ahead, say... sir. Let's hear now the president's response. Do it, sir. Say it. Do it. Say it. Do you want to call them? What do you want to call them? Give me a name. Give me a white name. White supremacists and white right like right 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 stand back and stand by. When asked to condemn the Proud Boys and white supremacists, what did our president say? He said, stand back and stand by. His message was heard loud and clear. The group adopted that phrase, stand back and stand by, 
as their official slogan. They created merchandise with their new slogan, which they wore proudly across their backs at Trump's rallies, and they followed the president's orders. You'll see more about this later in the trial, but you'll see in these photos, to the left, Dominic Pizzola, and to the right, William Pepe, two of the leaders of the group heading to the Capitol on January 6th. They were later charged with working together to obstruct law enforcement. As we go through this evidence, I want you to keep in mind these words by President Trump when asked to condemn violence. Stand back and stand by. And see example after example of the kinds of people like the Proud Boys who he had standing by on January 6. By October, as my colleagues Mr. Castro and Mr. Swalwell showed you, Donald Trump was escalating his big lie that the only way he could lose the election was if it was rigged. So as election day neared, his supporters were frustrated and they were angry. They were prepared to ensure his victory by any means necessary. One of these violent acts was on October 30th, sometime after 12.30 p.m. A caravan of more than 50 trucks covered in pro-Trump campaign gear confronted and surrounded cars carrying Biden-Harris campaign workers and a Biden-Harris campaign bus as they were traveling down Interstate 35 from San Antonio to Austin. According to witnesses, this caravan repeatedly tried to force the bus you saw and you see in that video to slow down in the middle of the highway and then to run it off the road. What that video you just saw does not show is that the bus that they tried to run off the road was filled with young campaign staff, volunteers, supporters, surrogates, people. As the Trump supporters closed in on the bus, a large back black pickup truck adorned with Trump flags suddenly and intentionally swerved and crashed into a car driven by a Biden-Harris volunteer. News of the event went viral on social media. The President of the United States, in a campaign, saw his own supporters trying to run a bus carrying his opponent's campaign workers off the highway. To physically intimidate people in this country campaigning. Here was his response the next day. Three, two, one, go! Welcome to the The President of the United States tweeted a video of his supporters trying to drive a bus off the road. You'll recall in that first video that I showed you, there was no sound. Well, the one that he tweeted had a fight theme song placed to it that the President, the President put that music to that video. And he added at the top, I love Texas. By the next evening, that tweet that he did had been viewed 12.6 million times. And it wasn't just a tweet. On November 1st, at a Michigan rally with a sea of supporters, the president talked about that incident again. Here it is. Do you see the way our people, they, you know, they were protecting his bus yesterday because they're nice. So his bus, they had hundreds of cars, Trump, Trump, Trump and the American flag. That's a, you see Trump and American flag. The president made a public joke of violence against campaigners in an American election. He made light of it. This was not a joke. In fact, 
It was so violent, it put so many people in harm's way that the FBI investigated the incident and the criminal responsibility of those who attacked these campaign workers. Now, our President Donald Trump could have said, okay, I didn't realize how bad that was. This was very violent. Please stop. But he didn't. He saw the investigation and made a statement in defense of his supporters' attack on the bus, writing, quote, in my opinion, these patriots did nothing wrong. Engaging in violence for him made them patriots to Donald Trump. For anyone who says Donald Trump didn't know the violence he was inciting, I ask you to consider his supporters tried to drive a bus off the highway in the middle of the day to intimidate his opponent's campaign workers. And his response was to tweet the video of the incident that had fight music, joke about it, and call those individuals in that incident patriots. And once again, Donald Trump's pay, praise worked to incite them further. Emboldened by that praise, they remained ready to fight, ready to stand back and stand by. This link is not hypothetical. Just like we saw with the Proud Boys showing up in full force on January 6, Donald Trump's encouragement of this attack made sure his supporters were ready for the next one. The caravan bus attack had been organized by a Trump supporter named Keith Lee. Leading up to the attack on our capital of January 6, Mr. Lee teamed up with other supporters to fundraise to help to bring people to Washington, D.C. for that day. The morning of the attack, he filmed footage of the Capitol, pointed out the flimsiness of fencing, and then addressed his supporters before the attack, saying, quote, as soon as you all get done hearing the president, y'all get to the Capitol. We need to surround this place. During the attack, he used a bullhorn to call out for the mob to rush in. He later went to the rotunda himself and then back outside to urge the crowd to come inside. These are the people that President Trump cultivated who were standing by. I'd like to look at another example. After the election on December 12th, Trump supporters gathered in mass to protest the stolen election in DC. It was billed by his loyalists as the second million MAGA march. The, or, the rally was organized by Women for America First, the same group that you'll see later secured the permit for the January 6th rally. And who else was there? The Proud Boys, standing by. Donald Trump did not attend that rally, but he made sure to make clear his supporters throughout the day how he felt about the event. At 8.47 a.m., he sent out a tweet. We have just begun to fight. And then the rally began. And Donald Trump's allies, who spoke at the rally, carried on his message of the stolen election and the importance of fighting to stop the steal. Here's Nicholas Fuentes, a commentator who had organized a Stop the Steal rally in Michigan with Trump supporters. And the first million MAGA march, we promised that if the GOP would not do everything in their power to keep Trump in office, that we would destroy the GOP. Yeah. And as we gather here in Washington, D.C. for a second million MAGA march, we're done making promises. It has to happen now. We are going to destroy the GOP. Yeah. Those words, that was Trump's message. Destroy anyone who won't listen. 
who won't help them take the election for Trump. And as you will see, this was just the preview for Fuentes, who, like the Proud Boys and the Trump caravan organizers, would later heed the president's call and come to Washington and be there on January 6. Later in the rally, a former Trump campaign spokeswoman, Katrina Pearson, also spoke. During her speech, she stated, quote, this isn't over, this is just beginning, referring to the fight to stop the steal. And then she added, we knew both Republican and Democrats were against we people, we the people. We are the cavalry. No one's coming for us. It's clear that Trump and some of his supporters saw this as war, a fight against anyone who was unwilling to do whatever it took to keep Donald Trump in power. We are the cavalry. And President Trump continued to reinforce his support of these messages throughout the day. At 1.48 p.m., after both speeches, he retweeted his deputy chief of staff's tweet, showing his crowd that he had flown over on Marine One, and he tweeted, quote, thank you, patriots. These people were, as you can see, gathered in mass and being told by the president's allies that their election had been stolen. And they were told they were the cavalry. No one else could do it. And after hearing these speeches and seeing the president's support, this is what Donald Trump's cavalry was capable of. What you just saw was the violence that ensued after that rally. The Proud Boys, after that rally, engaged in serious acts of violence in downtown DC. Some Trump supporters and self-identified Proud Boys vandalized churches after that rally. If we look at these events, it's clear how we got here. Because what did the president do after that? He turned right around, and a little over a week later, he began coordinating the January 6th Save America rally with the same people who had planned the second million MAGA march. You'll recall that the Women for America First had organized that second million MAGA march. They had originally planned rallies for January, 20, January 22nd, and January 23rd, after the inauguration. But Donald Trump had other plans. On December 19th, President Trump tweeted his save the date for January 6th. He told his supporters to come to DC for a big protest, the day billing it as wild. Just days later, Women for America First amended their permit to hold their rally on January 6th, pursuant to the president save the date, instead of after the inauguration. This was deliberate. Reports confirm that the president himself, President Trump, became directly involved with the planning of the event, including the speaking lineup, even the music to be played, just as he chose the music for his wee treat of the caravan driving the Biden-Harris bus off the road with that fight song. And he brought the same people who spoke at the second Million Magum rally to help as well. Trump's campaign advisor, Katrina Pearson, who you recall said on December 12th that this is the only the beginning, we are the cavalry, also became directly involved in planning the event. They even sent out invitations together. This is Amy Kremer, one of the founders of Women for America First, tweeting the invitation, tagging Donald Trump and other organizers, inviting the same supporters 
who had just engaged in serious violence at the second million MAGA rally to show up to the largest rally to stop the steal. And President Trump seemed to have other plans for what was gonna happen at that rally too. Women for America First had initially planned for the rally goers to remain at the ellipse until the counting of the state electoral slates first was completed, just like they had remained at Freedom Plaza after the second million MAGA march. In fact, the permit stated in no uncertain terms that the march from the ellipse was not permitted. It was not until after President Trump and his team became involved in the planning that the march from the ellipse to the Capitol came about in direct contravention of the original permit. This was not a coincidence. None of this was. Donald Trump, over many months, cultivated violence, praised it, and then when he saw the violence his supporters were capable of, he channeled it to his big, wild, historic event. He organized January 6th with the same people that had just organized a rally, resulting in substantial violence, and made absolutely sure this time these violent rally goers wouldn't just remain in place. He made sure that those violent people would literally march right here to our steps, from the ellipse to the Capitol, to stop the steal. His cavalry, this was deliberate. And because the President of the United States incited this, because he was orchestrating this, because he was inviting them, the insurgents were not shy about their planning. They believed they were following the orders of the commander in chief. They were, as the tweet we just saw, quite literally, his cavalry. So they posted exact blueprints of the attack openly, loudly, proudly. And they did this all over public forums. These were not just hidden posts and dark websites that Trump would not have seen, quite the opposite. We know that President Trump's team monitored these websites. We know this because his advisors confirm it. An ex-White House and campaign insider, as you'll read, who has known both Scavino and the president for years, said there was no way that Scavino and the Trump social media operation would not have been aware of the plan circulating online to storm the Capitol. Because, and I quote, the Trump operation closely monitored the web's darkest corners, ranging from mainstream sites such as Twitter, Facebook, and Reddit, to fringe message boards like 4chan and xchan, now called xcun, to the donald.win, an offshoot of a banned Reddit community dedicated to rabidly supporting all things Trump. They actively monitored the exact sites, like the Donald.win, on which these insurrectionists wrote their posts. And so what would Trump and his team have seen when they were monitoring these white sites? What would his supporters have said? They would have seen a clear roadmap of exactly what happened. This is an example of a post that was captured from one of the sites dedicated to Donald Trump that we just talked about shortly before the site was taken down. And the meme reads, quote, the capital is our goal. Everything else is a distraction. Every corrupt member of Congress locked in one room and surrounded by real Americans is an opportunity that will never present itself again. Let that sink in. Think about that. The exact thing that happened on January 6th, that was their goal. And they said it out loud on sites that the Trump administration was actively monitoring. 
a third party site captured a post on the Donald.win where one user posted, quote, this cannot simply be a protest. It has to be the establishment of the MAGA militia with the command offices set up with all further militia tactical missions spreading from there. Another user said in response, quote, we will have to achieve an actual tactical victory like storming and occupying the Capitol to have the intended effect. That's what they understood Donald Trump to want. There it is in black and white. And they explained why they felt justified in this. Another poster on the forum, the Donald.win wrote on January 4th, quote, if Congress illegally certifies Biden, Trump would have absolutely no choice but to demand us to storm Congress and kill slash beat them up. Donald Trump will have no choice. That was what he made them believe. To the point his supporters felt justified even in carrying weapons and storming our capital. This was in post after post. Here's another. When discussing how to carry guns into DC, one noted, quote, yes, it's illegal, but this is war. And we are clearly in a post-legal phase of our society. What? They treated it as a war, and they meant it. The morning of the attack, under the thread, today I told my kids goodbye, one poster wrote, Today I had the very difficult conversation with my children that daddy might not come home from DC. Within a matter of hours, that post amassed 4,000 likes. President Trump had truly made them believe that their election had been stolen and that it was their patriotic duty to fight to steal it back. Patriotic, a term he gave those who use violence for him, and they were willing to say goodbye to their children for this fight. And their supporters didn't just rely on entering the Capitol with guns haphazardly. They had maps of this building. They talked through which tunnels to use and how to get to the Senate chamber. Some posted specific floor plans, layouts of the Capitol, alongside hopes of overwhelming law enforcement to quote, find the tunnels, arrest the worst traitors. Posters also fixated on what they saw as their ability to easily overwhelm the Capitol Police as quote, there are only around 2,000 of them. And again, they urge quote, the Capitol is our goal. Everything else is a distraction. There were hundreds of these posts, hundreds monitored by the Trump administration. And these posts, they were chillingly accurate. Right down to communication devices. A new affidavit filed by the FBI described preparations by the right-wing group, the Proud Boys, to storm the Capitol, including using earpieces and walkie-talkies to direct movements throughout the building. This happened. That's the level of planning in advance that occurred. They had earpieces. On the slide, you'll see Proud Boy member Dominic Pizzola has an earpiece in his right ear, consistent with the affidavit. And in addition to these detailed posts, they made clear why they thought they should do this, why they thought they could do this. It wasn't just that they were doing it to following the president's orders. They thought he would help them. A third party site captured a post on the Donald.win again, the site monitored by Trump's team, and he wrote, wrote, quote, he meaning Donald Trump in this instance, can order the Nat Guard to stand down if needed. Unfortunately, he has no control over the Capitol Police, but there are only around 2,000 of them, and are, a lot are useless fat asses or girls. It's all right there. The overall goal, maps of the Capitol, the weapons, communication devices. They even said publicly, openly, 
proudly that President Trump will help them to commandeer the National Guard so all they have to do is overwhelm the 2,000 Capitol Police officers. This was reported in the NBC News and the Washington Post with headlines like, violent threats ripple through far-right internet forums ahead of protests. Pro-Trump forums erupt with violent threats ahead of Wednesday's rally against the 2020 election. Fox News also reported that the Proud Boys would come to the January 6th rally prepared for violent action, even quoting a Proud Boy member who said they would, quote, incognito and spread across downtown DC in smaller numbers. City officials seeing these same warnings also publicly warned about the violence and unlawful weapons at the event. DC Mayor Muriel Bowser cautioned residents of the District of Columbia to avoid the downtown area while the rally attendees were in town. Federal law enforcement warned of these threats also. On January 3rd, a Capitol Police intelligence report warned of a violent scenario in which Congress itself could be the target of the angry supporters of President Trump on January 6. According to that report obtained by the Washington Post, supporters of the current president see January 6, 2021 as the last opportunity to overturn the results of the presidential election. This sense of desperation and disappointment may lead to more incentive to become violent. Unlike previous post-election protests, the targets of the pro-Trump supporters are not necessarily the counter-protesters as they were previously, but rather Congress itself is the target for January 6. The day before the riot of storm, the Congress, an FBI office in Virginia also issued an explicit warning that extremists were preparing to travel to Washington to commit violence and, quote, war, according to internal reports. The FBI report cited to an online post where the user declared that Trump supporters should go to Washington and get violent. The supporter said, quote, stop calling this a march or a rally or a protest. Go there ready for war. We get our president or we die. These threat warnings were not just hypothetical. Actual arrests occurred in the days leading to the attack. On January 4th, two days before the rally, one extremely well-publicized arrest was of a Proud Boy leader who destroyed a church's Black Lives Matter banner a month earlier during the December 12th Second Million MAGA March. Report emphasized that when he was arrested, he was carrying high-capacity firearm magazines, which he claimed were meant to be supplied to another rally attendee for January 6th. By the night of January 6th attack, DC police had already made six arrests in connection with the planned protests on charges of carrying weapons, ammunition, assault, assaulting police. This is all in public view, all of it. The truth is usually seen and rarely heard. Truth is truth whether denied or not. And the truth is, President Trump had spent months calling his supporters to a march on a specific day, at a specific time, in specific places to stop the certification. And leading up to the event, there were hundreds, hundreds of posts online showing that his supporters took this as a call to arms to attack the Capitol. There were detailed posts of plans to attack online. Law enforcement warned that these posts were real threats and even made arrests days leading up to the attack. And yet, in the face of all this, these credible warnings of serious dangerous threats to our capital, when those thousands of people were standing in front of President Trump, ready to take orders and attack, this is what he said. We're going to the Capitol and we fight. We fight like hell. And if you don't fight like hell, 
You're not going to have a country anymore. And that's why this is different. And that's why he must be convicted and disqualified. Representative Dean will now return to the events of January 6th itself. She will demonstrate President Trump's repeated incitement of the crowd that morning as he directed them to the Capitol in his last ditch effort to retain his hold on power. For me and for many Americans, January 6th is forever etched in our memories. I went to work with a sense of excitement, the start of my second term in Congress, and the first time I would participate in the certification of a presidential election. And then we all know what happened. I know many of us have similar experiences from that day, but I'll briefly share mine. I stood with colleagues in the gallery above the House floor to observe the Arizona challenge. Moments later, police radios reported a breach of the Capitol grounds. Someone shouted up to us, duck, then lie down, then ready your gas masks. Shortly after, there was a terrifying banging on the chamber doors. I will never forget that sound, shouts and panicked calls to my husband and to my sons, instructions to flee, and then the constant whirring of the gas masks filtering the air. The chamber of the United States House of Representatives turned to chaos. For Donald Trump, it was a very different day. Earlier, I showed you Donald Trump's desperate attempts to maintain power, ignoring adverse court rulings, attacking elected officials, pressuring his Justice Department, even attacking his own vice president. You saw a man who refused to lose, who was desperate to retain power by any means necessary. You saw a man willing to attack anyone and everyone who got in his way. And you saw a man who thought he could play by different rules. He told his supporters, as my colleague Ms. Plaskett just showed you, exactly what he thought those different rules were. Combat, fight, violence. This was not just one speech. This was weeks and weeks of deliberate effort by Donald Trump to overturn the election results so that he didn't have to give up the presidency. The speech on January 6th builds on, refers to, and amplifies that same pattern, the pattern Trump had used and broadcasted for months. He refused to lose his attacks on others, and his different rules. The only thing different about his speech on January 6th from all these other times that we went through was that he was no longer telling his base just that they had to fight to stop the steal. He was finally telling them, now is the time to do it. Here's the place, and here's how. For weeks, he urged his supporters to show up at a specific time and place, and when they got there, he told them exactly what he wanted. Let's start with his desperation. You saw how much planning went into January the 6th, and when the day arrived, Donald Trump's desperation was in full force. Between the time he woke up on January the 5th and the start of the Save America uh, March that next day, he had tweeted 34 times. When Donald Trump wants to get his message across, he is not shy, as you all know. These tweets were relentless. And these tweets all centered on his singular focus, his drumbeat to motivate anger and incite his supporters, 
his big lie. The presidential election had been rigged, it had been stolen from him, and they had to fight to stop it. And the timing was no coincidence. He sent 34 tweets because this was his last chance to rile up his supporters before the big, historic, wild event he had planned. Now, I won't go through all of these tweets, but let me just highlight a few. At one in the morning, he tweeted, if Vice President Mike Pence comes through for us, we will win the presidency. Mike can send it back. This will look familiar to you because Mr. Liu just showed you how Trump had privately, he was pressuring and publicly attacking his vice president to stop the certification. And when Vice President Pence refused, when he explained that the Constitution simply does not allow him to stop certification, Donald Trump provoked his base to attack him. The late in the evening tweet was no different. It just got more forceful. Let's be clear, what Donald Trump was saying, that Vice President Pence could send back the certification, was not true. For one thing, all 50 states had ratified this election. And for another, Vice President Pence explained to him that he does not have the power to unilaterally overturn states' votes and just send the certification back. And Donald Trump knew this, but this was his last chance to get his vice president to stop the certification. And so he was willing to say or do just about anything. These tweets attacking the election as fraudulent, attacking his vice president, and urging his supporters to fight continued throughout the morning. Here's another example. At 8.17 a.m., he tweeted, all Mike, ha Mike Pence has to do is send it back to them and back to the states, and we win. And we win. That's what he said, even though by then he had clearly lost. As Trump continued tweeting, the Save America march at the White House was now in full swing. The speakers who warmed up the crowd for Trump were members of his inner circle, family members, his personal attorney, people President Trump had deputized to speak on his behalf. Some of the speakers also spoke at the second million MAGA march, which resulted in serious violence. The warm-up acts on January 6th focused on promoting Donald Trump's big lie. They stoked the same fears, a stolen election, of fraud, of ripping victory away from them. And the speakers told them what to do about it. As the crowd erupted in fight for Trump, chants throughout that morning, Donald Trump Jr. urged, that's the message, these guys better fight for Trump. The speakers lasted three hours repeating President Trump's message and finally at about noon, Donald Trump took the stage with the seal of the presidency at, on his podium and the White House as his backdrop. President Trump spoke for more than 70 minutes. His narrative was familiar. It was the same message we, he had spent months spreading to his supporters. The big lie, the election was stolen, that they should never concede, and that his supporters should be patriots and fight much harder to stop the steal to take back our country. The same phrases he'd spread for weeks, but now the message was immediate. Now it was just no longer just fight, it was fight right now. All of us here today do not want to see our election victory stolen by emboldened radical left Democrats, which is what they're doing, and stolen by the fake news media. That's what they've done and what they're doing. We will never give up. We will never concede. It doesn't happen. You don't concede when there's theft involved. Our country has had enough. We will not take it anymore. And that's what this is all about. And to use a favorite term that all of you people really came up with, we will stop the steal. That set the tone. Our country has had enough and we will not take it anymore. He told them and us right at the beginning that the only way to take back the country was to fight. 
Let's look at what he said next. And Rudy, you did a great job. He's got guts. You know what? He's got guts, unlike a lot of people in the Republican Party. He's got guts. He fights. Ms. Plaskett showed you example after example of Donald Trump when confronted with violence, praising it. We saw him instruct the Proud Boys, a violent extremist group, to stand back and stand by. That group was there on January the 6th. We saw him praise a caravan of his supporters after they tried to drive a bus belonging to the Biden campaign off the road. The organizer of that attack was there on January the 6th. And we saw him team up with the organizers of the violent second MAGA Million March to plan his rally on January the 6th. And what does he do at that rally? He tells Giuliani he's doing a great job addressing the crowd, saying he has guts to call for fighting. And to be clear, this is what he was praising. So, let's have trial by combat. <laughs> trial by combat. Donald Trump praised Rudy, said he did a good job, had guts for telling the crowd that we need trial by combat. Next, more attacks. All Vice President Pence has to do is send it back to the states to recertify, and we become president, and you are the happiest people. This attack, like the tweets he sent that morning, had a purpose, convincing his supporters that the future of our country, of our democracy, hinged on whether Vice President Pence would overturn the election, something he knew Pence could not and would not do. He called out Vice President Pence nine times that day. And each time, he got more forceful. Here's what he said at 12.15. And we're going to have to fight much harder. And Mike Pence is going to have to come through for us. And if he doesn't, that will be a, a sad day for our country. Because you're sworn to uphold our Constitution. Now it is up to Congress to confront this egregious assault on our democracy. And after this, we're going to walk down, and I'll be there with you. We're going to walk down. We're going to walk down. Anyone you want, but I think right here, we're going to walk down to the Capitol. And we're going to cheer on our brave senators and congressmen and women. And we're probably not going to be cheering so much for some of them, because you'll never take back our country with weakness. You have to show strength, and you have to be strong. We're going to have to fight much harder, and Mike Pence will have to come through for us. That's what he said. And he told the crowd what he meant and exactly what to do, literally commanding them to confront us at the Capitol. He even told them he'd walk there with them which of course was not true. And then he told them exactly what to do when they got to the Capitol. You'll never take your country back with weakness. You have to show strength. And don't forget who is standing there, the same people Ms. Plaskett described to you. Many people violent, violent people law enforcement had warned would be armed and would be targeting us. One of President Trump's key defenses focus on what he said for a few seconds, 15 minutes into the speech. I know that everyone here will soon be marching over to the Capitol building to peacefully and patriotically make your voices heard. In a speech spanning almost 11,000 words, yes, we did check, that was the one time, the only time President Trump used the word peaceful or any suggestion of nonviolence. The implication of the president's tweets, the rally, and the speeches were clear. President Trump used the word fight or fighting 20 times, including telling the crowd they needed to fight like hell to save our democracy. 
We know how the crowd responded to Donald Trump's words, and he knew how they responded to his speech. Here is the evidence of how the crowd reacted. Yes. Storm the Capitol, invade the Capitol, fight, 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 fight. Take the Capitol right now. These were the words of the crowd. Trump was telling them to fight, and he would keep telling them to fight throughout the rest of his speech. These are not only words of aggression, they are words of insurrection. And if you have any doubt, listen to what he says next. Today we see a very important event, though, because right over there, right there, we see the event going to take place, and I'm going to be watching because history is going to be made. We're going to see whether or not we have great and courageous leaders or whether or not we have leaders that should be ashamed of themselves throughout history, throughout eternity. They'll be ashamed. And you know what? If they do the wrong thing, we should never, ever forget that they did. Never forget. We should never, ever forget. The Commander-in-Chief points to Congress and tells those assembled, I'm going to be watching. History is going to be made. This was clearly not just some rally or march or protest. This was about Donald Trump trying to steal the election for himself claiming that the election was fraudulent, illegitimate, so that his supporters would fight to take it back. In fact, after stoking the crowd's anger for nearly 40 minutes, after repeating false election conspiracy, after false election conspiracy, he said this in no uncertain terms. You will have an illegitimate president. That's what you'll have. Any outcome besides him keeping the presidency would be illegitimate. This was building on the big lie of a rigged and stolen election. And here's what he said a little later in the speech. When you catch somebody in a fraud, you're allowed to go by very different rules. So I hope Mike has the courage to do what he has to do. When you catch somebody in a fraud, you're allowed to go by very different rules. We told you that context matters. Here's the context. This was not just one reference or a message to supporters by a politician to fight for a cause. He'd assembled thousands of violent people, people he knew were capable of violence, people he had seen be violent. They were standing now in front of him. And then he pointed to us, lit the fuse, and sent an angry mob to, to fight the perceived enemy, his own vice president and the members of Congress, as we certified an election. But I said, something's wrong here. Something's really wrong. Can't have happened. And we fight. We fight like hell. And if you don't fight like hell, you're not going to have a country anymore. Our exciting adventures and boldest endeavors have not yet begun. My fellow Americans, for our movement, for our children, and for our beloved country, and I say this, despite all that's happened, the best is yet to come. So we're going to, we're going to Walk down Pennsylvania Avenue. I love Pennsylvania Avenue. And we're going to the Capitol. 
And we're going to try and give you know, the Democrats are hopeless. They're never voting for anything. Not even one vote. But we're going to try and give our Republicans the weak ones, because the strong ones don't need any of our help. We're tr going to try and give them the kind of pride and boldness that they need to take back our country. So let's walk down Pennsylvania Avenue. I want to thank you all. God bless you, and God bless America. Thank you all for being here. This is incredible. Thank you very much. If you don't fight like hell, you're not going to have a country anymore. And there was only one fight left, and it was a mile up the road. Donald Trump, the President of the United States, ordered the crowd to march on Congress, and so the crowd marched. This is incredible, you heard him say. That's how President Trump ended his speech. I'd like to close with a very brief timeline of what was happening in parallel alongside the President as he spoke on the 6th of January. A little after noon, President Trump began his speech with a fiery refusal to concede. He commanded the crowd to fight and march down Pennsylvania Avenue. And around 1220, some rally goers, some attendees, began marching. By 1230, as President Trump continued to incite his supporters, large segments of the rally crowd had amassed at the Capitol. At 1253, as the President's speech was playing on cell phone broadcasts, the outermost barricade of the northwest side of the Capitol was breached. And Capitol Police were forced back to the steps of the Capitol. At 110, the President ended his speech with a final call to fight and a final order to march to the Capitol. At 145, the President's followers surged past Capitol Police shouting, this is a revolution. Just after 210, an hour after President Trump ended his speech, the insurrectionist mob overwhelmed Capitol security and made it inside the halls of Congress. Because the truth is, this attack never would have happened but for Donald Trump. And so they came, draped in Trump's flag, and used our flag, the American flag, to batter and to bludgeon. And at 2.30, I heard that terrifying banging on house chamber doors. For the first time in more than 200 years, the seat of our government was ransacked on our watch. Mr. President, um, I think this would be a good time for a break, if that's okay. Uh, I have unanimous consent. We recess till 4 p.m. Is there objection? Is hearing none? We're recessed. 4 p.m. 4 o'clock. 4 o'clock. to press their case. They have 16 hours to do so in the impeachment trial of former President Donald Trump's. Eight hours today. They'll have eight more hours tomorrow and the president's attorneys, uh, the former president's attorneys get their turn beginning on Friday. So then a break here up till uh, four o'clock Eastern or so. Here's what the, the schedule looks like for the rest of the week. As we mentioned, House managers today and tomorrow the president's defense team Friday and Saturday, a total of 16 hours for both sides. On Sunday at 2 p.m., the Senate will return. They will take up um, uh, questions to the 
uh, lawyers on both sides, the House managers and the lawyers, and they may on early next week uh, consider whether to allow uh, witnesses, subpoena additional uh, documents, the closing arguments, and a vote on impeachment set to happen early next week. We don't have a specific day quite yet. Keep in mind as they are in a break now, if you've missed any of the earlier activities, the uh, presentation by House managers, you can find that on our website at cspan.org slash impeachment. We are streaming this live, obviously, live here on C-SPAN 2. And as you go out and on your way, you can also bring it along on the C-SPAN radio app. Keeping an eye on things on uh, Capitol Hill, a tweet here from Daniel Flatley, who writes for business and what senators are doing as the uh, trial is underway. He tweets this, senators were still attentive to the trial manager's presentation in the mid-afternoon, many of them taking notes and listening intently, especially when videos were played and tweets were displayed. Daniel Flatley says Senator Mike Lee had some books stacked on his desk, including the federal impeachment process and the contested removal power, 1789 to 2010. Our own Craig Kaplan is keeping an eye on things on Capitol Hill. Tweets out this map, and it's about Senator Hawley, who's been reported to be watching, actually, from the, the visitor's gallery, saying this. Uh, Senator Hawley said this to to um, NBC, the gallery is, I feel, I had a little better kind of view, kind of where I sit over the Senate chamber is in the corner. So here you can sit head on. I can also space out a little bit more and it's not quite as crowded. You can see on that map uh, where he is seated in the chamber itself. So he's gone up to the gallery to keep an eye on the proceedings. One Senator we heard from earlier during the first break is Senator Richard Blumenthal, Democrat from Connecticut, on how he felt the House managers we're handling the case so far. Thank you guys, appreciate it. Um, this evidence is so powerful, brick by brick. They're showing how Donald Trump built that mob in a very premeditated and deliberate way, not only to stop the count and stop the steal, but to come to Washington and do it violently. The result of Donald Trump deliberately building them up and then fueling their anger and rage, inviting them to come to Washington and then to storm the Capitol was in fact this violent injury and death that resulted on January 6th. It was planned over days, weeks, before the election, wanting the only way they would lose is if it were rigged, and then afterwards. What should come across the American people is that January 6th was no accident, no isolated act, no aberration. It was deliberately planned, the result of premeditated, inflaming the rage and fury of his followers who believed to be blind. Where do you think Trump is going? That's what I. The hardest thing that he knew he had lost the election. He was aware of that. He knew, he knew the, the Congress was going to certify Biden's electoral college victory. What did you think he was, like his motive, if you're a former AG, what was his motive? He knew he had lost, and the only way he could retain power was by physically stopping the count. In fact, apparently by killing some of the people involved. Michael Pence. Overthrowing the government. It was a coup attempt, an effort to overthrow the government and stop democracy from working. The founders' worst nightmare. And that's why this high crime was among the most heinous that any public official could commit. What we will see is that Donald Trump not only incited this riot and insurrection, but also then his commander in chief did nothing to save our democracy. In fact, he continued to enslave them. He called them special people. And the long run lesson here is not only about January 6th or about Donald Trump, it is about domestic violence. The danger of domestic violence in this country is persistent and lethal as the Domestic terrorism bulletin has said it is a real threat to our government. Thank you so much.
a little over three hours into the arguments by House managers in the impeachment trial of former President Donald Trump. We heard from his attorneys yesterday in the, in the argument over constitutionality. And CNN tweets this about the president, the former president's reaction. A Trump aide says the former president thinks his lawyers need to, quote, tighten up their arguments. Jason Donner from Fox tweets this. Senator Graham on speaking with Trump, quote, I reinforced to the president the case is over. It's just a matter of getting the final verdict now. Asked if he sensed frustration from Trump about his attorney's performance, quote, quote no, not particularly. We mostly talked about the vote. Uh, Rand Paul, Senator Paul, tweeting this afternoon about one of the managers who spoke. This afternoon, we've been lectured by Eric Swalwell, a guy accused of consorting with a Chinese spy. How appropriate. Frank Bowman's an attorney, um, an author, I should say, who's written a new book on impeachment, uh, observing this, saying, uh, first really new fact I've he heard, Delegate Plaskett said original permit for the protest was January 22 or 23, but that changed to January 6th. The date of certification was made by or behest of Trump would like more details, true, but if true, a key point. Delegate Plaskett, as was pointed out by um, Jamie Raskin, the first ele ever delegate to present a impeachment case, she among the four um, managers who spoke at that last session, we heard twice from Madeline Dean, we also heard from uh, Ted Lieu, and um, we expect to hear from uh, Diana Daggett, she's the only one so far who has not spoken in the in the Senate here on C-SPAN 2 waiting for the Senate to return to resume the court of impeachment against former President Donald Trump set to be back in the next 10 minutes or so at four o'clock Eastern. We'll show you some of the arguments made in this last session by House managers. Donald Trump told his supporters they are stealing the election. They took away your vote. It's rigged. That was not true. According to judge after judge, the truth was exactly the opposite. Trump was not suing to ensure election integrity. He was pursuing lawsuits that would, in effect, strip away American votes so that he could win. In other words, Donald Trump was asking the judiciary to take away votes from Americans so that he could steal the election for himself. Then, after losing in all the courts, Trump turned to another tactic, pressuring and threatening election officials. You saw what happened in Michigan after Trump attacked the state and its election officials. His supporters surrounded the Secretary of State's home, as you saw in the earlier slide, chanting, calling her a felon. On November 17th, the Board of Canvassers for Wayne County, Michigan, home to Detroit, unanimously certified the election results for Biden. That same night, after their vote to certify the results, Trump called the two Rep Republican members of that board, pressuring them to change their minds. The call worked. The next day, both Monica Palmer and William Hartman, the Republican board members, attempted to rescind their vote to certify Michigan's election results, but they simply couldn't. President Trump's actions time and time again made clear that he would do anything and pressure anyone if it meant overturning the election results. We watched President Trump use any means necessary to pursue this aim, feverishly grasping for straws at retaining his hold on the presidency. But all his efforts prior to January 6 kept failing. And finally, in his desperation, he turned on his own vice president. He pressured Mike Pence to violate his constitutional oath and to refuse to certify the oath. President Trump had decided that Vice President Pence, who presided over the certification, could somehow stop it. As Pence would later confirm, the vice president does not have that power in the Constitution. And President Trump never tried to explain why he thought the vice president could block the certification of election results. He just began relentlessly attacking the vice president. Publicly, President Trump attacked Pence on social media and at rallies, getting his supporters to believe that Mike Pence could stop this certification on January 6. Here's what President Trump said in Georgia on January 4th. And I hope Mike Pence comes through for us, I have to tell you. I hope that our great vice president, 
our great vice president comes through for us. He's a great guy. Of course, if he doesn't come through, I won't like him quite as much. Behind closed doors, President Trump applied significant pressure to his second-in-command. Multiple reports confirmed that President Trump used his personal attorneys and other officials to pressure the vice president. Trump reportedly told almost anyone who called him to also call the vice president. According to reports, when Mike Pence was in the Oval Office, President Trump would call people to try to get them to convince the vice president to help him. And President Trump kept repeating the myth that Pence could stop the certification to his base to anger them, hoping to intimidate Mike Pence. On the morning of the rally on January 6, President Trump tweeted, all Mike Pence has to do is send them back to the states, and in all caps he wrote, and we win. Do it, Mike. This is a time for extreme courage. President Trump later went on to attack Pence nearly a dozen times in his speech at the Save America March. Privately, in person, before Pence headed to oversee the joint session on January 6, President Trump again threatened Pence. You can either go down in history as a patriot, Mr. Trump told him, according to two people briefed on the conversation, or you can go down in history as a pussy. As a veteran, I find it deeply dishonorable that our former president and commander-in-chief equated patriotism with violating the Constitution and overturning the election. You will see and hear the consequences of President Trump's repeated attacks on the vice president, the chance of traitor, and the chance of hang Mike Pence. Thankfully, Vice President Pence stood his ground like our other brave officials stood their ground. He refused the president and fulfilled his duty on January 6, even after the Capitol was attacked, even after he was personally targeted, even after his family was targeted, Vice President Pence stood strong and certified the election. Vice President Pence showed us what it means to be an American, what it means to show courage. He put his country, his oath, his values, and his morals above the will of one man. The president had tried everything in his power to seize the, um, everything in his attempt to seize power from the rightful victor of the election. President Trump's extraordinary actions grew increasingly more desperate. You saw him go from pursuing claims in the courts to threatening state and local election officials to then attacking members of Congress and the Senate to compromising our Justice Department and then to attacking the Republican vice president. These brave public servants were being pressured by our Commander-in-Chief to overturn the results. Some of them and their families got death threats. Thankfully, at every turn, our democratic processes prevailed and the rule of law prevailed. And the impeachment trial of former President Donald Trump set to resume shortly here. They're on a bit of a break, but here at about 4 o'clock Eastern, they should get back underway and continue into the early evening. At least we do expect a dinner break at some point. Again, the House managers get 16 hours spread over two days. Same with President Trump's attorneys. Uh, 16 hours spread over two days. That will carry the legal arguments on both sides into, um, into Saturday as well. Dele Delegate Stacey Plaskett focused on the, the, the Proud Boys, and I want to show an article from Politico about that. This is, this is published today. The headline in Politico says, Proud Boy charged in insurrection blasts Trump's deception in the new court filing. They say the defendant's criticism of Trump dovetails with the House impeachment manager's case. And again, her focus in her presentation was on how the violence built up. We'll show you as much as what she has to say as we can until the Senate gavels back in here momentarily. My fellow managers have shown and will continue to show clear evidence that President Trump incited a violent mob to storm our Capitol when he ran out of nonviolent means to stop the election. Once assembled, that mob at the president's direction erupted into the bloodiest attack on this Capitol since 1814. Some of you have said there's no way the president could have known how violent the mob would be. 
that is false. Because the violence, it was foreseeable. I want to show you why this violence was foreseeable and why Donald Trump was different than any other politician just telling their fighters, their supporters, to fight for something. The violence that occurred on January 6, like the attack itself, did not just appear. You'll see that Donald Trump knew the people he was inciting, he saw the violence that they were capable of, and he had a pattern and practice of praising and encouraging that violence never, ever condemning it. And you'll see that this violent attack was not planned in secret. The insurgents believed that they were doing the duty of their president. They were following his orders. And so they publicized it openly, loudly, proudly, exact blueprints of how the attack would be made. Law enforcement saw these postings and reported that these insurgents would violently attack the Capitol itself. This was not just a, com a comment by an official to fight for a cause. This was months of cultivating a base of people who were violent, praising that violence, and then leading that violence, that rage, straight at our door. The point is this. By the time he called the cavalry of his thousands of supporters on January 6th, and an event he had invited them to, he had every reason to know that they were armed, that they were violent, and that they would actually fight. He knew who he was calling and the violence they were capable of. And he still gave that marching orders to go to the Capitol and quote, fight like hell and stop the steal. Make no mistake, the violence was not just foreseeable to President Trump, the violence was what he deliberately encouraged. As early as September, Trump set the precedent that when asked to denounce violence, he would do the opposite and encourage it. Now, if the president had only said something once about fighting to stop the steal and violence erupted, there would be no way to know he intended to incite it or saw it coming. But just as the president spent months spreading his big lie of the election, he also spent months cultivating groups of people who, following his command, repeatedly engaged in real, dangerous violence. And when they did, when the violence erupted as a response to his calls to fight against the Solon election, he did not walk it back. He did not tell them no. He did the opposite, the opposite. He praised and encouraged the violence so that it would continue. He fanned the flame of violence and it worked. You'll see this over time. These very groups and individuals whose violence the president praised helped lead the attack on January 6th. And that's how we know clearly that President Trump deliberately incited this and how we know he saw it coming. There are many examples where the president engaged in this pattern and I'm just gonna walk you through a few of them. Let's start with the President Trump's incitement of the Proud Boys. Many of you have heard of this group, which since 2018 has been classified by the FBI as an extremist organization. Since that classification, the group has repeatedly engaged in serious acts of violence, including at pro-Trump rallies. In one such act, on September 7th, the Proud Boys attacked a man with a baseball bat and then punched him while he was down on the ground. On September 29th, during a presidential debate, President Trump was asked specifically if he was willing to condemn white supremacy 
and militia groups if he was willing to tell them to stand down and stop the violence. Let's watch. But are you willing tonight to condemn white supremacists and militia groups sure. and to say that they need to stand down and not add to the violence in a number of these cities as we saw in Kenosha and as we've seen in Portland? Sure, are you I'm prepared to, to do specifically that, but do it? Well, I go would ahead, say sir. Let's hear now the president's response. Do it, sir. Say it. Do it. Say it. Do you want to call them? What do you want to call them? Give me a name. Give me a white name. White supremacists and white like me to condemn? White proud supremacists boys. and white proud, proud boys. boys. Stand back and stand by. When asked to condemn the Proud Boys and white supremacists, what did our president say? He said, stand back and stand by. His message was heard loud and clear. The group adopted that phrase, stand back and stand by, as their official slogan. They created merchandise with their new slogan, which they wore proudly across their backs at Trump's rallies, and they followed the president's orders. You'll see more about this later in the trial, but you'll see in these photos, to the left, Dominic Pizzola, and to the right, William Pepe, two of the leaders of the group, heading to the Capitol on January 6th. They were later charged with working together to obstruct law enforcement. As we go through this evidence, I want you to keep in mind these words by President Trump when asked to condemn violence. Stand back and stand by. And see example after example of the kinds of people like the Proud Boys who he had standing by on January 6th. By October, as my colleagues Mr. Castro and Mr. Swalwell showed you, Donald Trump was escalating his big lie that the only way he could lose the election was if it was rigged. So as election day neared, his supporters were frustrated and they were angry. They were prepared to ensure his victory by any means necessary. One of these violent acts was on October 30th, sometime after 12.30 p.m. A caravan of more than 50 trucks covered in pro-Trump campaign gear confronted and surrounded cars carrying Biden-Harris campaign workers and a Biden-Harris campaign bus as they were traveling down Interstate 35 from San Antonio to Austin. According to witnesses, this caravan repeatedly tried to force the bus you saw and you see in that video to slow down in the middle of the highway and then to run it off the road. What that video you just saw does not show is that the bus that they tried to run off the road was filled with young campaign staff, volunteers, supporters, surrogates, people. As the Trump supporters closed in on the bus, a large back black pickup truck adorned with Trump flags suddenly and intentionally swerved and crashed into a car driven by a Biden-Harris volunteer. News. The uh, Senate will come to order. I turn this off.
We have order in the uh, Senate, please. Thank you, Mr. Raskin. Thank you, Mr. President, members of the Senate. Um, at this point, uh, Representatives Plaskett and Swalwell uh, will take you through the actual day of the attack. Uh, they will recreate the attack as it unfolded, focusing on the threats to Vice President Pelosi, uh, Vice President Pence, Speaker Pelosi, um, the joint session, and uh, law enforcement. Um, I, I do want to uh, alert everyone that there is uh, some very graphic uh, violent footage uh, coming, just so people are aware. And I'm going to call again on um, Ms. Plaskett, who I should also tell you uh, went to work at the Department of Justice and was the senior counsel for Deputy Attorney General Larry Thompson under Attorney General Ashcroft. So she's a very well-trained and experienced prosecutor, as you can tell. Mr. President, Senators, <clears throat> almost all of us were here on January 6, and we all have our individual experiences, what we felt, what we saw, what we heard. We've seen clips and reports in the media, but I have to tell you, it was not until preparing for this trial that I understood the full scope and learn the information that you're going to see, that I understood the effort to attack our seat of government in order to carry out President Trump's mission to prevent the certification of a presidential election. It was an attack to our republic to our democratic process. My colleagues, Manager Swalwell and I, are going to walk you through the attack onto the on the Capitol that day and the danger that it posed to the Vice President, to the Speaker of the House, to you all as Senators, my colleagues in the House, Capitol Police, and everyone who works in and around this Capitol. As you have heard, President Trump had been telling his supporters and his millions of Twitter followers that Pence had the ability to secure the presidency for Trump, that Mike Pence alone had the power to overturn the election results if he would just do it. But at 12.55 p.m., on January 6, Vice President Pence formally refused the President's demand. He wrote, and I quote, it is my considered judgment that my oath to support and defend the Constitution constrains me from claiming unilateral authority to determine which electoral votes should be counted and which should not. Pence ended his letter with a passage including the words, I will do my duty. Even though the count resulted in the defeat of his party and his own candidacy, Vice President Pence had the courage to stand against the president, tell the American public the truth, and uphold our Constitution. That is patriotism. That patriotism is also what put Vice President in so much danger on January 6 by the mob sent by our president. To the president and the mob he incited, that duty to our Constitution was an all-out betrayal. And the vice president was the direct target of that rage. At 12.53 p.m., senators, members of Congress, Vice President Pence were in their respective chambers. Outside, rioters, including some linked to the Proud Boys, broke through the outer barricade surrounding the lawn of the Capitol.
12 minutes later, Vice President Pence began presiding over the joint session of Congress to certify the results of the presidential election. You can see Vice President Pence gaveling in the joint session here. Madam Speaker, members of Congress, pursuant to the Constitution and the laws of the United States, the Senate and House of Representatives are meeting in joint session to verify the certificates and count the votes of the electors of the several states for President and Vice President of the United States. While Vice President Pence presided over the joint session, Trump supporters began their assault on our Capitol. Radio communications from the Metropolitan Police Department highlight how during and following President Trump's speech, Trump supporters descended on the Capitol and became increasingly violent. What you are about to hear has not been made public before. Multiple Capitol entries! Multiple Capitol entries! 1318. And 12 to 5th, and we're coming around uh, from the south side. Be advised the speech ended. Intel, be advised you got a group of about 50 uh, charging up the hill on the west front, uh, just north of the, of the stairs. Uh, they're approaching the wall now. Uh, they're starting to dismantle the reviewing stands and throwing metal poles at us. Cruiser 50, give me DSO up here now! DSO! Multiple law enforcement entries! DSO, get up there! Alright, we're 30 seconds out. We need some reinforcements up here now. They're starting to pull the gates down. They're throwing metal poles at us. Cruiser 50, DSO, get up here! Okay, we're here. 12 to 50, we're here. Oh, you did that explosion go on up here. I don't know if it's fireworks or what, but they're starting to explode explosives. Fireworks material. After attempting to dismantle the outermost perimeter, the rioters did everything in their power to storm past the police and into the Capitol. They coordinated moving metal barricades the police were using to maintain distance. Listen to the yelling, pull them this way, as they grabbed the barriers and attacked officers trying to hold the line. At about 1.10 and 1.23 p.m. respectively, Capitol Police sent out the first evacuation alerts of the day, telling people to evacuate the Madison Building and the Cannon Building respectively. Shortly after, at 1.45 p.m., Trump supporters surged past Capitol Police, protecting the Capitol's west steps, the side that is facing the White House. In another radio communication between Metropolitan Police officers, you can hear an officer declare that there is a riot at the Capitol at 1.49 p.m. We're going to give riot warnings. This is the outrage here. We're going to give riot warnings. We're going to try to get compliance, but this is now effectively a riot. 1349 hours declaring it a riot. The next video, as well as several videos that follow, have a model of the Capitol complex. The video is from the west front of the Capitol on the Senate side, the side facing the White House. Watch the red dot, which moves up the lower steps of the Capitol, indicating the approximate location of the rioters as they surge past the police.
while the mob that Donald Trump sent to stop the certification came closer and closer to breaching the Capitol just one floor below where we are now, Vice President Pence continued to preside over the session in the Senate chamber above. At about 2.12 p.m., Secret Service quickly and suddenly evacuated Vice President Pence from the Senate floor. Here's the immediate reaction to that evacuation. No audio. They, the they Senate, just cut out. It looks like they, they and sometimes the Senate like they just ushered Mike it. Pence out really quickly. Yes, they did. That's exactly what just happened there. And they ushered Mike Pence out. They moved him fast. There was, yeah, I saw the motions too. While the Vice President Pence was being evacuated from the Senate chamber, rioters were at that time breaking into the Capitol. This next video shows their approach and the initial breach of the Capitol complex. Remember to watch the red dot, which broke is being tracking throughout this incident. Now we're going to show you, through security footage that has not been made public before, what that same breach looked like from the inside. Now, because this is security footage, there's no sound. Note, as the video begins, we are seeing the inside view as the mob approaches from outside and beats the windows and doors. You can see that the rioter first break the window with the wooden beam that you saw previously, and a lone police officer inside responds and begins to spray the first man who enters, but is quickly overwhelmed. I want you to pay attention to the first group of assailants as they break into the building. The second man through the window is wearing full tactical body armor and is carrying a baseball bat. Others are carrying riot shields. Among this group are members of the Proud Boys, some of whom, like Dominic Pizzola, who was recently indicted on federal conspiracy charges, we will discuss later. can watch where they're coming on our model as well. When I first saw this model that was created for this, I thought back to September 11th. I know a lot of you senators were here some of you might have been members on the House side. I was also here on September 11th. 
I was a staffer at that time. My office was on the west front of the Capitol. I worked in the Capitol, and I was on the House side. This year is 20 years since the attacks of September 11th. And almost every day, I remember that 44 Americans gave their lives to stop the plane that was headed to this Capitol building. I thank them every day for saving my life and the life of so many others. Those Americans sacrificed their lives for love of country, honor, duty, all the things that America means. The Capitol stands because of people like that. This Capitol that was conceived by our founding fathers, that was built by slaves, that remains through the sacrifice of service, men and women around the world. And when I think of that, and I think of these insurgents, these images incited by our own president of the United States, attacking this Capitol to stop the certification of a presidential election, our democracy, our republic, at the same time that that breach on this Capitol building occurred at approximately 2.13 p.m., just one floor up, while Senator Lankford was speaking on the Senate floor, Senator Grassley, who had taken over for Vice President Pence, called an unscheduled immediate recess of the Senate. A Senate aide approached Senator Lankford and informed him that the Capitol had been breached. Senator Grassley is immediately escorted out of the Senate chamber. We'll pause. Protesters are in the building. Thank you. <laughs> now, while this was going on, Officer Eugene Goodman responded to the initial breach. You all may have seen footage of Officer Goodman previously but there's more to his heroic story. In this security footage, you can see Officer Goodman running to respond to the initial breach. Officer Goodman passes Senator Mitt Romney and directs him to turn around in order to get to safety. On the first floor, just beneath them, the mob had already started to search for the Senate chamber. Officer Goodman made his way down to the first floor where he encountered the same insurrectionists we just saw watch breach the Capitol. In this video, we can see the rioters surge toward Officer Goodman. Recall that the rioters are in red and Officer Goodman in this model is in blue. Watch Officer Goodman, who backs up the stairs.
Although they were shouting that they did not have any weapons, we know from the earlier video that that's not true. The second assailant through that breach was the one carrying a metal baseball bat. We know there were other weapons there that day. Did you hear the other shouts? We're here for you. He's one person, we're thousands. And where do they count the votes? They were coming at the urging of Donald Trump to keep Congress, a separate branch of government, from certifying the results of a presidential election. As the rioters reached the top of the stairs, they were within 100 feet of where the vice president was sheltering with his family. And they were just a feet away from one of the doors to this chamber, where many of you remained at that time. I also want to show you a different angle from the security footage of Officer Goodman's acts. This video is on the second floor of the Senate wing of the Capitol. The red dot, as you recall, represents the insurrectionists. The blue dot is Officer Goodman, who led the mob away from the chamber just minutes earlier. On the left-hand side of the video, just inside the hallway, is the door to the Senate chamber. And watch how Officer Goodman provokes the rioters and purposefully draws them away from the door to the Senate chamber and towards the other officers waiting down the hall. The rioter seen carrying a baseball bat in this video is the same one we saw moments ago breaching the window on the first floor. While all of this was going on, Vice President Pence was still in the room near the Senate chamber. It was not until 2.26 that he was evacuated to a secure location. This next security video shows that evacuation. His movements are depicted by the orange dot in our model. The red and blue dots represents the location where the mob and Officer Goodman were, and where Officer Goodman led the mob away from the chamber just moments ago. You can see Vice President Pence and his family quickly move down the stairs. The Vice President turns around briefly as he's headed down. As Pence was being evacuated, rioters started to spread throughout the Capitol. Those inside helped other rioters break in through doors in several locations around this entire building. And the mob was looking for Vice President Pence because of his patriotism, because the Vice President had refused to do what the President demand and overturn the election results. During the assault on the Capitol, Extremists reportedly coordinated online and discussed how they could hunt down the vice president. Journalists in the Capitol reported they heard rioters say they were looking for Pence in order to execute him. Trump's supporters had erected a gallows on the lawn in front of the Capitol building. Another group of rioters chanted, hang Mike Pence, as they stood in the open door of the Capitol building. You can hear the security alarm from the door in the background. And you can hear the mob calling for the death of the Vice President of the United States. This wasn't an isolated area or incident where that was being told, where that was being said. It was going on everywhere. Here's another example of the crowd outside yelling, bring out Pence, bring him out. Bring him out. 
after President Trump had primed his followers for months and inflamed the rally goers that morning, it is no wonder that the Vice President of the United States was the target of their wrath after Pence refused to overturn the election results. Listen to this man explain. Well, Congress, the uh, cowards uh, hid in their uh, inside and were emergency uh, escorted away because of fear of the people. Of course, they're cowards, can't face the people, can't do the right thing. Pence lied to us. He's a total treasonous pig, and his name will be mud forever. Now the real battle begins, and it looks like uh, the American people are very pissed. So good luck with that. Peace out. Peace out. Several insurrectionists described what they had planned to do if they encountered the vice president or other lawmakers. One of them, Dominic Pizzola, also known as Spaz, is a member of the Proud Boys, as we discuss. Pizzola came to the Capitol on January 6 with deadly intentions. He commandeered a Capitol police shield, used it to smash a glass window, entered the Capitol, and paved the way for dozens of insurrectionists. As you recall from an earlier video, Pizzola was one of the first wave of rioters to breach the building. On the left, you can see a screenshot from the video of the break-in we showed earlier. And on the right, you can see Pizzola in the mob chase Capitol Police officer Eugene Goodman through the building. Pizzola is the man in the center of the photo with the gray beard. Pizzola has since been charged with eight federal crimes for his conduct related to January 6. According to an FBI agent's affidavit submitted to the court, the group that was with him during the sack of the Capitol confirmed that they were out to murder, quote, anyone they got their hands on. Here's what the FBI said, and I quote, other members of the group talked about things they had done that day, and they said that anyone they got their hands on, they would have killed, including Nancy Pelosi, and that, quote, they would have killed Vice President Mike Pence if given the chance. They were talking about assassinating the Vice President of the United States. During the course of the attack, the Vice President never left the Capitol, remained locked down with his family, with his family inside the building. Remember that as you think about these images and the sounds of the attack. The vice president, our second in command, was always at the center of it. Vice President Pence was threatened with death by the president's supporters because he rejected President Trump's demand that he overturn the election. The mob also went after Speaker of the House, who alongside the vice president was presiding over the joint session of the certification in the House chamber. The chilling evidence shows that on January 6, armed and organized insurrectionists trained their sights on Speaker Pelosi. They sought out the Speaker on the floor and in her office, publicly declared their intent to harm or kill her, ransacked her office, and terrorized her staff. And they did it because Donald Trump sent them on this mission. As the insurrectionists got closer, Capitol Police rushed the speaker from the House floor at 2.15 p.m., mere minutes after the Capitol was first breached. They recognized immediately that she was in danger. The speaker was not just rushed from the floor, the Capitol Police deemed the threat so dangerous that they evacuated her entirely from the Capitol complex, rushing her to a secure off-site location. The insurrectionist intent to murder the Speaker of the House is well documented in charging documents that are now available. We know from the rioters themselves that if they had found Speaker Pelosi, they would have killed her. 
I have already discussed Proud Boys member Dominic Pizzola, who has since been charged with eight federal crimes for his conduct on January 6. As you will recall, according to the FBI agent's affidavit submitted to the court, the group he attacked the Capitol with confirmed that, quote, anyone they got their hands on, they would have killed, including Nancy Pelosi. William Calhoun, a lawyer from Georgia, also participated in the insurrection that day, and he too has been charged for his actions. This insurrectionist detailed his criminal activity at the Capitol online. Calhoun wrote about his involvement on his own Facebook page. Here's the post. Calhoun stated, quote, and get this, the first of us who got upstairs kicked in Nancy Pelosi's office door and pushed down the halls towards her inner sanctum. The mob howling with rage. Crazy Nancy probably would have been torn into little pieces, but she was nowhere to be seen. Crazy Nancy. That's Trump's nickname for the Speaker of the House. Then he explains that he and his group only abandoned their claim to the Speaker's office when, quote, a SWAT team showed up. He writes, quote, then a SWAT team showed and we retreated back to the rotunda and continued our hostile takeover of the Capitol building. Retreated, hostile takeover. He's using military terms for this attack. The mob continued to look for Speaker Pelosi throughout the time they occupied the Capitol, including invading her offices. Watch now how the mob searches for Speaker Pelosi's office, which is marked in red, and the House chamber itself. During the siege, the speaker's staff took cover in her office, hiding in fear for their lives for hours as rioters broke in and ransacked her office. As the rioters were breaking into the Capitol, her staff retreated into an interior room. Eight of them gathered in a conference room. About the same time Capitol Police announced that Capitol had been breached, Speaker Pelosi's staff heeded the call to shelter in place. On our model, you can see the riders in the rotunda in red and the speaker's office again in orange. So this is a security video, so there is no sound. As you can see here, the staff moves from their offices through the halls and then enters a door on the right-hand side. That's the outer door of a conference room, which also has an inner door that they barricaded with furniture. The staff then hid under a conference room table in that inner room. This is the last staffer going in and then barricading themselves inside of the inner office. After just seven minutes of them barricading themselves and the last staffer entering the door on the right, a group of riders entered the hallway outside. And once inside, the riders have free reign in the Speaker of the House's offices. In this security video, pay attention to the door that we saw those staffers leading into and going into. One of the riders you can see is throwing his body against the door three times until he breaks open that outer door. Luckily, when faced with the inner door, he moves on. Another rider later tried, unsuccessfully, to break through that inner door. At this point, the mob had already broken into the speaker's formal conference room that is in the back of the hall at the top of the video. I want to play some audio we have of the speaker's staff 
with the riders at the door that day. You can hear the terror in their voice as they describe what's happening to them as they are barricaded in that conference room. Please listen carefully because the staffer is whispering into a phone as he hides from the riders that are outside the door. You can hear the pounding in the background as that staffer is speaking. One of those staffers explained later that they could hear the mob going through her offices, breaking down the door and yelling, where are you, Nancy? The mob also pillaged and vandalized the speaker's office and documented their crimes on social media. They stole objects desecrated the office of the Speaker of the House of Representatives of the United States. As you can see in these photos, rioters broke down a door. They also shattered a mirror. At 2.50 p.m., several rioters, including Richard Bigo Barnett, entered Speaker Pelosi's office. The world is all, all now too familiar with the images from these slides. If you look closely, however, at the now infamous pictures of Barnett with his feet on the desk, you might see something that you didn't notice previously. Here's a better look. As this photo highlights, he's carrying a stun gun tucked into his waistband. The FBI identified the device as a 950,000 volt stun gun walking stick. The weapon could have caused serious pain and incapacitated anyone Barnett had used it against. Richard Barnett bragged about his actions. He was proud of the way he desecrated the Speaker of the House's office. He left a note. We will not back down. Here's Barnett in his own words. Office. How'd you get it? I didn't steal it. I bled on it because they were fucking macing me and I couldn't fucking see. And so I figured, well, I'm in her office. I got blood in her office. I'll put a quarter on her desk, even though she ain't fucking worth it. And I left her a note on her desk that says, Nancy Bigo is here, you bitch. Trump's mob ransacked the Speaker of the House's office. They terrorized her staff. Again, that is a mob that was sent by the President of the United States to stop the certification of an election. The Vice President, the Speaker of the House, the first and second in line to the presidency, were performing their constitutional duties presiding over the election certification and they were put in danger because President Trump put his own desires, his own need for power over his duty to the Constitution and our democratic process. President Trump put a target on their backs and his mob broke into the Capitol to hunt them down.
Africa. When you get it, we're back. Our parents, hey, sir, when you get it, we're stranded. Jesus said they preached the scaffold. Like that, they know they have preached the scaffold. They're behind our lines. Shortly after 2 p.m., the Capitol Police and Metropolitan Police were overwhelmed by President Trump's mob. Perimeters were broken. The Capitol had been breached. Those officers kept fighting back for hours and hours to hold the line. They fought to defend the Capitol building and all of us within it. But they weren't there just to protect us. And they did, and our staff, and the custodial staff, and all the people who work so hard in this building. They were there to protect the votes of the American people that were being counted that day. I will show you more later about what that day was like for those brave officers. But first, let's go back to what was happening where Manager Plaskett left off in the House chamber. Rioters who had entered the building through the Senate quickly spread out through the Capitol, many headed towards the House and Senate chambers. After Speaker Pelosi was ushered out, Chairman McGovern was presiding in the House, attempting to keep the counting process going. On our phones, Members were receiving security updates and watching social media to see the horror that was going on outside. We never thought it would make its way in. By 2.25 p.m., rioters who were already in the building opened the east side doors of the Capitol Rotunda to let more of the mob in. They quickly flooded through the doors, overwhelming the officers. This is new security footage of those doors. And as before, the mob is identified with the red dot on the model of the Capitol. If you look closely, you'll see the first person through the door is holding a Trump flag. At the same time, just one floor below, the mob violently pushed through a line of Capitol Police officers and overtook the area. We all know that area in the Capitol is the crypt. This is directly beneath the rotunda, at the very center of the Capitol. Inside the House chamber, a security officer suspended the floor debate to update members. We were told there were tear gas masks underneath our seats and be prepared to grab them. Determined to keep the count going, Chairman McGovern called the House back into session. But only four minutes later, at 2.30 p.m., the House abruptly recessed. A new security announcement was made. Get down under your chairs if necessary so we have folks entering the rotunda and coming down this way. So we'll update you as soon as we can, but just be prepared. Stay calm. As I heard that announcement on the floor, I saw the new House chaplain, 
on just her fourth day on the job, walked to the front podium. Unannounced and amidst the chaos, she started to recite a prayer for peace. Uncertain what would happen next, I sent a text message to my wife. I love you and the babies. Please hug them for me. I imagine many of you sent a similar message. What we could not see from inside the chamber was that outside, the mob was growing larger and larger and approaching our doors. But we could hear them. This security footage, which does not have sound, shows a close-up of Trump's mob as they move toward the second floor of the House chamber to stop the counting of votes. In the back of the group, you see one individual carrying a Stop the Steal sign. They get within footsteps of the house door. The next video is the viewpoint of the insurrectionists. It begins with the mob amassing and then cuts ahead to show you their surge to the house door. Those doors to orient you at home are the doors that the President of the United States walks through when he or she gives a State of the Union address. You may have heard one man yelled, no violence, and another responded, it's too late for that. They don't listen without that. They were there to stop the certification of the election. At this point inside the House chamber, we can now hear the pounding on the doors. At 2.35 p.m., members on the House floor were told an evacuation route was secured and it was time to leave. This video shows members of Congress exiting to the side of the podium where we would go through the House lobby and downstairs. Because of coronavirus restrictions, Congressional members had been waiting in the gallery for their time to speak just one level above the House floor. Representatives, staff, journalists, all took cover under their chairs, helped each other put on their gas masks, and held hands as rioters gathered outside. Here in this slide, you see Representative Jason Crow comforting our colleague, Representative Susan Wild. The rioters continued to surround the House chamber, flooding the halls and kicking on the doors as they passed them. This security video shows Ashley Babbitt, followed by others in the mob, turning the corner toward the House lobby doors where the members were leaving.
Chairman McGovern was one of the last members to leave the floor. As he left through the House lobby just after 2.40 p.m., he was spotted by the mob. Minutes later, at 2.44 p.m., Ashley Babbitt attempted to climb through a shattered window into the House lobby. To protect the members in the lobby, an officer discharged his weapon, and she was killed. I want to warn everyone that the next video, which shows her death, is graphic. Inside the chamber, representatives, staff, and journalists remained trapped in the gallery, one floor above the House floor, and heard the gunshot. My colleague, Representative Dan Kildee, produced this recording. Take your pins off. Yeah. What the fuck? Take your pins off. Pins off. Out of fear that they'd be seen, or taken by the mob, my colleagues were telling each other to take off their congressional pins. That buzzing sound that you hear in the background of these videos was the sound of the gas masks. It was not until approximately 2.50 p.m., about six minutes after the shooting, downstairs, remaining members, staff, and journalists in the gallery were finally able to flee. In this security footage video, you can see them exiting. Many members are still wearing their gas masks. They walk just feet away from where Capitol Police are holding an insurrectionist at gunpoint. Just minutes earlier, that insurrectionist had tried to open the gallery door and thankfully was stopped by a tactical team. Although members were now being moved to another location, the mob continued to fight, to stop the count, to find the members, to engage with the police. The building was not yet secure. This security video from 2.56 p.m. shows the mob in the House of Representatives wing on the second floor of the Capitol. Insurrectionists who are still inside the building are fighting with the police, who are overwhelmed and trying to get them out. Throughout this presentation, we have been very careful to not share where members of Congress were taken on the paths they followed to get out and off the floors. But that very issue was under discussion by the insurrectionists themselves. One example comes from an FBI affidavit, which stated that a leader of a militia group known as the Oath Keepers received messages while he was at the Capitol. The leader was given directions to where representatives were thought to be sheltering and instructions to, quote, turn on gas, seal them in. And as you know, the threat to the Senate was no less than that of the members of the House. The mob approached the Senate with the same purpose, 
fulfilling President Trump's goal of stopping the count, delaying the certification of the electoral college votes of the American people. As you heard from Manager Plaskett, Vice President Pence was moved away from the area near the Senate chamber around 2.25 p.m. By that time, rioters had breached several areas close to this chamber, and they were flooding the hallways just outside and nearby. The Senate chamber was not evacuated until 2.30 p.m. The mob had been in the building for more than 15 minutes. This new security footage of the senators and staff leaving the chamber will be displayed on the screens. It is silent. You cannot see it in this footage, but quick thinking Senate floor staff grabbed and protected the electoral ballots that the mob was after. Those of you who were here that day will recall that once you left the Senate floor, you moved through a hallway to get to safety. That hallway was near where Officer Goodman had encountered a mob and led them upstairs and away from the Senate chamber. You know how close you came to the mob. Some of you, I understand, could hear them, but most of the public does not know how close these rioters came to you. As you were moving through that hallway, I paced it off. You were just 58 steps away from where the mob was amassing and where police were rushing to stop them. They were yelling. In this security video, you can see how the Capitol Police created a line and blocked the hallway with their bodies to prevent rioters at the end of the hall from reaching you and your staff. Because this is security footage that you have not seen before, I want to play it again. The top of the screen is the other end of that hallway where the mob has amassed and the officers are rushing to to protect you. Additional security footage shows how Leader Schumer and the members of his protective detail had a near miss with the mob. They came within just yards of rioters and had to turn around. Here in this new video, you see Leader Schumer walking up a ramp, going up the ramp with his detail. He'll soon go out of view.
Seconds later, they return and run back down the hallway, and officers immediately shut the door and use their bodies to keep them safe. At 2.45 p.m., shortly after senators were ushered to safety from the Senate floor, insurrectionists reached this Senate gallery. The following video was filmed by a New Yorker reporter. Minutes later, the insurrectionists invaded and desecrated the Senate floor. These vandals shouted and rifled through the desks in this room. They took pictures of documents and of themselves, celebrating that they had taken over the floor and stopped the counting of Electoral College votes. Let me just get a snap of that. Yeah, I took a picture. Hey, how did I get down there? Go down the stairs. This is, and look, here, look. Ted Cruz's objection to the Arizona. This is his objection. He was going to sell us out all along. Really? Look, objection to counting electoral votes of the state of Arizona. Can I get a photo of that? Wait, no, that's a good one. That's a good one. All right, all right. Look, I'm pissed. I'm pissed. He's with us. He's with us. This guy is something over here. We're not going to fall, man. America's recovered. Oh, no, this is good stuff. Hey, we're not going to fall. Larry Brock, who was arrested for his role in the insurrection, was photographed on the Senate floor wearing a helmet, tactical gear, and carrying flex cuffs. This man, also in the Senate gallery, is Eric Munchell. Like Brock, he was dressed in what appears to be tactical gear, also holding up flex cuffs. If the doors to this chamber had been breached just minutes earlier, imagine what they could have done with those cuffs. After insurrectionists occupied the Capitol and stopped the joint session from counting the votes, the Capitol was in lockdown for five hours. As long as it took to get back to the Capitol, to get back to the certification of the election, it could have been so much longer. Or we might, not been we might not been able to have resumed at all. As horrific as it was, 140 officers injured, three officers who ultimately lost their lives, we all know that awful day could have been so much worse. The only reason it was not was because of the extraordinary bravery of the men and women of the Capitol Police and the Metropolitan Police Departments. For hours and hours, these insurrectionists were in hand-to-hand -hand combat with these brave men and women. Like some of you, I come from a law enforcement family. My dad was a cop. My two brothers, my little brothers, are cops who walk the beat today. I'm proud of them. And like in every law enforcement family, when we hang up the phone, we don't only say, I love you, we say, be safe. So let's focus now on the attack and what it was like for the officers defending the Capitol that day. And again, I want to warn you that the following audio and videos are graphic and are unsettling. But it's important that we understand the extent of what occurred. Here's an audio recording from the radio traffic of the DC Metropolitan Police Department describing the violence. Cruiser 50, we're still taking rocks, bottles, and pieces of flag, and metal poles. Cruiser 50, the crowd is using munitions against us. They have their spray in the crowd. They are spray in the crowd. Okay. Oh, yeah. 
50 years old. I need a real, I need a real book here. You hear the officer describe they're using munitions. They, the rioters, are using munitions against us. This video shows how the sprays that were described were used against the officers. In a separate Metropolitan Police Department radio traffic recording, you can hear an officer when he realizes that the insurrectionists had overtaken the police line. We lost the line. We lost the line. All NPD pull back. All NPD pull back up to the upper deck. All NPD pull back to the upper deck. All stop. All NPD come back to the upper deck. Upper deck. The MPD officer calls out 1033. That's the code for emergency. Officer in need of assistance. His words, we've lost the line. Hours after members of the House and Senate had left this area, on the west front of the building, the mob continued to grow, continued to beat the officers as they tried to get in. In this new security video, you can see the mob attacking officers with a crutch, a hockey stick, a bullhorn, and a Trump flag. I want to show you that same attack from the officer's perspective from his body camera footage. This body camera footage is from 4.27 p.m., over two hours from when the Capitol was first breached. The attack on police that afternoon was constant. Metropolitan Police Officer Michael Fanone, a 20-year police veteran with four daughters, was part of a line of officers protecting the Capitol. He was one of three officers that the mob dragged down the stairs. When they dragged him, they stole his badge, his radio, his ammunition magazine, and they tased him, triggering a heart attack. Here he describes his experience. It looked like a medieval battle scene. You know, it was some of the most brutal combat you know, I've ever, uh, ever encountered. Uh, at one point, I got tased. People were yelling out, you know, we got one, we got one. Officer Christina Lowry, who regularly serves in MPD's Narcotics and Specialized Investigation Division, also protected the front Capitol entrance. Here's her experience. I mean, I, I can't say enough about the officers that were there, the officers that were on the front line. Um, and when I say the front line, I mean literally officers that were in a line stopping these people that were beating them with metal poles. They were spraying them with bear mace. I mean, they did everything in their power to not let those people in. And this was going on for hours. Around 4.30 p.m., hours into the Capitol riots, Officer Daniel Hodges was protecting a west side Capitol entrance when rioters who were trying to stop the certification trapped him between two doors. When Officer Hodges was interviewed later, this is how he described what was happening. 
They threw down a huge metal object that hit me in the head. I was also knocked down. The medical mask I was wearing at the time got pulled up over my eyes, so I was on the ground and blinded, and they started just attacking me from all sides. Rioters crushed Officer Hodges. He was wedged in the doorway, blood dripping from his mouth. He was struggling to breathe, all while the insurrectionists hit him. Officer Hodges' experience reminds you of what he and many other officers experienced that day, what they went through. We're also reminded of the three officers who lost their lives, Capitol Hill police officers, Sicknick, Liebengood, and Metropolitan Police Officer Smith. In many law enforcement families, we pray for our loved ones, and we know the scripture of Matthew, chapter 5, verse 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. I'm sorry I have to show you the next video. But in it, you will see how blessed we were that on that hellish day, we had a peacemaker like Officer Hodges protecting our lives, our staff's lives. This capital and the certification process. May we do all we can in this chamber to make sure that never happens again. Mr. President, we'll now have a recess for dinner and we'll resume at 6.15. The Senate will stand in recess. Good evening, C-SPAN's live coverage of the second day of the impeachment trial against former President Donald Trump continues here on C-SPAN 2. Wait a minute, we want to get your reaction to what you've heard today from the House impeachment managers. Their arguments, legal arguments laid out today over the past five and a half hours. They've taken a couple of breaks. They get eight hours today to make their arguments and then another eight hours tomorrow. We want your reaction to what you've heard so far. Republicans, 202-748-8921. Democrats, 202-748-8920. All others dial in at 202-748-8922. And you can also join us on Twitter at C-SPAN or go to facebook.com slash C-SPAN to post your comments there. Now, as you just heard, the majority leader calling for a dinner break. They are expected to return in about 45 minutes, and then they will continue on. It is unclear if the House impeachment managers will use their entire eight hours today, but they can do so. And then they'll convene tomorrow morning, tomorrow noon Eastern time for day two, another eight hours to lay out their case against the former president. After that, uh, we will hear from the president's lawyers. 
The, pro the former president's lawyers will make their case, and they will have two days to eight-hour sessions to make their defense of the former president. It will then be followed by questions from the senators, uh, as well as uh, consideration of calling witnesses, and then finally closing arguments. After that, they'll take a vote on whether to acquit or convict. We want to show you a little bit of the argument made just in this last session from the House managers, from Stacey Plaskett, the delegate from the Virgin Islands, age 54. Here's part of the argument that she made while we wait for your calls. As the rioters reached the top of the stairs, they were within 100 feet of where the vice president was sheltering with his family. And they were just a feet away from one of the doors to this chamber, where many of you remained at that time. I also want to show you a different angle from the security footage of Officer Goodman's acts. This video is on the second floor of the Senate wing of the Capitol. The red dot, as you recall, represents the insurrectionists. The blue dot is Officer Goodman, who led the mob away from the chamber just minutes earlier. On the left-hand side of the video, just inside the hallway is the door to the Senate chamber. And watch how Officer Goodman provokes the rioters and purposefully draws them away from the door to the Senate chamber and towards the other officers waiting down the hall. The rioter seen carrying a baseball bat in this video is the same one we saw moments ago breaching the window on the first floor. While all of this was going on, Vice President Pence was still in the room near the Senate chamber. It was not until 2.26 that he was evacuated to a secure location. This next security video shows that evacuation. His movements are depicted by the orange dot in our model. The red and blue dots represents the location where the mob and Officer Goodman were, and where Officer Goodman led the mob away from the chamber just moments ago. You can see Vice President Pence and his family quickly move down the stairs. The Vice President turns around briefly as he's headed down. As Pence was being evacuated, rioters started to spread throughout the Capitol. Those inside helped other rioters break in through doors in several locations around this entire building. And the mob was looking for Vice President Pence because of his patriotism, because the Vice President had refused to do what the President demand and overturn the election results. During the assault on the Capitol, extremists reportedly coordinated online and discussed how they could hunt down the vice president. Journalists in the Capitol reported they heard rioters say they were looking for Pence in order to execute him. Trump's supporters had erected a gallows on the lawn in front of the Capitol building. Another group of rioters chanted, hang Mike Pence, as they stood in the open door of the Capitol building. You can hear the security alarm from the door in the background, and you can hear the mob calling for the death of the Vice President of the United States. This wasn't an isolated area or incident where that was being told, where that was being said. It was going on everywhere. Here's another example of the crowd outside yelling, bring out Pence, bring him out.
after President Trump had primed his followers for months and inflamed the rally goers that morning, it is no wonder that the Vice President of the United States was the target of their wrath after Pence refused to overturn the election results. Listen to this man explain. Well, Congress, the uh, cowards uh, hid in their uh, inside and were emergency uh, escorted away because of fear of the people. Of course, they're cowards, can't face the people, can't do the right thing. Pence lied to us, he's a total treasonous pig, and his name will be mud forever. Now the real battle begins, and it looks like uh, the American people are very pissed. So, good luck with that. Peace out. Peace out. Several insur insurrectionists described what they had planned to do if they encountered the vice president or other lawmakers. One of them, Dominic Pizzola, also known as Spaz, is a member of the Proud Boys, as we discuss. Pizzola came to the Capitol on January 6 with deadly intentions. He commandeered a Capitol police shield, used it to smash a glass window, entered the Capitol, and paved the way for dozens of insurrectionists. As you recall from an earlier video, Pizzola was one of the first wave of rioters to breach the building. On the left, you can see a screenshot from the video of the break-in we showed earlier. And on the right, you can see Pizzola in the mob chase Capitol Police Officer Eugene Goodman through the building. Pizzola is the man in the center of the photo with the gray beard. Pizzola has since been charged with eight federal crimes for his conduct related to January 6. According to an FBI agent's affidavit submitted to the court, the group that was with him during the sack of the Capitol confirmed that they were out to murder, quote, anyone they got their hands on. Here's what the FBI said, and I quote, other members of the group talked about things they had done that day, and they said that anyone they got their hands on, they would have killed, including Nancy Pelosi, and that quote, they would have killed Vice President Mike Pence if given the chance. They were talking about assassinating the Vice President of the United States. During the course of the attack, the Vice President never left the Capitol, remained locked down with his family, with his family inside the building. Remember that as you think about these images and the sounds of the attack. The Vice President, our second in command, was always at the center of it. Vice President Pence was threatened with death by the President's supporters because he rejected President Trump's demand that he overturn the election. Last got on the Senate floor earlier today. Now, Lisa Murkowski at the mics talking to reporters. Let's listen. Not just in one snippet on this day and another on that, but this whole, this whole um, uh, scenario that has been laid out before us. I just, I don't see how uh, Donald Trump could be reelected to the presidency again. I just, just don't see one, that. One uh, bit of housekeeping. You're under no pressure, or are you, from your leadership to no, vote a certain no, way? No, none, none whatsoever. None whatsoever. Okay. Absolutely not. You feel free to vote your conscience. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you, Senator. Thanks, Senator. Appreciate, Appreciate your time. It. Alaska Republican Lisa Murkowski there talking to reporters during this dinner break of the second day of the impeachment trial against President Trump. Now, Lisa Murkowski voting yesterday along with five other Republicans to say on a vote 56 to 44 that this trial could move forward. She voted that it was constitutional to move forward. She joined Senator Bill Cassidy of Louisiana, uh, Susan Collins of Maine, Mitt Romney of Utah, Ben Sass of Nebraska, and Pat Toomey of Pennsylvania. Six Republicans voting to move forward. And so you had today the House impeachment managers 
their first day laying out their legal arguments. We want to know what you heard from them today. Carol in Louisville, Kentucky, Democratic caller, you're up first, Carol. Go ahead. I just think if this man is not impeached, it would be a disgrace to this country. Why? This, I'm, because I'm an older woman. I have never seen anything like this in my life. Win or lose, you wish the other one well, you take it as it is, and you just keep going as a country. This man is dangerous. He's not well mentally, I don't feel. Uh, and he is just... He's a wannabe dictator to me. Carol, have you and, been watching the arguments today? Yes, I have. And what what has stuck out to you? What if, what has really made you um, have the thought that you are having that he needs to be convicted and not and barred from running for office again? Well, I mean, I, not only just seeing the things. The trial today, uh, just I've seen so much that's led up to it, um, all the things that he's done throughout his time, um, but for him to allow this to happen and other things, it just, I've just never seen it before. All right, Carol. And now the House managers today, including just in this last portion, showed to all of you and those senators sitting in that room new surveillance video taken from inside the Capitol on that day on January 6th, video that had not been seen before. So we want to get your thoughts on that as well today. Carl in Maricopa, Arizona, Republican. Carl, go ahead. Uh, yes, thank you for taking my call. First of all, I do want to say I am a Republican. I mean, I vote Republican uh, pretty much all my life. So I voted for Democrat was Jimmy Carter. So uh, I did vote for uh, uh, Trump in November. But I am I am so upset at Mr. Trump. The reason, well, what's really convincing and what we saw today, man, when you see those gallows that they really wanted to assassinate the vice president of the United States, Mike Pence, and just the, what he had to go through, he and his family, for protection. Here is the vice president of the United States who's been so loyal. And Trump. He's never said one negative thing against President Trump. And here he's trying to do the right thing. He's trying to do what the Constitution says, validate the election. And here he is. He's, 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 he's you know, trying to do the right thing. And I feel like Mr. Trump, he basically, uh, he's just doing his own thing. He's just thinking about himself. I would, I would vote for impeachment if I was a Republican senator. No question at all as far as why, because he should never, ever be allowed a federal office based on how he has treated Vice President Mike Pence. And, you know, the rhetoric didn't just start at that speech before they stormed the Capitol. It started all his, all his, uh, Rallies that took place. Man, he just riled up everybody saying that the country is going to be ruined by Democrats, ruined, it's going to become a socialist country, a communist country. All that rhetoric, basically a climatic event took place because of all that took, took place in the past. So, Carl, you voted for the president in November. Did you vote for him in 2016 as well? <laughs> 2016, I voted for Ted Cruz because I really liked who he selected for his vice president candidate, uh, Carla Farina. Okay. And I just couldn't, I didn't have the guts to vote from in the, in the election, general election. I voted for Ted Cruz again. It was just a write-in ballot. I, I just had reservations about President Trump back in 2016. But I voted for Trump in 2020 because my wife's a diehard Republican, and I wanted unity in the family, <laughs> uh, you know, in our marriage. I wanted unity in our marriage. <laughs> Okay, Carl in, in Arizona. Maribel in, in Bronx, in New York, Independent, your turn. Hi there, thanks for having Hi. me. Have Hi. Have you been watching all day? Mm -hmm. oh, I've been watching all day, and I have to say that the, uh, the impeachment managers have done such a great job laying out the timeline. 
Now, I, like many other people, have been home for months because of the coronavirus. And um, I went from being, like, not too political, not really voting all the time, to having all of this time on my hands. And just watching the daily briefings from the president not matching up with my own um, research on, on COVID and seeing that they were lying to the public and, and, and like rewriting history in real time. And it was extremely disturbing. So I kind of, kind of became a historian on my own, documenting all of this tweets and, and interviews and everything, because I, I thought, my God, if he wins the presidency, this, is, this will be wiped from history and no one will know what really happened. <laughs> so here I am like quietly having a freak out attack and, and, and documenting everything. And um, when January 6th happened, in a way I was relieved because it was sort of validation that my fears of how bad this could get or where it was heading, you know, they were, you know, just validated. So um, the next thing I was afraid of was that that the Democrats were going to kind of drop the ball and let him get away with it. And um, I'm just glad that they produced such a concise and clear, easy to follow timeline of what's going on. And, And I can't imagine seeing that and not voting to to convict. Maribel, you mentioned the House managers. We've heard from eight of the nine. Uh, what? Who do you think has made the most compelling case of them? Ah, oh, it's terrible. I've been watching. I don't know her name. <laughs> She's from the Virgin Islands. Stacy Stacy Plaskett, who we just heard from a couple of times today, yes. but just heard yes, from. Yes, yes. I think she. She's. I, I love the way she delivered. And she just has this regality to her. She's like a queen. <laughs> I think I was most impressed with her um, her presentation. Okay. All right. Jamie yeah. Dupree, who covers Washington, D.C., tweets this out. Uh, four things we learned today. Speaker Pelosi was evacuated entirely from the Capitol complex. Officer Goodman may have saved Mitt Romney's life. Uh, the majority leader, Schumer, and his security detail had to run from rioters. And the Vice President Pence was held hold up just off the Senate floor with attackers in the halls. Those are four things new today revealed by the House impeachment managers. Let's listen to Eric Swalwell, Democrat, one of the impeachment managers, uh, talking about that moment with the then minority leader, now majority leader, Chuck Schumer. The mob had been in the building for more than 15 minutes. This new security footage of the senators and staff leaving the chamber will be displayed on the screens. It is silent. You cannot see it in this footage, but quick thinking Senate floor staff grabbed and protected the electoral ballots that the mob was after. Those of you who were here that day will recall that once you left the Senate floor, you moved through a hallway to get to safety. That hallway was near where Officer Goodman had encountered a mob and led them upstairs and away from the Senate chamber. You know how close you came to the mob. Some of you, I understand, could hear them, but most of the public does not know how close these rioters came to you. As you were moving through that hallway, I paced it off. You were just 58 steps away from where the mob was amassing and where police were rushing to stop them. They were yelling. In this security video, you can see how the Capitol Police created a line and blocked the hallway with their bodies to prevent rioters at the end of the hall from reaching you and your staff.
Because this is security footage that you have not seen before, I want to play it again. The top of the screen is the other end of that hallway where the mob has amassed and the officers are rushing to to protect you. Additional security footage shows how Leader Schumer and the members of his protective detail had a near miss with the mob. They came within just yards of rioters and had to turn around. Here in this new video, you see Leader Schumer walking up a ramp, going up the ramp with his detail. He'll soon go out of view. Let's listen to Majority Leader Chuck Schumer. He's at the microphones. In my situation, I just want to give tremendous credit to the Capitol Police officers who were in my detail, like the rest of the Capitol Police officers. They are utterly amazing and great, and we love them. Senator, do you That's have any it. sense nope. of how close this could have been to being so much worse? Majority Leader, they're reacting to the video that you all were just watching, the replay of new surveillance footage made public today during the second day of the impeachment trial. You heard Eric Swalwell, one of the House managers, unveiling that uh, Capitol footage, Capitol surveillance footage. He's 40 years old, elected in 2012, and a Democrat from California. And you just saw the majority leader thanking the police and his security detail for that day. We're asking all of you, your reaction to what you heard from the House managers, we have yet to hear from the president's lawyers. We will do so in a couple of days, and they will get the same amount of time that the House managers get to present their case. But what have you heard today, and what have you make of it? Jelani in Southfield, Michigan, Democratic caller. Go ahead. First of all, I just want to say thank you for taking my call. I uh, was watching the impeachment trial last year, and I tried to call and didn't get through. Unfortunately, we're at this position yet again kind of scary um i just want to quote one of my uh one of my good friends he's a really good historian i really like his, what he says and he said if i'm starting to run out of quotes and relevances or relevancies in history we have a problem and it's very scary to think that in my very short 20 years that we've had a president who has tried to overthrow the government who has tried to corrupt another federal another government in ukraine to influence our 2020 election and then try and get away with it like it's a fat free. Republicans have a responsibility and a moral duty to convict Trump. There's no way he can get away with this without corrupting the system of, of America. Jillian, what, what do you think today was the most powerful piece of evidence? Um, when, I can't remember her name, the delegate from the Virgin Islands? Yes, Stacey Plaskett. Her. She has been streamlining all the, all of the, everything that we've seen throughout the January 6th riots. We've, everything that's been leading up from all the House managers, really. And I believe one of the senators uh, said they, she, they were all building a case against Trump brick by brick, which I could not find a better metaphor. He led this riot. He, they uh, are proving how this affected everybody. And it's, I could not be better, more proud of Democrats at the moment. All right. Priscilla in McAllen, Texas. Priscilla, what do you think? Priscilla, good evening. What do you think? Good evening. Uh, it's been quite a day, hasn't it? I voted for Bush. I voted for McCain. Uh, but lately, it seems like the party of the GOP has turned into the party of Trump. And it's unfortunate to see personal loyalty 
as such a requirement in this day and age. It's been shocking to see a gallows elected. It's been shocking to see officers risking their lives for elected officials doing their job. It's been a very difficult period of time for all of us, I think, a time when we were more at odds with our neighbors than ever before. But I think the evidence speaks for itself. And how did you vote in November? In November, I voted against Trump. Because? Because I felt that his party was no longer standing for any principle other than Trump. Because I felt that the American people need to stand for America, not for a king. And how did you vote in 2016? In 2016, I didn't vote, and I regret it. Priscilla, what would be your message to senators who have been sitting in that chamber today listening to the evidence? That the American people care about America. They care about their well-being. That the American people are people, just like the senators are, with families and lives. And that we see that they were at risk for doing their jobs. In the same way that many of us have been put at risk doing our own jobs especially during a pandemic. Do your job. Okay. And don't let this person put us in danger again. Priscilla, you would want them to convict the president and then bar him from running for office again. I would wish for them to bar him from office. Any other penalty, well, that needs to be adjudicated in a different court, perhaps. But certainly this person needs to be barred from office. Okay. He serves himself, not other. And those are two separate actions, according to the Washington Post. Now, when this is all said and done at the end, they'll hear, they'll, they will hear closing arguments. And then it'll take a two-thirds majority of the Senate to convict the former president. If they do so, then they would take a vote on barring the former president from future federal office. And that would be a simple majority, meaning 51 votes are needed. So here is the schedule. We heard from the House managers today. They have a, a couple of hours or more remaining in their first eight hours. Tomorrow they will get another eight hours for a total of 16. And then you will hear from the, pre the former president's lawyers. They will get their turn Friday and Saturday, eight hours each day to make their case defending Mr. Trump. And then on Sunday, we expect the senators to get to ask questions of the lawyers. And then it'll turn to whether or not they want to call witnesses. That will be a vote. From reporting today in Washington, it seems both parties are reluctant to call witnesses. Then we could see closing arguments early next week, followed by that vote on whether to convict or acquit. Phil in Kansas City, Missouri is a Republican. Phil, what did you make of today? How are you doing? I'm doing well, Phil. How did, what did you make of today's evidence? Uh, well, I'm kind of old school, and I've, I've seen a lot of stuff going on this past year and two, and uh, I just uh, I just can't believe what's going on with uh, Mr. Mr. Trump. Well, what do you mean? Well, what I mean is, all you know, like like you're talking to everyone else. I was. You know, this year I voted for Trump, and in the past election, I did not vote for Trump because because of the person he is and the person that filed uh, bankruptcy for three three times, if I remember right, in the past to represent the United States of America. Okay, Phil, let me ask you: Do you think the president is guilty of inciting violence? Of course I do. Why? And I want I would like to go another step beyond that, but I'm I'm gonna keep my mouth shut upon that. Okay. Because anyone anyone that charges charges the government, to me that's like treason. And I could be off a little bit on that, but that's how I feel. Okay. After seeing everything and everybody doing what I've seen on T V and what uh, the senator of, or the Republican of uh, 
California, I'm just like, I was as appalled at what I've seen in this country and the separation of what this man has done to us. Now, all, all right, Phil, I'm going to go on to Stephen, who's in Kernersville, North Carolina, Democratic caller. Stephen. Hey, thank you uh, for taking my call first and foremost. But um, I was listening to the past couple of calls, and Priscilla especially kind of moved me because um, we, I feel like she, uh, Espoused the same sentiments as I would like to say that we would we would have never been in this position in a country where we have been this divided, and the reason for that is because the racism, misogyny, homophobia, xenophobia has always been on the back burner, and there were certain things you couldn't say until a president such as Donald Trump came into office, and he has he was elected and. Now it's as though the Proud Boys and the neo-fascists feel the need, the, they feel the gratification of, or the um, grandeur of being backed by the highest person in the land of this country. And so they ran with it, but they lost. And they lost not once, but twice. This is not their first loss. This is their second or third. And they're not willing to deal with that. Okay, and Stephen, let me... Just as Trump is not willing to deal with that. Stephen, let me get your reaction to Scott Wong, a reporter on Capitol Hill for the Hill newspaper, tweeting out this. Some Republican senators say they were moved by the video presentation. Here is Senator John Thune, a Republican of South Dakota, who's in the leadership for the Republicans. The impeachment matters, quote, were very effective. They had a strong, strong presentation put together in a way that I think makes it very compelling. I think they've done a good job connecting the dots. Stephen, what do you think? I think that's a that's a good sentiment, but that is from one senator, if I'm not mistaken, and we need more than one senator. I think we need a two thirds majority to actually impeach and make a difference. Need seventeen. Um, so that's a yeah, exactly. So that's a good first step, but for the other um, forty nine um, Republican senators who are willing to turn a blind eye to the horrible crimes of inciting violence of a President, the, the POTUS, the President of the United States, the highest position in the office of the the world, basically, for them to to act as it as though this is norm, this is the new normal. This is not normal. I've been alive for forty plus years now, and I've seen Republicans that I disagreed with and Democrats that I dis disagreed with politically, but this has never been normal um, to actually incite violence. Because you're, you have a, a deficiency in your mental capacity to be able to, to deal with losing. All right, and that's what this boils down to. And Stephen, my... noting you need two thirds, you need 67 senators. That would mean 17 Republicans have to vote with all 50 Democrats to convict the former president. You've seen in test votes, one of them yesterday, on the question of constitutionality. You did not have enough Republicans side with Democrats on that question. You got enough, the Democrats had enough to move forward with these proceedings, but it does not seem that they would have enough to convict. Now, one of the senators who is open to voting uh, to convict the former president is Utah Republican Mitt Romney. I wanna show you from Stacey Plaskett's presentation today, the moment where she talks about how Capitol Police and the law enforcement on Capitol Hill saved his life and others. At approximately 2.13 p.m., just one floor up, while Senator Lankford was speaking on the Senate floor, Senator Grassley, who had taken over for Vice President Pence, called an unscheduled immediate recess of the Senate. A Senate aide approached Senator Lankford and informed him that the Capitol had been breached. Senator Grassley is immediately escorted out of the Senate chamber. We'll pause. Protesters are in the building. Thank you. <clears throat> now, while this was going on, Officer Eugene Goodman responded to the initial breach. You all may have seen footage of Officer Goodman previously but there's more to his heroic story. In this security footage, you can see Officer Goodman 
running to respond to the initial breach. Officer Goodman passes Senator Mitt Romney and directs him to turn around in order to get to safety. On the first floor, just beneath them, the mob had already started to search for the Senate chamber. Officer Goodman made his way down to the first floor where he encountered the same insurrectionists we just saw watch breach the Capitol. After seeing that video, Mitt Romney told reporters that uh, he had not seen it before, and he said about Officer Goodman, quote, no, I did not know that was Officer Goodman, but I look forward to thanking him when I next see him. I was very fortunate indeed that Officer Goodman was there to get me in the right direction. That was new video shown in today's proceedings. Now, you can watch that video and all the other video. If you go to our website, cspan.org slash, slash impeachment, you can watch anytime on demand all of the impeachment proceedings. Back to your calls, Stephen in Saint, Lake St. Louis, Missouri, Independence. Stephen, have you been watching today? I have all day, yes. And what have you been thinking? Um... Honestly, the, there's two chief things that come to mind. The first and foremost, that it's insane that we need the, the future of accountability for the executive depends on finding 17 Republicans who are willing to uphold their oath. And instead of because chief, chief, uh, there's a chief thing I think people need to know about this is that the, when the senators go in for the impeachment, the first thing they do is they take an oath to be an impartial juror and. I was reading reports 20 minutes ago, which prompted me to call in, which said that there were reports of Republicans who were doodling and sitting with their feet up, not paying attention at all, basically just being present. How is that being an impartial juror? How, how can they be an impartial juror if they're not even paying attention? It's, it's crazy to me. <clears throat> the other thing that's really stood out to me has just been really the terror of how close we were to losing our republic. We were, what did you say, 58 steps away? I think it was Swalwell who said 58 steps away from the mob catching up to people, and we could have ended up with a lot of assassinated representatives. That is, it's, it's pure insanity, again, that we have a group of people who call themselves patriots and yet are willing to go and kill our elected officials. How can they call themselves patriots if they want to subvert democracy? That's not patriotism, that's terrorism. Stephen, why should, in your opinion, they rule, or how should they rule, these senators, do you think? And why? Um, I'm, <laughs> I'm thinking they'd ha they have to rule uh, as a, for guilty. Um, the reason being that if, it, it seems very clear to me from what the impeachment managers have thus laid out, that Trump is guilty of incitement uh, between everything that they've done up to January 6th and then the speech he gave on January 6th, which he gave his one little pittance towards peaceful protest in his whatever thousand some odd word uh, speech. Uh, read the transcript if you haven't. It's great, people. <laughs> the uh, He absolutely incited uh, this insurrectionist attack on the Capitol. They have to do it because if this isn't an impeachable offense, nothing is. Who do you think has made one of the more compelling arguments today of all the House managers that you've heard from? Um, I think they've all done a fantastic job. My favorite thus far has been Swalwell. Um, the the last thing that he showed right before break, uh, the unfortunate uh, Capitol Police officer getting crushed in the door. Uh, I can't remember his name offhand, but that was uh, that was powerful. It had me shaking. It was I'd seen it before, but even seeing it, having seen it, it still had me shaking. I was just so I was afraid for his life. I was afraid for the future of the democracy. I was scared. I was angry. And I mean, I don't know how you can watch these things having happened and not be terrified. It's just a scary time. This, these are scary things that happened. And even weeks later, I'm still shaking about it. Stephen, we are four hours and 30 minutes into the House manager's eight-hour presentation. That means they have 
and we don't know if they will take uh, the rest of their time. They get eight hours today and eight hours tomorrow. They are in a dinner break. We are waiting for them to return. The majority leader, Chuck Schumer, said it would be around 6.15 p.m. Eastern time. When they resume, of course, we will bring you gavel to gavel, uninterrupted coverage right here on C-SPAN 2. And you can also watch on cspan.org on our website. You can listen live with this free C-SPAN radio app. Just download onto your phone and then on demand anytime, our website, cspan.org slash impeachment. You'll find it all there. Adam Kingsinger, who's been a vocal critic of the former president, a Republican from Illinois, tweets out, the prosecution is compelling. Donald Trump incited and directed the insurrection. He knew what he was doing. I cannot imagine how any senator could vote against removal. So that's Adam Kingsinger, Republican of Illinois. Also, Chad Pergram, who covers Capitol Hill for Fox News, sent this tweet out a little bit before 4 p.m. Eastern time. His colleague, David Spence, reports that the FBI director, Chris Ray, will testify about the Capitol attack on March 2nd. That will be Ray's first major remark since the attack in January. Let's hear from Andrea in Corona, California. Republican Andrea, welcome to the conversation. Have you been watching today? Yes, I have. Um, first of all, I would just like to say I'm a Trump supporter, and um, I, I think I can probably speak for 70, 70 other million Trump supporters saying that I do not condone um, violence in any way. I don't condone what happened at the um, Capitol that day. Um, but I just I think that we need to get back to the basics here. Um, the question is, is whether or not um, President Trump incited the violence. The one thing that I come back to is and in all the um, the the footage from today, um, there was people that had baseball bats. There's people that had helmets, bear spray, munitions, zip tie cuffs. Um, I've been to a Trump rally, and you don't get into a Trump rally with that stuff. So those people plan that before the speech that Trump gave. And I, I just, I mean, I mean, how can you say that he incited it with his speech if those people came prepared to do that? So Andrea, did you see earlier on in the day the argument being made? Um, by the House managers was that the president before that day in a series of tweets had retweeted people who said the cavalry was coming to D.C., that they were ready to fight for him, that he was retweeting that type of language, that it started before that. So what do you make of that argument? Well, I think that we I think that the rally was there. And, and, and in my uh, you know, I would have liked to have gone to that rally. There was an unfair um, uh, uh, vote count. I believe that there was voter fraud. It's unfortunate that that happened at the Capitol. And I think it's actually very convenient for the Democrats that it did because it took it away from the vote fraud onto the violence and to the to the riot of the Capitol, which I, is not where I wanted the conversation to go at all. I We needed to talk about fair elections. And that's what that was all about. And we needed to go and we needed to make our voices heard so that the senators understood that we want a, 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 a fair election and that we don't want things stolen from us. And I'm a reasonable person, and I look at things at all different views, and I've thought about this, and I've looked at it in every different direction. And I have friends that are Democrats, and I have friends that are Republicans. And um, this is not what we wanted. This is political theater that we're dealing with right now. They could have made it a documentary and posted it on any MSN um, uh TV station would have played it for him. We've been seeing stuff that has nothing to do with impeachment. We need to go back to why is he being impeached? Because he incited violence. He did not tell us to go do. He didn't tell anybody to go go down there. There was a hundred. There was over a hundred thousand people at that rally. All those people were not there for violence. It was a couple hundred people that were there, and and the Proud Boys and the people that were in there and and banging windows and having baseball bats and that weren't your average Trump supporter. And I don't appreciate being labeled as a as a violent, um, bigoted, uh, and all these things that, that the mainstream media and these Democrats that are up there with their, uh, their videos are terrible. I don't condone. And, you know, a lot of Trump supporters are military. They're, they're, they are law enforcement. Uh, Andrea, we law enforcement. Uh, and we, we heard your point. You're, you don't condone it. Wondering if you think now that the president should have been more forceful in his denouncing of groups like the Proud Boys? 
I think that he did denounce violence. He's denounced violence all summer long. All summer long, he's denounced violence. How many times did he have to say that he was um, not, you know, that he wasn't a racist and that he wasn't a white supremacist and he denounced white supremacy? Come on, we've been hearing it. And, and, and this, these people that call on your show and, and respectfully, I mean, they're watching the TV and the TV is unfair. It's unfair. You know what's really frightening right now is I'm being labeled that. I have to be afraid that say that I'm a Trump supporter out because because the TV has has told people that that means that I'm a bad person. So Andrea, and you're, you're not are, the last four years. The 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 um, what what you're watching on TV today, the Senate proceeding. Are you saying that's unfair? No, no, I don't. What you guys are doing is great, and I think your phone calls are great. I, I appreciate it. I wouldn't waste my time if I didn't. I just yeah. am trying to get my voice out there. It seems like there's been a lot of, you know, um, uh, uh, calls that are saying, are saying I understand. that. Um, I understand. But, let, me, let me just clarify, because it's important to know that the cameras inside the Senate chamber are not our cameras. They're not any media cameras. They are operated by the Senate recording studio, the Senate itself, the chamber itself. And so C-SPAN and other networks, when they're showing you what's happening inside that chamber, they are giving you that feed. We don't have that video feed. We don't have any control of it. Aaron Sheff, who writes for the New York Times as a staff photographer, puts out this tweet with a picture of members of Pelosi's staff who were barricaded in a conference room, terrified for their lives during the January 6th attack on the Capitol. Watch video from that day during the Senate impeachment trial of former President Donald Trump on Capitol Hill on today. Let's take a moment. Let's listen to that moment when Stacey Plaskett t talks about uh, the Pelosi staffers and what they went through that day. The mob also went after Speaker of the House, who alongside the Vice President was presiding over the joint session of the certification in the House chamber. The chilling evidence shows that on January 6, armed and organized insurrectionists trained their sights on Speaker Pelosi. They sought out the speaker on the floor and in her office, publicly declared their intent to harm or kill her, ransacked her office and terrorized her staff. And they did it because Donald Trump sent them on this mission. As the insurrectionists got closer, Capitol Police rushed the speaker from the House floor at 2.15 p.m., mere minutes after the Capitol was first breached. They recognized immediately that she was in danger. The speaker was not just rushed from the floor, the Capitol Police deemed the threat so dangerous that they evacuated her entirely from the Capitol complex, rushing her to a secure off-site location. The insurrectionist intent to murder the Speaker of the House is well documented in charging documents that are now available. We know from the rioters themselves that if they had found Speaker Pelosi, they would have killed her. I have already discussed Proud Boys member Dominic Pizzola who has since been charged with eight federal crimes for his conduct on January 6. As you will recall, according to the FBI agent's affidavit submitted to the court, the group he attacked the Capitol with confirmed that, quote, anyone they got their hands on, they would have killed, including Nancy Pelosi. William Calhoun, a lawyer from Georgia, also participated in the insurrection that day and he too has been charged for his actions. This insurrectionist detailed his criminal activity at the Capitol online. Calhoun wrote about his involvement on his own Facebook page. Here's the post. Calhoun stated, quote, and get this, the first of us who got upstairs kicked in Nancy Pelosi's office door and pushed down the halls towards her inner sanctum, the mob howling with rage. Crazy Nancy probably would have been torn into little pieces, but she was nowhere to be seen. Crazy Nancy. That's Trump's nickname for the Speaker of the House. Then he explains that he and his group only abandoned their claim to the Speaker's office when, quote, a SWAT team showed up. He writes, quote, then a SWAT team showed and we retreated back 
to the rotunda and continued our hostile takeover of the Capitol building. Retreated, hostile takeover. He's using military terms for this attack. The mob continued to look for Speaker Pelosi throughout the time they occupied the Capitol, including invading her offices. Watch now how the mob searches for Speaker Pelosi's office, which is marked in red, and the House chamber itself. During the siege, the Speaker's staff took cover in her office, hiding in fear for their lives for hours as rioters broke in and ransacked her office. As the rioters were breaking into the Capitol, her staff retreated into an interior room. Eight of them gathered in a conference room. About the same time Capitol Police announced that Capitol had been breached, Speaker Pelosi's staff heeded the call to shelter in place. On our model, you can see the riders in the rotunda in red and the speaker's office again in orange. So this is a security video, so there is no sound. As you can see here, the staff moves from their offices through the halls and then enters a door on the right-hand side. That's the outer door of a conference room, which also has an inner door that they barricaded with furniture. The staff then hid under a conference room table in that inner room. This is the last staffer going in and then barricading themselves inside of the inner office. After just seven minutes of them barricading themselves and the last staffer entering the door on the right, a group of rioters entered the hallway outside. And once inside, the rioters have free reign in the Speaker of the House's offices. In this security video, pay attention to the door that we saw those staffers leading into and going into. One of the riders you can see is throwing his body against the door three times until he breaks open that outer door. Luckily, when faced with the inner door, he moves on. Another rider later tried, unsuccessfully, to break through that inner door. At this point, the mob had already broken into the speaker's formal conference room that is in the back of the hall at the top of the video. I want to play some audio we have of the speaker's staff with the riders at the door that day. You can hear the terror in their voice as they describe what's happening to them as they are barricaded in that conference room. Please listen carefully because the staffer is whispering into a phone as he hides from the riders that are outside the door. You can hear the pounding in the background as that staffer is speaking. One of those staffers explained later that they could hear the mob going through her offices, breaking down the door and yelling, where are you, Nancy? House Manager Stacey Plaskett from earlier today in the House uh, Democrats' presentation of their case against President Trump. Now, senators have been in a dinner break and that some of them are making their way back into the chamber. What you are looking at is the hallway outside of the Senate chamber. Leadership has their offices to the right and the left of that uh, hallway. And we know that the, the minority leader, Mitch McConnell, has already made his way to his seat 
for the resumption of today's impeachment proceedings. The House, management, House uh, impeachment managers have been making their case for four hours and 30 minutes, according to pool reports on Capitol Hill. They have eight hours total today to make their case. When they reconvene the Senate, uh, when, they, when they gavel back in, we will, of course, bring you to the floor, live coverage here on C-SPAN 2. CNN is reporting that the House managers will show even more new evidence when they resume their case against the former president this evening. You can watch that here uninterrupted on C-SPAN 2. Looks like one of the lawyers for the president of the president's team making their way into the chamber. I don't know if that was Mr. Schoen, one of the lawyers um, on your screen. So people are getting in place and we will bring you our coverage then. You can also watch on our website, cspan.org. You can download our free C-SPAN radio app and listen to the proceedings there. And if you've missed anything, you can find and watch it on demand uh, there's the president's lawyer, Mr. Castor, making his way into the chamber. But anyway, you can watch everything you've seen today, everything that you will see in the coming days on our website on demand at cspan.org slash impeachment. Here's Senator Cassidy. Obviously, it's part of the trial. Of course, it's part of uh, How that influences final decisions remains to be seen. Do you think that this could be a vote of conscience for both parties? Say that one more time. I think it should be. Yeah, absolutely. Is there anything that you've seen so far that was, you know, especially jarring? There's so much. There's no one thing. There are many things. Is there something that you think that needs to be taken away today? One more time. Is there something you think that needs to be taken away from today's proceeding? Um, again, there's so much to say that should be taken away. Um, how does one? narrow it, but you realize that there are people, insurrectionists, who attempted to affect the peaceful transfer of power, and that should give anyone who loves our republic great pause. Senator Bill Cassidy, Republican of Louisiana, he was one of six Republicans yesterday that voted with the 50 Democrats, 56 to 44, to reject the argument from Mr. Trump's defense team and decided to go along, along party line votes that the Senate had the jurisdiction to try an impeached former president. This paved the way for the trial proceedings today. We are waiting for the Senate to reconvene, to get back underway and continue with the House managers' legal arguments. They've laid out four hours and 30 minutes so far today. They get a total allotment of eight hours today, followed by another eight hours tomorrow. And then you will hear from the former president's lawyers. They will have Friday and Saturday to lay out their arguments in defense of the president on this one article of impeachment inciting an insurrection on the U.S. Capitol. After the lawyers make their arguments, and then the Senate will turn to questions from the senators. They have four hours to do so at that point. Then there will be a consideration of whether or not to call witnesses, followed by closing arguments, and then deliberation and vote on conviction. They will need two-thirds of the Senate to convict. That's 67 senators. Yesterday's vote on the constitutional question garnered six Republicans. That means they would need 11 more Republicans to convict the former president. Now, Brian Stelter for CNN reports from his colleague on Capitol Hill, Manu Raju, that several GOP senators have made clear they view the footage they've seen today by House managers throughout the afternoon as chilling and are shaken by what they saw but they are signaling they won't change their plans to vote to acquit former President Trump in the impeachment case. You also have Kyle Griffin of MSNBC, Republican James Lankford, watching the footage of the Capitol Police officer being crushed, appeared emotional, sitting at his desk with his head bent down. Steve Daines put his hand on his colleague's arm, appearing to comfort him. 
And you had CBS's news reporting Mitt Romney was blinking rapidly and watching intently as impeachment managers showed that January 6th footage of him being directed to safety by Capitol Police Officer Eugene Goodman. And then finally, Rebecca Shabad of NBC reporting Senator Rick Scott. We'll read that later. The Senate is back. We'll take you there now. Live coverage. Mr. Raskin. Mr. President, uh, distinguished members of the Senate, um, managers uh, Cicilline and Castro will now remind us of what President Trump was doing during the attack. They will show how he continued to stoke the insurrection and refused to speak out against the violence or do anything to stop it. Mr. Cicilline. Mr. President, distinguished senators, you just heard from my colleagues about the harrowing events that happened here at the Capitol on January 6th and saw that very disturbing video. I'd now like to turn your attention to what was happening on the other end of Pennsylvania Avenue at the White House. And the truth is, the facts are that on January 6th, Donald Trump did not once condemn this attack. He did not once condemn the attackers. In fact, on January 6th, the only person he condemned was his own vice president, Mike Pence, who was hiding in this building with his family in fear for his life. In the first crucial hours of this violent attack, he did nothing to stop it, nothing to help us. By all accounts from the people that were around him, he was delighted. And here's the last thing Donald Trump said that day. And you might remember this from my motions presentation earlier in the week. At 6 p.m. on January 6th, after all the destruction that you just saw, the Capitol Police and the National Guard fighting to secure this building, here's what Donald Trump tweeted. These are the things and events that happen when a sacred landslide election victory is so unceremoniously and viciously stripped away from great patriots who have been badly and unfairly treated for so long. Go home with love and in peace. Remember this day forever. He got what he incited, and according to Donald Trump, we got what we deserved. Donald Trump's incitement of this insurrection, including his dereliction of his duty as Commander-in-Chief to defend the Capitol and the people in it, his complete refusal to condemn the attack while it was going on, and his continued incitement of the violence during the attack require impeachment. Now let's turn to then President Trump's conduct that day. I want to start at the beginning when he addressed his thousands of great patriots, as he called them that morning. Around noon, Donald Trump began speaking at his rally just down Pennsylvania Avenue. Even before Donald Trump finished speaking, uh, his supporters began to walk down toward the Capitol, and they were already starting to chant, stop the steal, storm the Capitol, invade the Capitol, Fight for Trump. And by 12.53 p.m., they had violently forced their way through the barricades here at the Capitol. Now, about 1 o'clock that day, with this chaos just starting, Speaker Pelosi, as the Constitution requires, formally commenced the process by which this chamber certifies the election results. Within 10 minutes, at 1.11 p.m., as if almost on cue, Donald Trump concluded his speech with his final reminder to the thousands gathered there that it was time to go to the Capitol. Let's watch. And we're going to the Capitol, and we're going to try and give, but we're going to try and give our Republicans 
the weak ones, because the strong ones don't need any of our help. We're tr going to try and give them the kind of pride and boldness that they need to take back our country. So let's walk down Pennsylvania Avenue. I want to thank you all. God bless you, and God bless America. Thank you all for being here. This is incredible. Thank you very much. Now, you've seen what happened when these supporters, following his orders, arrived here at the, at the Capitol. But I want to look at what happened next. Now, you'll recall during the speech, President Trump said, we're going to the Capitol, sort of suggesting that he was going to go with this crowd. Of course, that was not true. Um, but let's hear what he said. Now it is up to Congress to confront this egregious assault on our democracy. And after this, we're going to walk down, and I'll be there with you. We're going to walk down. We're going to walk down. Anyone you want, but I think right here, we're going to walk down to the Capitol. This, of course, was not true. He did not go with him to the Capitol. He left and went back to the White House. And while he was en route to the White House, violence really began to grow here at the Capitol. And within minutes of Donald Trump's speech ending, there were significant reports of escalating violence that began to surface. Buildings around the Capitol were starting to be evacuated. And by 1.15, an explosive device had been found at the DNC. A pipe bomb had been found at the RNC about 15 minutes earlier. The House Sergeant at Arms had called for immediate assistance. At 1.34 PM, the mayor of Washington, DC, called for additional <laughs> National Guard troops. I won't go through all of the details of the violence that unfolded here. You just saw that. But as we walk through what our commander in chief did that day, I want to be very clear about exactly what was happening here at the same time. For 40 minutes, while buildings were being cleared, pipe bombs were being found, his supporters were literally breaching the perimeter of the Capitol and overwhelming law enforcement, and you saw the violence that was occurring, we heard nothing from the President of the United States. We didn't hear anything from Donald Trump until 1.49 p.m., when while all of this is unfolding, President Trump sent out a tweet. This was the first thing he did when he learned the United States Capitol all the members of Congress, his own vice president was under violent attack. And what was that tweet? Nearly an hour after the rioters breached the Capitol perimeter at 1.49, Donald Trump released a propaganda reel of his Save America speech that he'd given an hour before. I want to be clear. The events I just described the rioters are breaching the Capitol, attacking law enforcement. The violence is being broadcast all over the television for the whole world to see, including the President of the United States. And I want to show you, this is what is happening right before Donald Trump sends that video out again and as he does it. Our country has had enough. We will not take it anymore. And that's what this is all about. And to use a favorite term that all of you people really came up with, we will stop the steal. Because you'll never take back our country with weakness. You have to show strength and you have to be strong. Even if President Trump claims he didn't know the extent of the violence that would follow his speech, it was now happening in plain view, broadcast on television. His supporters were attacking law enforcement. The mayor and the police chief were calling for help. Members of Congress and the vice president were inside, scared for their lives. And he doesn't send help, doesn't try to stop it, doesn't even acknowledge the attack. Instead, our commander in chief 
tweeted the video of the speech that he'd given before that included language like, our country has had enough, we will not take it anymore, and that's what this is all about. You have to be strong. Those around Donald Trump, as was later reported, were disgusted. His close aides, his advisors, those working for him, former officials, even his family were begging him to do something. Kellyanne Conway, the president's close advisor, called to, quote, add her name to the chorus of aides urging Donald Trump to take action. Ivanka Trump, the president's own daughter, went to the Oval Office as soon as the rioting escalated and was, as confirmed by Senator Graham, quote, trying to get Trump to speak out, to tell everyone to leave, end quote. Minority leader Kevin McCarthy called Jared Kushner, pleading with him to persuade Trump to issue a statement or to do something. And Kushner, too, went down to the White House after that call. And it wasn't just the people at the White House. Members of Congress from both parties who were trapped here we're calling the White House to ask for help. Some members even appealed directly to Donald Trump. These members who had, quote, been loyal Trump supporters and were even willing to vote against the electoral college results were now scared for their lives. Minority leader Kevin McCarthy repeatedly even got into a screaming match as the attack was underway demanding that Trump do something, issue a statement denouncing the mob. I imagine many of you sitting here today picked up your phone and tried to reach somebody at the White House to ask for help. This wasn't partisan politics. These were Americans from all sides trying to force our Commander-in-Chief to protect and defend our country. He was required to do that. Now, the extent of how many people tried to reach the president to get him to act is not known. But what is clear, what we know without any doubt, is that from the very beginning, the people around Donald Trump lobbied him to take command. What's also clear is what Donald Trump, our commander-in-chief, did in those initial hours to protect us. Nothing. Not a thing. He knew it was happening. The attack was on TV. We know, all know that President Trump had the power to stop these attacks. He was our commander in chief. He had the power to assess the security situation, send backup, send help. He also had incited this violent attack. They were listening to him. He could have commanded them to leave. But he didn't. The first critical hour and a half of this bloody attack Donald Trump tweeted his rally speech and did nothing else. And we know why. We know his state of mind that prompted his utter, complete refusal to defend us. It was reported by those around him. The president, as reported by sources, at the time was delighted. As he watched the violence unfold on television, President Trump was reportedly, and I quote, borderline enthusiastic because it meant the certification was being derailed, end quote. Senator Ben Sass relayed a conversation with senior White House officials that President Trump was, quote, walking around the White House, confused about why other people on his team weren't as excited as he was, end quote. Trump's reaction to this attack reportedly genuinely freaked people out. I understand why. We just suffered a very serious attack, attack on our country. And we saw it, and the people around him knew it. But when Donald Trump saw it, he was delighted. Now, what President Trump did next confirms why he was so delighted, why he wanted this because it shows that his singular focus that day, the day we were attacked, was not protecting us, was not protecting you, was not protecting the Capitol. It was stopping the certification of the election results. 
The evidence is clear. Shortly after 2 p.m., as the siege was fully underway, then President Trump made a call. This is the first call that we are aware he made to anyone inside the Capitol during the attack. He didn't call the Vice President to ask how he could help defend the Capitol. He didn't call the next two in line to the succession of the presidency to check on their safety or well-being. Instead, he attempted to call Senator Tuberville. He dialed Senator Lee by accident. As Senator Lee describes it. He had just ended a prayer with his colleagues here in the Senate chamber. And the phone rang. It was Donald Trump. And how Senator Lee explains it is that, he, that the phone call goes something like this. Hey, Tommy, uh, Trump asks. And uh, Senator Lee says, this isn't Tommy. And he t hands the phone to Senator Tuberville. Senator Lee then confirmed that he stood by as Senator Tuberville and President Trump spoke on the phone. And on that call, Donald Trump reportedly asked Senator Tuberville to make additional objections to the certification process. That's why he called. Now, let's be clear, at roughly 2 p.m., when Donald Trump was walking around the White House, watching the TV delighted, and spent five to 10 minutes talking to Senator Tuberville, urging him to delay the election results, this is what was happening in the Capitol. We'll pause. Protesters are in the building. Thank you. You saw Senator Langford stop speaking and leave uh, the floor quickly in that clip because the insurgents had broken through. Uh, the barricades and had entered the building. And as these armed insurrectionists banged on the doors, members of Congress were told to put on their gas masks, to put bags over their heads for safety and prepare to evacuate. And Donald Trump was calling to ask a senator to delay the certification process. Let that sink in. Donald Trump didn't get to finish that call was cut off because the senators had to move to another location for your security. And thank God they did. Because as the call was occurring, the rioters got closer to the Senate chambers. And as we all know now, but for the heroism of Capitol Police Officer Eugene Goodman and other law enforcement officers who took them in a different direction to the police line, they very likely would have gotten here. Think about that. Armed insurrectionists with guns, weapons, zip ties, brass knuckles, they were coming for us. They were inside the United States Capitol trying to stop the certification process. The police were outnumbered. And but for the grace of God, they would have gotten us, all of us. And our commander in chief makes a call about an hour after the siege began not to preserve, protect, and defend you and our country and the Capitol, but to join forces with the mob and pressure a senator to stop certification. We just can't get numb to this kind of behavior. There can be no doubt as to the purpose of Donald Trump's call, that he was not calling to assess the security threats or to check on the well-being of you or anyone else. Indeed, later on that evening, while all of the destruction and damage still continued, dozens of officers were being treated for serious injuries. Deaths were confirmed. About 7 p.m., the president's personal lawyer, Rudy Giuliani, made a call. And just in case you don't think there was some coordination, he also called Senator Lee's phone trying to reach Senator Tuberville. We don't have to guess uh, as to what Rudy Giuliani said in that voicemail because we have it recorded. So let's listen to what the president's personal lawyer said on the night of this attack. Senator Tuberville, or I should say Coach Tuberville, this is Rudy Giuliani, president's lawyer. 
I'm calling it because I want to discuss with you how they're trying to rush this hearing and how we need you, our Republican friends, to try to just slow it down. This was the singular focus of Donald Trump during this bloody, violent attack on the Capitol, stopping the certification. Look, as I mentioned, I was a trial lawyer for 16 years. Sometimes you have to ask a jury to use reasonable inferences to piece together a defendant's state of mind. We don't have to do this here. While our country was violently attacked by an armed mob, President Trump not only refused to stop the attack or even address the attack at all, he made clear his focus was the same goal of the attackers he had incited to stop the certification process and prevent the peaceful transition of power. The only action we know that he took an hour into this attack was to call Senator Tuberville to ask him to delay the certification. This is as clear evidence as I have ever seen of what Donald Trump really cared about that day. Now look, the certification process, as we all know, includes debate and objections. Some of us disagreed, but we came here on January 6th to formally administer the certification process pursuant to our constitutional duties. And at the end of it, Congress certified the results to ensure that we continue to be a country with leaders who are elected by the people for the people. Donald Trump's objection to the certification are not on trial. But what is on trial is while we were under armed attack and being evacuated, while our law enforcement officers were fighting for their lives, our Commander-in-Chief was calling not to determine how to best secure the building and the people in it, but to continue to pressure senators to stop the certification process and the peaceful transfer of power. Just as he incited the mob to do earlier in the day, this was a breathtaking dereliction of his duty and of his violation of his oath as our Commander-in-Chief. Senators, before I hand this over to Manager Castro to walk through the rest of the day, please let me make one final point. These attackers stood right where you are. They went on that rostrum. They rifled through your desks and they desecrated this place. And literally, the president sat delighted, doing nothing to help us, calling one of you to pressure you to stop the certification. It can't be that the Commander-in-Chief can incite a lawless, bloody insurrection and then utterly fail in his duty as Commander-in-Chief to defend us from the attack, to defend our law enforcement officers from that attack, and just get away with it. Donald Trump abdicated his duty to us all. We have to make this right and you can make it right. My fellow manager, David Cicilline, showed you what President Trump did and did not do in those first critical hours of the attack. He sent a tweet at 1.49 p.m. where he reposted a video of the speech that incited the attack. And he called a senator to ask him to delay the certification as the senator was being evacuated for his own safety. We left off around 2.15 p.m. At this point, insurgents were inside the Senate and the House, and the Senate had been evacuated for everyone's safety. And as you saw, Vice President Mike Pence and his family even had to be evacuated for their safety. Now, you'll recall, Donald Trump 
had made Vice President Pence a target. He attacked the Vice President at the rallies, in speeches, and on Twitter. And during, Trump, during President Trump's speech that morning of the attack, he ramped it up again after privately pressuring Mike Pence in front of thousands in the crowd, he called Mike Pence out 11 times, including saying, quote, Mike Pence, I hope you're going to stand up for the good of our Constitution and for the good of your country. And if you're not, I'm going to be disappointed in you. I will tell you right now. And this was the crowd's response to Donald Trump's days of relentless attacks on his own vice president. By 2.15 p.m., the crowd was chanting in unison, hang Mike Pence outside the very building he'd been evacuated from with his family. Now, even if President Trump didn't know that his inflammatory remarks about his vice president would result in chants of hang Mike Pence, by 2.15 p.m., he surely knew. The attack was all over television. They were doing this out in the open. This was a vice president whose life, whose family's life, was being threatened by people whom the president had summoned to the Capitol. And what did President Trump do in response? Did he stop? Did he tell his base, no, don't attack my vice president? Even when President Trump knew what his words were causing, he didn't do any of those things to stop the crowd. In fact, he did the opposite. He fueled the fire. At 2.24 p.m., he tweeted, quote, Mike Pence didn't have the courage to do what should have been done to protect our country and our Constitution. USA demands the truth. Over an hour and a half into the attack, and this is what he tweeted. And he still, even at this point, did not acknowledge the attack on the Capitol, let alone condemn it. Instead, he further incites the mob against his own vice president, whose life was being threatened. Well, some of you may say, well, who was paying attention anyway? Well, that mob was paying attention. Mike Pence didn't have the courage to do what should have been done to protect our country and our Constitution, giving states a chance to certify a corrected set of facts, not the fraudulent or inaccurate ones which they were asked to previously certify. U.S. demands the truth. The insurgents amplified President Trump's tweet attacking the vice president with a bullhorn. They were paying attention. And they also followed instructions. In fact, the insurgents were at one point, as you saw, 60 feet away from the vice president and the vice president's family. 
Some of these insurgents were heard saying, quote, that they hoped to find Vice President Mike Pence and execute him by hanging him from a Capitol Hill tree as a traitor. And then they erected a gallows with a noose. This is what Donald Trump incited. Please take a close look at that picture. It harkens back to our nation's worst history of lynching. A president's words have the power to move people to action. These were the results. And why did the president incite such rage against the vice president? He was fulfilling his constitutional duty, as we all were that day. Vice presidents in this country have been carrying out this constitutional duty, overseeing the certification of the election results without incident, without contest, without a word for the entirety of our nation. It's part of our peaceful transition of power in the United States. And the vice president said he reviewed the Constitution and he could not block certification as President Trump wanted him and was pressuring him to do. He told the president in a letter that morning, a few hours before President Trump's tweet, quote, I will approach this moment with a sense of duty and an open mind, setting politics and personal interests aside and do my part to faithfully discharge my duties, our duties, under the Constitution. I also pray that we will do so with humility and faith. And the President's response to that statement was to attack Mike Pence while he was with his family under the threat of a violent mob. The Vice President was following his faith, his duty, and his oath to our nation. And the Vice President and I don't agree on too much in politics, but he's a man who upholds his oath, his faith, his duty, and most of all, upholds the Constitution. And Mike Pence is not a traitor to this country. He's a patriot. And he and his family, who was with him that day, didn't deserve this didn't deserve a president unleashing a mob on them, especially because he was just doing his job. As this was unfolding and the crowd grew more violent, the president, of course, was not alone at the White House. And the people closest to him, his family and advisors, who saw this unfolding in real time, begged him, implored him, to stop the attack. An aide to Mark Meadows, the president's chief of staff, urged his boss to go see the president, saying, quote, they are going to kill people. They're going to kill people. That's what those around President Trump feared. And still, nothing. It wasn't until 2.38 p.m., nearly two hours after the start of the siege, that Donald Trump even acknowledged the attack. And when he finally did acknowledge the attack, here's what he said. On the right, you'll see what had been happening prior to that tweet and as he sent the tweet. And on the left, you'll see exactly what he tweeted. I'm going to stop you there for just one moment because we do have some breaking news. We want to bring in Congressional Correspondent Chad Pergram as this is just all developing right now. Chad, I understand the Capitol is now on lockdown.
definitely fired up. The chant, by the way, I heard the most today was fight for Trump. And that's clearly what many of them feel they're doing. Here. That's what our president saw unfolding in real time, broadcast all over television. And this is what he tweeted at 2.38 p.m. Quote, please support our Capitol Police and law enforcement. They're truly on the side of our country. Stay peaceful. And much has been made of the fact that in this tweet, he says, stay peaceful. Senators, stay peaceful? Think about that for a second. These folks were not peaceful. They were breaking windows, pushing through law enforcement officers, waving the flag as they invaded this Capitol building. This was a violent, armed attack. Stay peaceful? How about stop the attack? Stop the violence? Stay peaceful? How about you say, immediately leave, stop? And he said, please support our law enforcement. How about he actually support our law enforcement by, uh, enforcement by telling these insurgents to leave the Capitol immediately, which he never did. He didn't. Because the truth is, he didn't want it to stop. He wanted them to stay and to stop the certification. And his failure had grave and deadly consequences. By 2.45 p.m., the warnings were tragically proven correct. Ashley Babbitt was shot by an officer as she tried to break through a glass door to reach the speaker's lobby. At this point, the pleas to Donald Trump, publicly and privately, grew even more desperate. At 2.54 p.m., Alyssa Farah, a former strategic communications director, begged the president, quote, condemn this now. You're the only one they will listen to for our country. Mick Mulvaney, the president's former chief of staff, his right-hand man at one point, tweeted at 3.01, the president's tweet is not enough. He can stop this now and needs to do exactly that. Tell these folks to go home. He can stop this now. Tell these folks to go home. At 3.06 p.m., Rep. McCarthy appeared on Fox News. Here's what he said. I could not be fatter or more disappointed with the way our country looks at this very moment. People are getting hurt. Anyone involved in this, if you're hearing me, hearing very loud and clear, this is not the American way. He's saying on Fox News, which the president watches, this is not the American way. Stop the attack. Representative Gallagher at 11, 311 p.m., while secured in his own office, posted a video to Twitter. Mr. President, you have got to stop this. You are the only person who can call this off. Call it off. And then, when the president didn't answer his pleas on Twitter, Representative Gallagher went on live television. I mean, this is insane. I mean, I, I've, I, I've not seen anything like this until, since I deployed to Iraq in 2007 and 2008. I mean, this is America, and this is what's happening right now. We need, the president needs to call it off. Like, call it off. Call it off. Representative Gallagher, you see there, said he'd not seen anything like this since he was deployed in Iraq. The message around the president was clear from everyone. You need to call this off. Stop it. But does he? No. 
His next tweet was not until about 3.13 p.m. Once again, it's important to consider what was happening between Donald Trump's 2.38 p.m. tweet and his next tweet at 3.13 p.m. You'll see footage from the attack during that time on the right and Donald Trump's tweet on the left. We've been uh, informed that uh, protesters have penetrated uh, the Capitol. Hey! Hey, we've got a fucking attitude problem over here. Tell you, the uh, sentiment in the streets is really getting to a different level. This is spinning out of control. This is turning violent. This is getting dangerous. You're America got that one idea. Don't touch me, don't. Get the fuck out of here. This isn't 10 minutes into the insurrection. This isn't just after his speech earlier that day. That's what our commander in chief saw happening. And that was his response. You'll notice one of the things he says to his mob, to these insurrectionists, rather than to stop or to leave, was to say thank you. Thank you. Thank you for what? Thank you for shattering the windows and destroying property. Thank you for injuring more than 140 police officers. Thank you for putting in danger all of our lives and the lives of our families. How about instead of thank you, Donald Trump on that day acted like our commander in chief and stopped this as only he could and told those people to leave. And here's what former Governor Chris Christie, his very good friend, said after that tweet. Pretty simple. Um, the president um, caused this protest to occur. He's the only one who can make it stop. What the president has said is not good enough. The president has to come out and, and tell his supporters to leave the Capitol grounds and to allow the Congress to do their business peacefully. And anything short of that is an abrogation of his responsibility. He's right. Chris Christie is right. We know how Donald Trump acts on Twitter and otherwise when he has a message to convey. In fact, I asked you to remember those tweets earlier this morning when he yelled on Twitter, stop the count. When he wanted to incite his supporters to show up on January 6th, President Trump tweeted 16 times between midnight on January 5th and his noon rally speech the next day. 16 times to get them to do something he wanted. And his message in those 16 times was clear. Fight, stay strong, be strong. But when the violence started, he never once said the one thing everyone around him was begging him to say. Stop the attack. He refused to stop it. And as Governor Christie and Representative Kinzinger and others made clear, only Donald Trump could have stopped that attack. You know, a guy that knows how to, how to tweet very aggressively on Twitter, you know, puts out one of the weakest statements in one of the saddest days in American history uh, because his ego won't let him, you know, admit defeat. He was not just our commander in chief, he had incited the attack. The insurgents were following his commands. And we saw when they read aloud this tweet, as we saw when they read aloud this tweet attacking the vice president. 
And they confirmed this during the attack, too. Senators, ask yourself this. How easy would it have been for the president to give a simple command, a simple instruction, just telling them, stop, leave. This was a dereliction of duty, plain and simple. And it would have been for any president who had done that. And that brings me to my next point. You heard from my colleagues that when planning this attack, the insurgents predicted that Donald Trump would command the National Guard to help them. And there's a lot that we don't know yet about what happened that day. But here's what we do know. Donald Trump did not send help to these officers who were badly outnumbered, overwhelmed, and being beaten down. Two hours into the insurrection, by 3 p.m., President Trump had not deployed the National Guard or any other law enforcement to help, despite multiple pleas to do so. President Donald Trump was, at the time, our Commander-in-Chief of the United States of America. He took a solemn oath to preserve, protect, and defend this country. And he failed to uphold that oath. In fact, there's no indication that President Trump ever made a call to have the Guard deployed or had anything to do with the Guard being deployed when it ultimately was. And shortly after 3.04 PM, the Acting Defense Secretary announced that the Guard had been activated and listed the people he spoke with prior to this activation, including Vice President Mike Pence, Speaker Pelosi, Leader McConnell, Senator Schumer, and Representative Hoyer. But that list did not include the President. This omission of his name was reportedly not accidental. According to reports, quote, Trump initially rebuffed requests to mobilize the National Guard and required interference by other officials, including his own White House counsel. And later, quote, as a mob of Trump supporters breached police barricades and seized the Capitol, Trump reportedly was, quote, disengaged in discussions with Pentagon leaders about deploying the National Guard to aid the overwhelmed U.S. Capitol Police. President Trump was reportedly, and I quote, completely, totally out of it. He made no attempt to reach the National Guard. And it was Vice President Pence, still under the threat for his life, who reportedly spoke to the Guard. President Trump's conduct confirms this too. On, at no point on January 6 did Donald Trump even reference the National Guard. The only thing that we heard connecting the President to the Guard was from his press secretary, who tweeted about the Guard being deployed at the President's direction over half an hour later at 3.36 p.m. And we have seen what Donald Trump does when he tries to take credit for something. And yet, even when the National Guard was finally deployed, he didn't even acknowledge it. In fact, he didn't say a word about the National Guard the entire day. Think about that. The bloodiest attack we've seen on our Capitol since 1812, and our President couldn't be bothered to even mention that help was on its way. These insurgents had been attacking our government for over four hours by that point, and we may have been the target, but it was the brave men and women who protect our Capitol who were out there combating thousands of armed insurgents in a fight for their lives. And that's who Donald Trump left entirely unprotected.
and this is hard to watch, but I think it's important we understand what the Capitol Police were facing, how severely they were outnumbered, while our Commander-in-Chief, whose job it was to protect and defend them, was just watching, doing nothing for hours, refusing to send help. If he wanted to protect these officers, if he cared about their safety, as he tweeted about, he would have told his supporters to leave. He would have sent help right away. And one brave officer was killed. Others took their lives after the attack. More than 140 police officers were injured, including cracked ribs, smashed spinal discs. One officer will lose an eye. Another was stabbed with a metal fence stake. They were completely and violently overwhelmed by a mob and needed help. And our Commander-in-Chief, President Trump, refused to send it. Senators, you've seen all the evidence so far, and this is clear. On January 6th, President Trump left everyone in this Capitol for dead. For the next hour, after President Trump's 3 p.m. tweet, he still did nothing. Not until 4.17 p.m., over three and a half hours after the violence started, did our President send a message finally asking the insurgents to go home. On the right, you'll see what happened that day in the hours leading up to his pre-recorded video, video. On the left, you'll see his message. Let's watch. I know you're pain. I know you're hurt. We had an election that was stolen from us. It was a landslide election, and everyone knows it, especially the other side. But you have to go home now. We have to have peace. We have to have law and order. We have to respect our great people in law and order. We don't want anybody hurt. It's a very tough period of time. There's never been a time like this where such a thing happened, where they could take it away from all of us from me, from you, from our country. This was a fraudulent election. But we can't play into the hands of these people. We have to have peace. So go home. We love you. You're very special. You've seen what happens. You see the way others are treated that are so bad and so evil. I know how you feel. But go home and go home in peace. This is the first time our Commander-in-Chief spoke publicly at all since the attack began, over the three and a half hours after it started. And these are the entirety of the words the President spoke out loud to the American people or to the attackers that entire day. Nowhere in that video, not once, did he say, I condemn this insurrection. I condemn what you did today. Nowhere did he say, I'm sending help immediately. Stop this. Here's what he said instead. I know your pain. I know your hurt. We had an election that was stolen. Even after all the things we witnessed, even after all of that carnage, he goes out and tells the same big lie. The same big lie that enraged and incited the attack. He repeated this while the attack was ongoing and while we were still under threat. And here's what else he said. Go home in peace. We love you. You're very special. Senators, you were here. You saw this with your own eyes. You faced that danger. And when President Trump had an opportunity to confront them as the leader of us all, as our Commander-in-Chief, what did he tell them? We love you. You're very special. This was not a condemnation. This was a message of consolation, of support, of praise. And if there's any doubt that his supporters, these insurgents, took this as a message of support and praise, watch for yourselves. 
Donald Trump asked everybody to go home. He just said, he just put out a tweet. It's a minute long. He asked everybody to go home. Why do you think so? Because, dude, we won well, the dad, fucking day. We fucking this, won. How do we yeah. win? Well, we won by sending thing. a message to the senators and the congressmen. Yeah, we so, won yeah. by sending a message to Pence, okay, that if they don't do as they are, as they, it is uh, their oath to do, if they don't uphold the Constitution, then we will remove them from office one way or another. I suspect you recognize that man. You'll hear him say that we won the day. Who won the day? We know that at least five people lost their lives that day. The House and the Senate were in life-threatening danger, and so was the Vice President. And think of everyone else here as well. Who won on January 6th? That's not a win for America, but it is a win for Donald Trump unless we hold him accountable. Now, a little over an hour after that video, the brave members of law enforcement secured the Capitol and we as a Congress got ready to continue certifying the results of our free and fair election. A half hour after that, President Trump issued another tweet in case there was any doubt as to whether he was happy with the people who did this, as to whether he had incited this, he commemorated what happened on January 6th. At 6.01 p.m. on January 6th, he tweeted, quote, these are the things and events that happen when a sacred landslide election victory is so unceremoniously and viciously stripped away from great patriots who've been badly and unfairly treated for so long, ending with, remember this day forever. My colleague, Manager Cicilline, started with this tweet because this tweet shows exactly how Donald Trump felt about what happened on January 6th. These are the things that happened. He's saying this was, for, this was foreseeable. He's saying, I told you this was going to happen if you certified the election for anyone else and you got what you deserved for trying to take my power away. Great patriots, go home with love and in peace. Remember this day forever. He's saying to them, you did good. He's not regretful. He's not grieving. He's not sad. He's not angry about the attack. He's celebrating it. He's commemorating it. This is the entirety of what President Trump said to the public once the attack began. Five tweets and a pre-recorded video on the day of the most bloody insurrection we faced in generations, our Commander-in-Chief, who's known for sending 108 tweets in a normal day, sent five tweets and a pre-recorded video. That is the entirety of President Trump's public statements from when the attack began until he went to bed on January 6th. That's all he did, despite all the people we know who begged him to preserve, protect, and defend. That was our Commander-in-Chief's response. He began the day with, quote, our country has had enough. We will not take it anymore. And that's what this is all about. And he ended the attack letting us know that we got what he forewarned that morning. We will, of course, each of us, remember that day forever, but not in the way that President Trump intended. Not because of the actions of these violent, unpatriotic insurrectionists. I'll remember this day, that day forever because despite President Trump's vicious attempts throughout the day to encourage the siege, and block the certification. He failed. At 8.06 p.m., the Senate gaveled into session and the counting of the electoral votes continued. About an hour later, the House followed suit. And close to 4 a.m., after spending a significant part of the day evacuated or on the floor or hiding, this great body fulfilled the will of the people and certified the Electoral College vote 
then I'm proud to be part of Congress. I'm proud that we ensured that the will of the American people finally prevailed on that day. And I'm proud that I and everyone in this room abided by our oath of office, even if the President didn't abide by his. And President Trump, too, took an oath as President. He swore on a Bible to preserve, protect, and defend. And who among us could honestly say they believe that he upheld that oath? And who among us will let his utter dereliction of duty stand? Mr. President, the managers are prepared to recess for the evening and to finish our opening statement tomorrow. Mr. President. Mr. President. Mr. President. Majority Leader. Pursuant to impeachment rule 16, I make a motion. Statements were attributed to me moments ago by the House impeachment managers statements relating to the content of conversations between a phone call involving President Trump and Senator Tuberville mm -hmm. were not made by me. They're not accurate. And they're contrary to fact. I move pursuant to Rule 16 that they be stricken from the record. Pursuant to Senate Resolution 47, Section 4, Parties' uh, presentations are not limited to the record provided for in Section 1 of that resolution. Senator, I the appeal to the, the chair. I couldn't hear what he said. Mr. President, would you, Mr. President. Mr. President, right here, we, we, we might as well hear clearly what the ruling of the chair was. So if you would repeat that. Of course, I, I will. And um, pursuant to Senate Resolution 47, Section 4, the party's presentations are not limited. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, pursuant to Senate Resolution 47, Section 4, parties' presentations are not limited to the record provided for in Section 1 of that resolution. The senator, senator, from, uh, the senator from Utah has appealed that ruling. Is that correct? Yes, I have. have you? Uh, and the, uh, the, the yeas and nays have been requested for sufficient and, and what is the question? Is it, shall the ruling of the chair be sustained? Is that the question? Yes. 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 The question is whether the ruling of the chair with respect to the No. No, no, no. And, and what may I ask is the ruling of the chair? My point was not about whether it's appropriate for them to make characterizations. My point was to strike them because they were false. The question is whether the ruling of the chair that Senate Resolution 47 yep. applies to this situation is correct. The question is whether uh, Senate Re Resolution 47, Section 4, um, is correct. The party's presentations are not limited to the record provided for in Section 1 of that resolution. Mr. President, that is not my motion. You, you're, you, you've ruled on a motion. You've ruled on something that was not what I moved. What I asked was, uh, statements were attributed, uh, attributed to me repeatedly, as to which I have personal knowledge because I am the source. They are not true. I never made those statements. I asked that they be stricken. This has nothing to do with whether or not they're based on depositions, which they're not. It's simply based on the fact that I'm the witness. I'm the only witness. Those statements are not true, and I ask that you strike them. President. Mr. President. No, who's talking? Joe. What is he doing? The A's and A's were asked for on an appeal. Could, Mr. President. The Senate will vote on the 
ruling of the chair that this is come on I'm in trouble with the mic I'm sorry the uh, the yeas and nays have been asked the yeas and nays have been asked for. The yeas and nays have been requested. Let him explain. Please let him explain, Mr. President. Why is it false? What was not false? What was false about it? Mr. President, I ask you unanimous consent to answer the senator's question. It is not in order under Senate Resolution 47, Section 4. Uh, prior to presentation is not limited to the uh, record provided for in Section 1 of that resolution. And that has been appealed. The yeas and nays have been requested. The clerk will call the roll. Ms. Baldwin. Mr. Barrasso. Mr. Bennett. Well, point of clarification. Point. What, what is the question? We're not allowed to here. Yes? I suggest the absence of a quorum while we work this out. Clerk will call the roll. No objection. Clerk will call the roll. Ms. Baldwin. Mr. Barrasso. Mr. Bennett. Mrs. Blackburn. Mr. Blunt. <laughs> Mr. Booker. Mr. Bozeman. The Senate impeachment trial of the former President Trump in a holding pattern right now. As you can see, what 
we understand to happen is that the House impeachment managers were ready to adjourn for the evening. They were done making their legal cases for the day. You saw Senator Mike Lee, Republican of Utah, ask that the, the comments attributed to him in a phone call uh, made by President Trump be struck from the record. You then saw the presiding officer, Senator uh, Patrick Leahy of Vermont, unclear as to what his ruling was. You heard senators ask for him to enunciate that ruling again. Then he had technical problems. It is unclear right now what exactly they are voting on or if a vote is taking place at this moment. You can see the huddling on the Senate floor. We'll continue to watch. Is a quorum call underway. Without objection, the quorum call. There will be order. Mr. President, we need order. Senate will be in order. Okay. The, to the appeal request that I made. Without, I withdraw the request. Wait, before he withdraw. The yeas and nays. Just call on. I withdraw the request for the yeas and nays. Without objection. Without objection. Okay, and I withdraw the quorum call and call on the man, the manager, Mr. Raskin, for a brief statement. Um, the uh, impeachment manager, Mr. Cicilline, correctly and accurately quoted a newspaper account um, which the distinguished senator uh, has taken objection to, so we're happy to withdraw it on the grounds that, that it is uh, on the grounds that it is not true. Um, and we are going to repeated it too. Okay, we're going to withdraw it this evening and without any prejudice to the ability to resubmit it, if possible, and then we can debate it if we need it, but it's not, it's, this is much ado about nothing because it's not critical in any way to our case. You're not the Thank one you. being cited as a witness, sir. All right. So it's with, so the manager's issue stands. Mr. Lee has withdrawn his request, and we may relitigate it tomorrow if we have to. I now ask unanimous consent the trial adjourn until 12 noon tomorrow, Thursday, February 11th, and this also constitute the adjournment of the Senate. The objection without objection, so ordered. Senate stands adjourned. The Senate has adjourned for the evening. They will return tomorrow at noon Eastern time. What unfolded just moments ago uh, was the senator from Utah, Mike Lee, a Republican, asking that the record be uh, struck when it, when it referred to a phone call that uh, the president made. Now, you heard the House Management um, impeachment managers withdraw that for now. They may relitigate it tomorrow when they reconvene at noon Eastern time for the second day of the House impeachment manager's case against the former president for inciting an insurrection at the Capitol. There are the phone numbers on your screen. We want to get to your thoughts in just a minute on what you heard today on the case made by House Democrats. Now, you might have noticed right before the slate went up, that's the, the uh, signage that says the Senate stands adjourned. You might have noticed that the presiding officer, Patrick Leahy, Democrat of Vermont, who's presiding over this, call out Mike to Mike Lee. And then Mike Lee approaches uh, the podium there as those two discuss, those two looked like they were discussing what just happened. Igor B. Bobic, Bobic who uh, reports for the Huffington Post with the, this 